I worked as a park ranger for Yellowstone back in the 1970s and 1980s. I've seen some things you'd never believe. The scariest thing I ever saw was one day while on patrol. I saw a mutilated grizzly bear carcass. This was far off the trail. There was no blood, so I knew it had to have been found and killed elsewhere. The grizzly bear appeared to be cut open from its ribcage down to its penis. His internal organs were gone. You could even see into his stomach cavity. I checked out the site and found drag marks and bloody prints. The cut marks were strange, though. They weren't done with just a knife. They looked like they were done with a laser of some kind. Some sort of superheated cutting tool. I'm not sure. So... I went back to the patrol station, calling in some help. We searched and searched, but we never found anything as to what might give us some clues. I still have no idea what killed the grizzly, or who might have done it. I'll never forget it, though. One of my colleagues suggested UFOs, but I'm not that out there with my beliefs. Another one of my colleagues even brought up that it could have been killed by a mythical creature called a Wendigo. I do know that there are stories about a Wendigo, but I never saw any evidence to thoroughly support this notion. However, I was never really out there doing any kind of investigating, but I do have my own Bigfoot story to share with you. I was doing my rounds one day and I saw a Sasquatch. It was way back during the time I actually wrote it in journal. That's why I remember it. I can remember it was very foggy, and I had a hard time seeing. But I saw this huge hairy beast. It was actually crouching up in a tree. I yelled at it, thinking it might be a person. And it jumped down and took off running at incredible speeds. It was the most exhilarating moment of my life. I only wished I'd followed it. But I was scared just as much as I was shocked that I had seen a real-life Bigfoot here in Yellowstone. After that, I had kind of become an avid reader of about anything I could get my hands on that thoroughly dealt with Bigfoot. I was even a member of the BFRO, which is the Bigfoot Field Research Organization. I had a lot of respect for John Green and Lorne Coleman. I even had a copy of their classic book, Bigfoot, I even once had the opportunity to go to an international conference in Colorado Springs. That's when I had the opportunity to discuss my own sighting in Yellowstone of the large, hairy, ape-like creature that was crouched up in the tree. I will always believe in Bigfoot after that, even though I never had a second sighting. The first will always be with me. Even though I do believe Bigfoot exists now that I've seen it, I still don't believe in UFOs, unlike many of the people in the Bigfoot community. As far as my park ranging goes, I retired from doing ranger service in the late 80s and started ministry work and teaching. I'm now and have been a pastor, but I can't doubt there aren't wild animals out there we don't know anything about. Back in 1999, I was in a short stint as a search and rescue officer. We had an incident where a hiker had gone missing, and we would later find his remains miles away, far up a steep mountainside. The purpose of this story is to share with you what I've learned. If you hike or plan to hike in the nearby future, and are not thoroughly prepared for emergencies, there is a reasonable chance you will be found much later, deceased. This is not as uncommon as many people think, and certainly not an uncommon occurrence in the outdoors. So, the best thing you can do is prepare in advance. Every year, thousands of people go missing. It's always safe to be prepared. Anyway, we got word that this man had been missing since morning, and he was last seen on one of the main trailheads. So, we began going out looking for him. The first thing we do as rescue officers is call for a chopper to do a flyover. The reason for this is to see if there are any obvious things we might have missed. 
The next thing to do is to send a couple of officers to the last place the person was seen and go looking for their vehicle. We find the vehicle and nothing is really out of the ordinary. Nothing we can find that would help our investigation further. We find the last known trailhead that they hike to. We start hiking up the trail and the further we go, the more worried we're getting. Of course, we start hiking faster now. We go hard for about five miles around, yelling his name, looking for him. Of course, there's no response. I call for the chopper to do another flyover. We did end up finding one piece of evidence. A shoe that belonged to him. That would later be confirmed by forensics. And a shirt which was torn up and had blood stains all over it. After that, the dogs just lost his scent. We had been searching for nine hours, and we had a chopper do a total of two flyovers. We had the best search dogs in the region at the time. There was no evidence of him, and we were at the point where we were going to call off the search. I was just about to call off the search myself when one of my officers said, We think we might have found remains that belong to him. They have found some skull fragments, three ribs, and a couple of spine vertebrae, except they were totally bleached white, completely clean, roughly a couple miles away from where he had disappeared, resting by a tree up a steep mountain embankment. They were able to retrieve the remains, located on the top of a ridge. They were only about two or so miles away from the trailhead. The reason they had not been found earlier was because they were wedged in the base of a tree, through analysis, it was concluded that the remains were actually his by DNA, and although it had been less than 24 hours since his disappearance, no one could explain how his actual bones could be so close to the trailhead. How is it that they were so clean? Who or what was able to put them here on top of this ridge? And many, many more questions. The entire case was incredibly strange. I know many more cases like this happen all the time. I mean... How do you go from a human being living to having his bleached, clean bones within 12 plus hours? Anyway, hikers should always carry with them a few things. A map, a compass, a first aid kit, mobile phone, appropriate clothing for climate, food, water, survival tools, a knife, a headlamp, a flashlight, waterproof matches, a space blanket, a whistle, fire starter, and a reflective safety vest. These are just the primary things, just to be safe in case something happens. I hope if you decide to read this, that your viewers and listeners hear this and take heed. If you're going out to the woods to hike, camp, hunt, lollygag, whatever it is you plan on doing, be safe. I'm a search and rescue officer, and it's not uncommon to find bodies in the woods either accidental deaths or even suicides. The more remote the area, the harder it is to get to. It's not uncommon to find hunters who have been killed by stray bullets. And people tend to think about those types of things when they see, for example, a dead body in the woods. But the bodies that scare me the most are the ones where foul play was involved. I can't even tell you how many people particularly women, have gone missing from this area over the years. People get to be familiar with the names that pop up on the missing persons list. It's not uncommon to hear people talk about the fact that so-and-so is still missing. And I think that's why it's become so common for people to believe that there's something else going on. That's also part of what inspired many books, like Missing 411, for example. I'm a huge fan of David Polite's work. He deals with a lot. A lot of people have gone missing over the years that have never been found. So, the idea of a person disappearing and being found somewhere else in a state that's unrecognizable, that's something that can be hard for people to swallow. Because then you're dealing with a whole different kind of evil. The idea of evil or demonic forces is something like most people are comfortable entertaining than others. So there's a lot of other people who feel like they're close to something 
that they shouldn't be close to. And I think that's why you have so many people in a community who have experiences like that. I mean, I know that there's a wide speculation of who or what is taking place out in these woods. Who is taking these kinds of people? I mean, we still don't know. Some people believe it's Bigfoot. And if you hear some of these stories that the people talk about, some kind of hairy monster is kidnapping them, it seems. And then, there are people who believe in aliens. We've had UFO sightings in this area, too. So, there's definitely a lot of strange activity in the area. But the bottom line is, personally, I don't believe in either. I believe in the natural world. I think the explanation is much more earthbound than that. I think it's much more likely to be human or animal related, and less likely than some kind of supernatural evil. The way I look at it is, imagine you're a parent of a little girl. She goes missing. She's gone for three days and then she's found. And she's miles away from where she was last seen. She was found in the woods, killed. Now, if you don't know who did that, if you don't know if it was a human or an animal, what do you do? Do you search for the animal that did it? Or do you search for the human that did it? I think it's more likely to be a human who did it. Because I think that's the kind of evil that we can wrap our heads around. When it's an animal, when it's some kind of Bigfoot or alien, it's hard for people to wrap their head around that. So I think that's part of the reason why people think it's an animal. Let's talk finding bodies in the woods. As I've said, I've seen all sorts of gruesome ends to people. One guy had been torn apart by a bear. I've seen others who have died by being exposed to the elements. And yes, suicides are easily the worst. I know of two suicides in my area right away that occurred in the woods. One of them was a younger man who had been on the track team at the high school. I don't know the exact details of what happened, but I know that he had been found hanging in the woods, and when he was discovered, there was a loaded shotgun at his feet. Why he did not end up using it, I'm not sure. Another one that will stick with me is a young man, probably no older than 21, who had gotten lost in the woods by himself, and he had Down syndrome and died out there after being exposed to the elements. Not a suicide, but still very sad. I think that's the worst of the worst. It's not the most gruesome, but just sad. I think we all have that sense that when we go out into the woods, we can get lost there. But if you think about the fact that a person with Down syndrome was lost out there and died, that sticks with me. This is a very emotionally taxing job at times. However, besides bodies, you'll find weird things too, like occult ritualistic killings of people and animals. Those are always disturbing. And yes, they do happen, more often than you think. I decided to go camping on Friday night because, simply, I'm an introvert and I prefer to be alone when I'm not at home. I assumed that it would be a great way to spend an evening and night. I packed up my gear and headed off for a few miles off trail. I was a little worried, but I just tried to focus on the positive. When I get there, I was the only one around. The trail seemed pretty deserted. I was relieved because this is usually a very busy walking trail, even in the early fall. I really enjoy being by myself. The afternoon then went by without any significant incident. Only problem is, I goofed and forgot to bring anything to start a fire. The whole point of me wanting to go camping was because that's just the kind of person I am. Uncomfortable around other people. Not for the most part. So I wanted to spend my Friday night in the woods by myself. With nothing but the sounds of nature to keep me company. I was just about to start a fire when I realized the whole not having anything to start a fire with. No kindling, anything. So I took the time to go exploring, but I could not find any real usable kindling. A lot of the stuff was wet. So now, 20 minutes after sunset, 
I heard the sound of a branch cracking. I had been trying to get a fire started for some time with semi-wood kindling, but had not had any luck. I paused, listening to the sound of rustling leaves and branches. I was a little concerned that I was out in the woods alone, with just my little camp lantern and my little tent. I was a little scared, but mainly because I didn't have a fire, and I heard the sound again, but this time it seemed to be getting closer. I was sure that somebody was following me, and I grabbed my knife and showed my lantern in the direction of the sound. A raccoon. A raccoon emerged from the canopy of the leaves, and his tiny black eyes twinkled in the light. I sighed with relief and kind of began to chuckle, thinking it was just nothing. But then, I heard something much larger rustling from behind the tree, nearly only twenty feet away to my left. I spun around, knife at the ready, and I see this huge black wolf emerge from behind the tree and begin to charge straight at me. I didn't even have time to scream, but the sound of my own voice was muffled by the sound of my pounding heartbeat in my ears. I drop my lantern, run back towards the camp, my knife still raised. I stumbled at least once, but managed to clear the camp. I tried to get into my tent, but this wolf was already circling me. So I turned to look at him, and his eyes were like these glowing white orbs in the dark, and I could just get this overwhelming sense he wanted to kill me. And I closed my eyes, and that's when I heard the sound of his paws retreating into the distance. So I quickly zipped my tent, with my knife at the ready, and the only thing I could hear for the rest of the night was my own breathing. I'm telling you now, I did not sleep a wink that night. The next morning, I found my lantern shattered on the ground. There was also a large canine paw print in the dirt next to it, verifying 100% that I had indeed seen what I did. So now my question, was I attacked by a dire wolf? I was hanging out with some friends when we decided to go to the woods and hike around. We get, I don't know, maybe a mile down the trail, maybe less. We are all being loud and joking around, until we noticed two guys in our direction coming down the trail. We walked closer to them, and I get this weird feeling. They didn't say anything, or but they moved strange. Robotic, kind of. One of my friends even got the same feeling. It kind of felt like I was having the energy drained out of me. It felt like it was a warning. I noticed the guy walking in front had no mouth or eyes, and the other guy directly behind him had no face. As soon as they passed, we all ran away. None of us knew what they were. I'm not saying they were aliens, but that's one thing that did come to mind. We told a friend, and I guess he has seen these same guys in the woods lots of times. The only thing I can think of is they are the ones who are causing issues around here. He's also seen them by his house and in the woods. Then, I have another friend who lives on the other side of town by some more woods. I'm not sure if he saw the same guys we did or what, but he tells me, that he was walking home from a friend's house one night, and he sees a tall figure standing in the middle of the road. He claims it was about seven feet tall and wearing a black cloak. He said it was staring at him, and he was terrified. He said he ran as fast as he could and did not look back. He said he didn't tell anyone about it, except a few of us. He claims he was scared to go back to the road, I asked him if he was sure it was a person, and he said it was. I'm not sure what to make of it myself. Maybe you can. Back in August of 2013, I was going to a hunting spot and had parked. As I'm getting out of the truck, I noticed a very bright light in the sky. It was not a star or a planet. It wasn't moving. I watched it for about a minute, and that is when I noticed it getting bigger and brighter. 
the light then started to get smaller and dimmer, and then just vanishes. I tried making sense of what I'd just seen, but I couldn't. I concluded it was just some sort of aircraft, but it did not move like anything I had seen. It was not a helicopter, a plane, or a satellite. Nor was it a meteor because it did not burn up. It just got big and bright and then disappeared. I should have gotten a picture, but I didn't even think to take one. That is something I now regret. I had not thought about the UFO that I had seen back in 2013, until earlier this year. So, I was actually hanging out with my wife and some friends. One of the guys I was talking with about some UFO stuff, and I told him about the UFO that I had seen back years ago. He told me that he too had seen a UFO once. So, I asked him to tell me about it, and he said he's pretty sure it was just a blimp. I told him from what he described, I did not think it was a blimp, because it was not moving like one. That even mine was just getting bigger and brighter, and just vanished. He tells me that he'd seen other UFOs when he was younger, and even had pictures of them. I was interested, so I asked him if I could see the pictures. He would get them for me. I had my own experience and my own theories about what I saw that morning in August, but I was not sure about my friend's sighting. I wanted to believe what he saw was just some sort of aircraft. I figured that he probably thought that what he saw was a blimp, but it was actually a UFO. I really wanted to see his pictures and compare them to what I saw. So about a week goes by and he gets them to me. I was looking at them, and I noticed they were definitely not a blimp. They were some weird UFO pictures. At first, I wasn't sure what I was looking at, but after studying and analyzing these pictures, I realized this was indeed an unidentified flying object. I showed my wife the pictures, and she said that she thought it was a UFO too, captured out in the deep woods. And my friend and I, whom shared these pictures with me, were both stunned. I mean, this particular picture we had never seen anything like before. Something we had no idea what it was. We were probably both thinking the same thing, but neither of us said a thing. We just looked at each other. I have showed the pictures to a few other people, and they all agree that it is a UFO. I have not decided if I'm going to keep the pictures or not, but I'm thinking about it. I'm not sure if I want to have proof of what I saw and risk being called a liar or crazy. I could put the pictures up, of course, on the internet and maybe get some sort of attention. Or maybe I could sell the pictures and become a millionaire. I'm not sure. I'm still trying to process it all, even though it was nearly eight years ago. I'm not sure what I saw, and I'm still not sure if it was a UFO. I mean, after all, this was not my first experience with a UFO, but it was my first sighting since I was a child. I'm not sure if I'm just becoming more aware or if they are becoming more active, but I'm not sure I'm ready for the changes ahead. I hope that they are not bad aliens, but I'm not sure what to think. I hope they are not here to invade us or hurt us. I hope they are here to help us. I feel like we are getting close to finding out who they are. I feel like we're close to finally finding out the truth. I'm ready to find out what it is really that's out there. I'm ready to find out what I saw that day in August. I just really hope it's nothing bad. I live in the mountains of West Tennessee. I have been seeing things in my backyard for the past two years. I have seen a tall, large, black, hairy creature with glowing eyes. It was watching me from the tree line. I have also seen a two-legged creature with glowing red eyes and chasing my dog. I have seen this exact creature many times over the past couple years, and I have also seen a large black cat which walked across the front road. It appeared to be the size of a large dog, and I think it might be a panther. It was running very fast, and I have also seen another different kind of large black hairy creature in my backyard at night approaching my house. I have seen this particular creature about five times 
since October of 2020. I have seen this creature from a distance of maybe 20-30 feet. That's why I know it's different. It was not a bear, and it was certainly not a dog. I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure if it is real or if it is some sort of spirit. And I'm not sure if it is a spirit, if it's a good spirit or bad one, and if it's evil or benevolent. I do not know if it is here to protect me or to harm me. Even though I've seen it at a distance, it has never once tried to harm me. I don't know why it is here. I don't know what it wants. We do have a lot of thick woods out here, with plenty of places for this thing to hide and stay secluded. In fact, a few months back, while all this stuff is still going on, I am awakened to the sound of my dogs barking and growling at about 2.33 in the morning. I get up, go to the front door, and I see a large black shape running across the road in front of my house. It is running at breakneck speeds, and I have a friend who actually lives down the road about three miles. He has seen this very same thing many times. The first time he saw it, it was running across the road in front of his house. He watched it cross the road. When it got to the other side, it turned and looked at him. It stopped and looked at him for a while. He said that he knew that it was not a dog, that it looked more like a large, freakish-looking cat. I told him to call the police and make a report. He told me they did not believe him. So, I myself called my own local sheriff's department and told them what I'd seen and I told them that I know that I have seen a large black panther. They didn't believe me either, and I live just in the city limits of Tullahoma, Tennessee. I've seen this thing many times, and in fact, I've seen it twice this past week. I'm getting tired of it, so I'm going to try and take a video of it the next time I see it. Wish me luck. I've had the chance to work as a ranger for several years, and in that time, I've gotten a handful of stories and experiences to share with you. Some of them deal with cryptids, while others deal with the paranormal. Here it goes. The first one. I still can't make sense of it all when I look back on this. I was in the park one evening, working, and I was walking around a large lake nearby when I saw this white figure standing on the other side of the lake. I thought it was a person, so I began to walk towards them when they suddenly vanished. And this scared me, so I left. At the time, I had never seen anything like it ever. I convinced myself it was a ghost. I guess I'm not the only ranger out here who has supposedly seen ghost sightings either. I do scare easily too, so... That did not help my case. But had you been there in the moment, and actually seen this figure kind of just evaporate like mist, you'd have been scared too. My second encounter. Once I had seen a brownish, furry, man-like creature walking along the service road. It was around seven feet tall, and was very fast. I could not get a picture. I saw it around 2 a.m., and it scared me. I was actually with my colleague doing night shift, and I tried to follow it but could not keep up. It was walking on two feet, and was very hairy, very big. I have heard of Bigfoots like everybody else, but I think this was something else. And this one was also right outside of a town in Illinois. My third one that I was hiking around one day in June, when I discovered an incredibly large footprint of something that did not look human in the dirt. I was shocked to find this, as I have never seen anything like it before. It was the most bizarre thing I had ever seen, and I hope whatever had made that was not close by. I stopped and inspected it for a little while, then continued on, when I noticed the atmosphere around me change in the woods. It did not feel good. It felt like imminent danger, and like I needed to leave now. I trusted my gut instinct, and I bailed. And by the way... I could not distinguish what animal it came from, the footprint. It wasn't any known animal I know, or was it a person. And it was incredibly large. Number four. We had gotten complaints about someone trying to break into this gentleman's camper. I was sent to investigate a call 
at a more popular section of campground around here. When I arrived, I met an older gentleman who was also in the campground, not the person who placed the call. He tells me, though, that he'd heard a strange noise outside his camper window at 4 a.m. He explains to me that he looked outside and saw a large creature with a strange shaped head. It was around seven feet tall, very thin. It was standing completely upright and looking into his window. He tells me he was too scared to move, so he froze. This thing was very muscular, but also very lean with long arms. He said he was afraid it would break the window and force its way in. So he backed away from the window, grabbed his gun, and hid beneath out of view in his camper. I guess the creature ran back into the woods and disappeared. I had asked him if he had seen it before, and he said no. I asked him to describe it more, and he tells me it was a cross between a gorilla and something else. He seemed very sincere, and so I believe him. Then, I talked to the guy who owned the camper in question, who made the original phone call, and his story was very identical. Saw the same creature, very similar story. There wasn't much I could do. The fifth one. I once had to investigate a report of a possible human body in the water. I was out on a lake looking around. The same lake that I saw the ghostly apparition when I saw something floating in the water. I pulled it towards the boat, and it turned out to be just a small deer carcass. But it wasn't just a typical deer carcass. The thing had been cut open. No organs, nothing. Even its eyes were missing. And not like ripped out or gouged out, but like surgically removed. No blood or anything anywhere. This thing couldn't have been in the water for more than a few hours, judging by how wet it was and its decomposition. So I asked myself, why would anybody do this? That was definitely a strange one. The sixth, I had yet another Bigfoot sighting of my own. I was out on a patrol when I saw some movement in the woods. It was dark out, so I couldn't make out much, but I see this large hairy figure moving quickly through the woods. I want to make a note that this one looked completely different than the last one I saw with my colleague. I had my spotlight on, and I shined it on the figure. It had a very large head and was covered in thick black hair. It was very large, built like a bodybuilder, except more exaggerated features. It was hard to guess its height, but I'd guess it to be around seven to eight feet. This thing didn't stay illuminated for more than a second before darting quickly into the trees to stay hidden. You could hear it crashing through the woods, trying to get away from this light source. So I grab my radio and call it in. I was interviewed by my colleagues and everybody seemed to believe me, but there wasn't much they could do. I never saw it again. Okay, number seven. It was the summer of 2012 and I was patrolling again in the woods. I came upon an area where some ropes were tied to a tree stump. I was confused at what kind of activity would have been going on here. Then, I heard a rustling in the bushes, and I see two faintly glowing eyes staring at me. I could see they belonged to a very large animal, just outside of you, behind the thicket and foliage. So I freeze, being very cautious to not move wrong. Then, I hear a growl. So I slowly started backing away to my vehicle, and I could hear it making these nasty gnashing sounds with its teeth, like it was furious I was there. I didn't see the creature anymore, but I heard it. Once I got out of the area, I didn't hear the growls anymore, but man, that was definitely one of the spookiest moments on the job. I got more stories, but this is just all of them off the top of my head for now. Yes. I've had so many paranormal happenings and things go on while I've worked for the wildlife fish and game and forest industry. If you think this is a lot, some of my colleagues I've talked to have stories and experiences that make mine look like kindergarten. It's a labor of love, though. You have to enjoy what you do. Maybe when I get more time, I'll sit down and send you more of my stories.
I'm sure you get many stories about people camping in the Ozarks. And to be fair, I know from my own friends and family alone that a lot of weird, creepy stuff goes down up there. I too have had a weird experience while up there. The last time I was up there. This is a time that I was camping by myself, and it was in the morning. I decided to walk down to a nearby creek to go fishing. I was walking down the trail when I noticed a deer run by me, as if it were scared. This was a little peculiar to me. Usually when you walk down a trail, nothing runs to you, especially a deer. It was as if it was being chased by something. Whatever, I shrugged it off and walked down a little further to the creek. I looked around and did not see anything, so I set up my fishing gear and started fishing. It was a beautiful morning out, and I was really enjoying the quiet. But as I'm fishing, this overwhelming musty odor just totally assaults my nostrils. It was so overpowering that I had to put my fishing pole down and scan my surroundings. I didn't see anything, and the smell was only getting stronger. So I walked up a little further to see if I could find the source, and I noticed this small little dugout cave that went underneath the creek. I looked around for a minute and decided to go check it out. There was enough light peering through from the outside that you can get a pretty good idea of how big this chamber was. So I kind of walked down into it and noticed right away how large it was. I mean, it was big enough for a grown man to fit in. I looked around and noticed that there were a bunch of bones and even some dried up deer carcasses all around. I kind of got the creeps. Something was bedding down in there for sure. And I'm telling you now, it was not a bear or a mountain lion. How do I know that? Well, because their dens don't look like this. This was a perfect little den for something else, but definitely not a bear or a mountain lion. So I walked back up to my fishing spot, maybe a quarter mile away and sat down. I started fishing again, and after a short while, I began hearing voices. Not just one voice, but a bunch. I could hear people laughing and talking. So I stood up and looked around again, and I didn't see anything. Now I'm convinced I'm hearing things, but now I'm hearing footsteps all around me, and it sounded as if people were walking all over with me in the trees. I keep looking around but don't see anything. Then I hear a woman screaming, and I noticed the lighting in the sky was suddenly changing. Had I not been out there for more two hours, because now it was getting dusk. How is this possible? I had just left about eight or nine in the morning, and when I checked my phone, it was about 10.02. I had officially entered the twilight zone, it felt like. I got freaked out, packed up my stuff, and walked back to camp. I walked the entire way back and did not see or hear anything. I get back to my camp, start a fire, and I was going to cut my trip short and leave it first thing in the a.m. Somehow, two hours had turned into eight or ten and I know for a fact I endured some strange time anomaly. I'm sure I sound like Alex Jones saying that, but I'm telling you, I'm really good at time management, and it is physically impossible for me to waste that much time to have gone down there, at least without keeping track. It's only a 20-minute walk down to the creek from the camp, and I even checked my phone that said it was 11.03 a.m., right before I checked that cave out. I really don't know what happened out there, but I do know I will never go back to camp there again. I think I just witnessed some kind of portal to another time or dimension open up. I don't know. That whole night while trying to sleep, I just had this really anxious feeling that I could not shake. I felt nervous and uncomfortable. I can't describe it. I finally fell asleep but woke up several times that night, like something was watching me beyond my tent. When I woke up the next morning, one of my fishing poles was broken and my equipment thrown all around. I just said screw it and left. I'm not going back there again. I mean, I'm sure it was just a coincidence that my pole is broken and my stuff torn and thrown everywhere, right? Right. I'm not going back. 
That, my friend, was actually the very last time I ever camped up there. Haven't gone up that high on the mountain since that happened. I don't know what kind of X-file craziness I encountered. Aliens, or interdimensional beings, or what have you, but no thank you. When I was a kid, my parents used to take me and my sisters camping at the coast of Alaska nearly every summer. We'd spend hours playing in the sand, building these elaborate forts, and running through the dunes all day long. But, as night would creep on our campsite on the beach, we'd always hear this eerie sound coming from the water, and it always seemed to be growing closer by the minute. It sounded like somebody was throwing something metal around on the rocks, and were now going closer and closer. My parents were always very quick to dismiss it, but the sound continued to get louder, and then coming out towards our tent, but would always stop before reaching us. Like I said, my parents were quick to dismiss it as a nightmare, and they were right, it was a nightmare. A living one. It was always an incredibly terrifying experience. One that my sisters and I swear to this day is more than real. One evening, we stepped out because I had to go pee. My parents were fast asleep, and we heard the noise. My sisters and I both looked, and we saw what it was. What was making the noise was this strange creature swimming close to the shore and then surfacing. We saw its head and parts of its fin before it submerged again. The night was getting very dark, so we could just barely see the shape of this thing's body as it moved away from us and out back into the water. We were terrified. Our eyes were wide open. We don't think the creature saw us, and if it did, we think it may have tried to stay hidden. We stayed there and stared at the water where this thing had just appeared from. That summer was my first time ever seeing this strange creature, and also my last. The creature, to my knowledge and my sister's knowledge, never came back that year or any other year after that. I can't even begin to try explaining what it is that I saw. All I know is that I'll always remember those days on the coast with a certain fondness after that strange, terrifying experience. The very next day, my mother told me that it was just a dream, but I knew it wasn't. I had never seen this creature before. I also recognized that it was very large. It had to have at least been six feet tall had it been standing upright, and it appeared to have a tail from what I could tell or make out. I assume it was some sort of sea serpent, but I can't be sure. My sisters say that it kind of reminded them of a cross between a man and a sea serpent type thing. It really scared all of us. I went fishing with my family a few Saturdays ago. It was a beautiful day in July, but I swear that I saw something in the water I don't normally see. It's something that really stood out to me, and I don't usually fish this far out. I wanted to catch some yellow tail. We were about a hundred feet out on the ocean side, three miles from shore. We had just put out our lines down when my brother-in-law began yelling at us that he saw something. He said it looked like a monster or something was coming up for air about 20 yards away from us. When we saw it, we caught a glimpse of what appeared to be this brownish-colored fish dinosaur thing. It was going through the water really quick, like flying, soaring. And to say it looked prehistoric is an understatement. We were all pretty shocked at what we were seeing. It was definitely a monster. It obviously saw us because it disappeared into the water, never surfacing again. I know many people have seen things like this before, but I'm not sure what it could have been, and I'm still pretty shocked it happened. My guess is that it was possibly some prehistoric fish of some sort. 
it kind of looked like it would be in the family of sturgeon, but it definitely was not a sturgeon. But it kind of had that look, if you know what I mean. Very ancient looking. It was brown and much larger. Too bad it disappeared too quickly before we can get a good look at it. The ocean is home to all sorts of mysteries, so once again, I'm not surprised we saw something we cannot explain. My youngest son, his daughter, and I were staying at a family friend's home on the beach so we could do some crabbing. We even made a fire that evening to cook our crabs while we waited for them to become available. It was late August in San Diego, and there is a very small window of time between twilight and the darkness. Perhaps this is why we saw what we did. Now, I'll go ahead and put a forward on this and say, I don't know if this was a UFO, I don't know what this was, but we saw some sort of interdimensional anomaly. We started to notice that most of the people had left the beach, it was just us, and a couple in their 50s or 60s, standing 150 feet away. As it got darker, we could see them, but they couldn't see us. They were close enough that we heard some of what they were saying to each other. There was nothing unusual at first about their conversation, but it did surprise me a bit when I realized we were talking about the same thing. I mentioned earlier that it was dark, but not completely, and there were no streetlights or anything to illuminate the night sky. I'm trying to paint the picture here that it was dark and there was lots of stars out. However, we noticed one area of stars that seemed to be brighter than the rest and somewhat closer to the horizon than anything else in the sky. The couple also noticed this, judging by their gestures and body reaction, and they even commented about it with each other. Now, we had only been watching for a few moments when we all, my kids, me, and them saw something moving through these brightened stars on what appeared to be a collision course with us, referring to our location at ground level. It emerged from this cluster of stars and into our atmosphere, just above the ocean. I would guess it was about 400 to 500 feet in front of us, but it was difficult to gauge its distance due to how bright it was, almost like seeing a star that is as close to one and further away would be. The object appeared to be oval-shaped and about 30 to 40 feet long. It moved incredibly fast and at first, we thought it was going to crash into the water, but instead, it slowed down and turned upwards towards our position, at which time I realized that I could see through what appeared to be clear or slightly translucent skin. This made me convinced that this wasn't a craft being piloted by humans. There were no visible seams or joints. It was something else entirely, almost like this loose shape but then it began to change. Then it began to take the shape of this strange, eel-looking creature. This astral, ethereal, eel-looking creature. We were all shocked, and its skin reflected the ambient light in the same way that living things underwater often do. It also had lumps in two rows on either side, which appeared like gills, and these gills were bright white, and flared open, similar to how an eel's gills do when agitated, but they were not really moving. This thing didn't have any eyes that I could tell, but it definitely knew we were there, as soon as it slowed down enough so that it didn't appear to be just a bright light. It turned so that we were looking right at its face. I just remember feeling the feeling of weightlessness and awe as I watched this creature or thing, swim, fly, however you would describe this, past us, about a hundred or so feet above our heads. It continued towards the couple in front of us, and then silently flew over them where they remained still, but then stopped moving forward about a hundred feet beyond them, and stayed suspended for another five seconds before shooting straight up into the atmosphere, and then going completely out of sight. 
a few moments later, the man called out from where he had been standing with his wife, asking if we just saw what we thought we just did. We all agree that we had, and we all consider this the most shocking, terrifying and bizarre UFO experience any one of us could ever go through. At least, that's what I assume this was. I still have no answers to what we saw. And if this was some sort of grand group hallucination, I guess that's a reality. What do you think of my story? What could this have been? I've heard stories of UFOs, but never one like this, where an object appears to change shape into an actual living creature like this, that was not only translucent, but appeared to be interdimensional of some kind. Went boating on the Okanagan Lake years ago with my wife and kids, when suddenly the boat stopped. I asked my wife if we were stuck in some kind of sandbar, so I turned around to back up and had a look on the sonar. It showed there was at least water under us. However, as I backed up, you could start to see several large rocks just below the surface, and all of a sudden, my wife let out this ear-piercing scream as she was looking over her shoulder toward the rear of our boat, at which time our two kids began screaming and crying. I looked behind us to see this large dark object, roughly 25 feet long, moving fast through the water, away from shore, away from us. This thing looked like something alive. It had to have been at least 40 feet deep. It was too big to just be a shadow. We were on the surface of the water. I could not swim, and my wife was no accomplished swimmer either. Needless to say, we went back in full throttle. After that day, I have never been back out on any lake or waterway. Actually, to be honest, I am petrified by any body of water. In 1970, me and three friends decided to go camping up north, several miles from Florence, Oregon. It was pretty isolated, except for one other camp a few hundred feet down the beach. We all laid around during the day while the other camp packed up and left. Around 9 p.m., we all went to sleep in our tents, leaving a lantern on for light, since it was a full moon. Around 11 p.m., I woke up to the front of my tent being partially open, and I noticed water dripping. Then, things began to happen very quick. I heard the strange sound and water dripping. Then, this huge head hanging right above over the top of the opening, and all I could see were these black eyes, at least three inches across, flaring flat nostrils. No hair or scales or fur. I couldn't move away. I was terrified and frozen with fear. It stayed there for what seemed like forever, staring at me, before slowly swiping its hand out of the opening and disappearing. When I finally got the nerve to move, I packed up and left. To this day, I can't stand to go near any body of water, assuming this was some sort of strange lake creature. This is the tale of the White Lake Monster. My grandmother lives in Twin Lakes, which lies on LA Route 27. The closest town be St. Martinville. Anyway, one day, my mama was home alone since her sister Beatrix had to work at 3 p.m. on Halloween. My mother decided to take us back, hunting for deer, with a friend. My mom also asked if she could drop me off. We had gotten some candy treats already that day from other relatives coming by our house. I said no because my cousin was trick-or-treating. It wouldn't feel right going without him. And so, she dropped me off around five. A few hours of not finding anything, we decided to head home and go inside, which is when grandmother said she'd seen a big animal swimming in the water. A few nights later, my mom's friend Crystal went back to the lake to check out what it was. She told me grandmother 
that it might be a Cypress Lake monster. She also mentioned it might be the Rugaru. The next day, November 1st, I begged my grandmother until finally she gave in. So we took some of her fishing poles with us. And we came across this huge mud hole. It looked like something had been there. It was all torn up. But we insisted on going further down the road. And then we see this huge white thing in the water swimming right to the left of us. And we could see its scales. That's just how close it was. Now, Grandma said before that that was a monster. So we waited for it to disappear before running back and telling her. We were shocked. This looked like some sort of long white fish. But never have I seen anything like it before. Sorry, I'm not a good writer, but I thought that this sighting was interesting. This occurred on August 11th, 2019. I went to one of my favorite spots on the lake, two and a half miles from the closest residential area. I like coming here. It's quiet and out of the way, but still close enough that I can get back to the shore in five minutes assuming something goes wrong. I was fishing with a friend, and we were catching plenty of fish, mostly small sunfish, but our biggest catch yet was a large bass. It started getting dark around 7.30 p.m., so my buddy left, going back to his car, and called it an early night. He had to be at work the next day at 6 a.m. I ended up staying until around 10 p.m., I was having no luck catching any fish. The lake was a decent size, about 10 square miles roughly, and part of it being very deep, over 100 feet. When I was about to pack up and leave, I saw something clear moving through the water about 200 yards away from me. And that's when I noticed there were hundreds of them, these large, clear creatures swimming around really fast in almost every direction. They were translucent, kind of like jellyfish, but larger and a lot more fluid movement. They also seemed to have this glow. There were also these red-orange shapes going through the water at extremely high speeds, seemingly trying to eat the other ones. It reminded me of some videos I've seen before, so I stayed there watching it for about an hour until I finally got a little too scared and decided to leave. I didn't know what these creatures were. I tried to Google stuff about this lake once I got back home, but nothing came up. It wasn't until two days later that my mind was jogged when some guy on Reddit posted a video of something similar. The monsters looked exactly like the ones I saw. I call them monsters, but really, I think they're just some unknown fish or something. What do you think these might have been? Did anybody else see these? I'm posting here on this thread for now, but if anybody can reply, I would really appreciate that. I was fishing from the banks in Oregon during an evening. This was actually at Sanford Lake. A couple of friends and I were catching cutthroat trout when we noticed something very odd just under the surface on my side of the lake. There was this creature that had a long serpent-like body and large flippers or fins on each side. It kind of reminded us of a flying fish. The head had these weird triangular shapes pointing down to its mouth and didn't appear to have any eyes at all. This fish also had some type of appendages coming off its back, kind of like some fish you would see. Not sure what these were, but they resembled almost tentacles, which looked frayed and torn apart. There was no sound produced by this fish, and it did not appear to have gills. This thing was swimming very fast, and would be making sharp turns darting back and forth across the lake. Once, this thing partially lunged out of the water, and we got to see a lot of its body. It looked far different, and it made this strange noise. When I say big, this thing was roughly maybe 9 to 10 feet long, and maybe 2 to 3 feet wide. 
All this happened within ten minutes' time, as if it were looking for food or something. We did finally depart the Sanford Lake, but I am very intrigued by nature, and I spend lots of time outdoors, camping, fishing, boating, hiking, etc. I have seen some odd things in nature, but this was by far the most bizarre. I hope I can find out more about it soon. Anybody with any answers, I'd greatly appreciate you posting a reply. This happened to me this summer, around late June, early July. It was right before 4th of July. I live by the St. Clair River, which I've always heard rumors about of a lake monster and other strange thing in it. So it's always been on my bucket list of places to investigate for myself. Also, I guess there is an old lighthouse that is said to have paranormal activity. Let me start off by saying, both I work as a career firefighter and am a certified EMT. So when I tell you what I saw, please trust that I'm not lying or just trying to make something up. In fact, my username is anonymous for that reason. I don't want my real name and any part of this connected. Late one night, after fishing on our station, we were all hanging out at one of my friend's houses discussing our days while browsing social media, when some of us started to see a story pop up on our Facebook. This was about a group of hunters had found what they believed to be an unidentified carcass in Lake St. Clair, and that the police were investigating it. So, we're all looking at this post when one of my other friends, who is a very active duty military, and also has been for quite some time, with the special operations training, he tells us that he knows somebody who was there when it happened. Apparently, his unit was only told it was closed for training exercises, while it was really to come investigate this thing. Mind you, both he and my other friend have been out on boats before hunting deer season, so they know their way around. So he's telling us that basically these hunters had originally reported seeing something very similar to what they would refer to as a plesiosaur. As it was coming up to their boat, they all freaked out. One guy had the presence of mind to take a picture before this thing went underwater. It sounds pretty crazy, but he's my friend. I'm inclined to believe him. Plus, where we are is not only an old Indian burial ground nearby, but has also been a hot spot for Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, and other various phenomena. So, I don't really find it that far-fetched anymore that these things exist. After he told us about what he knew about this creature, one of my other friends says, what if it comes back? We should go investigate. At first, I figured she was just joking. She likes watching cryptid shows and whatnot. But then, she and another friend, the only other female in our group, said to us, we should go out onto the river tonight. And since there's no moon, maybe we can see if we can find it. I tried to tell them that they were crazy. But by this point, they had already talked me into going, so we all decided to meet at my house around midnight, after everybody was done with their work fully, or responsibilities for the night. Now, these three friends are some of my more adventurous friends. We've even gone ghost hunting before, more so their idea. These three also had gone on a Bigfoot expedition. Of course, they never found any evidence. Needless to say, I was excited about the adventure and the outcome. It was just something fun and different to do. So, about 30 to 45 minutes later, it's now past midnight and we all finally meet outside, right on the riverbank, and this is where we have our three canoes. This is where we kept all three of our canoes and with all our fishing gear. These canoes are very expensive. We tie them up to the bank, grab whatever flashlights we can find, and head out on the river with one person in each canoe. I'm not going to lie, we were pretty scared. It wasn't exactly the wisest decision, but I guess we've done crazier things. Plus, I had a friend who was more adventurous than all of us. He was kind of being the leader, or 
what I like to refer to as the designated driver. Nothing really happened for the first 30 or so minutes, at least that I can remember. We spotted a log floating in the water, and we all laughed and joked about how it might be our monster. After several minutes of following it downstream, I turned to look at them and ask if they're still watching it. I've lost sight of it since moving further down the river. I wasn't staring or anything, just looking around while waiting for them to answer. That's when both friends I'm riding with shout, Holy crap! As they frantically start paddling back towards where we came from. So naturally, I think something's happened. Somebody must have fell out of their canoe. So immediately, I start paddling forward and then spot what looks like kind of a long but also like a large snake poking up from the water and kind of thrashing around as if trying to stay afloat. I know, I'm probably doing a terrible job explaining this story, but it's hard to make sense of what I saw at first. It happened so quickly, and I only caught a quick glimpse of it before being thrown into confusion or excitement. I don't know what emotion you'd call what I felt. And then, suddenly, the thing had looked like a log went underwater and didn't come back up while my other two friends began yelling, Go, 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 fast! So, I paddle faster downriver, confused as why, what is going on? Why is everybody in such a hurry? When all of a sudden, one friend who's riding with me starts screaming about something, but all I can understand from him was, Brother, he's underwater. So naturally, thinking my other friend has fallen out of his canoe, without the life jacket on or something equally as stupid, I turn back and see that his canoe has completely capsized. He was able to forcefully turn his canoe back over. Somehow, he's soaking wet and he is scared, terrified. I was shocked the way the man was able to uncapsize his own canoe. That alone seemed impossible but he's screaming that something took his canoe down. We needed to go now. Screaming, yelling, that's what all I remember from him. Anyway, I wanted to ask you guys for advice. It sounds like something happened. Something large under the water was trying to take my friend down. Except this was something far different than a fish. When I talk to the same friend now, he has PTSD about it, almost nearly dying. He claims the monster was going to get him, and since when any of us ran off so quickly, the other friends didn't fall into the river. So, for a little bit, we tried getting back to shore, calling, shouting, signaling, but we couldn't really get any response from anybody else around us. We were able to finally make it back to shore, where we were soaking wet and terrified and my poor friend, who had capsized in his own canoe. He was just shaken up and would not talk. When we kind of got him to calm down more, he claimed that something large came under his canoe in the river and nearly tipped him over and tried to pull him out. He was scared, still is scared. I'm looking for answers. We have no idea what it was. Do I believe it was a plesiosaur? I don't know. He didn't really give a description of what it was, but something was trying to kill him or eat him or pull him out of that canoe. He was also the one in the very back. I was out on a very small lake on the outskirts of Detroit, hanging with some friends. We decided to go swimming in it Well, we were young and dumb. Kids tend to do this at this age. I know how ignorant this sounds, but after a long summer day, all you want to do is cool down and be free for a moment. We had been out there for maybe an hour or so, just enjoying each other's company. And that's when we heard someone shouting for help, alongside the road next to the lake. The water was fairly shallow enough, and we could stand up if needed. So my three buddies ran over towards him, trying their best to see what he wanted while I stayed back, near the edge of the lake. Now, this guy was a very large man, and a real sight to behold. We were young and dumb, like I said. We probably could have taken him if need be, 
but it didn't. He had been running through the woods, sticking to the edge of the lake, trying his best not to get caught as he made his way towards us. When my friends finally got over there and realized what was going on, they told me afterwards that he looked terrified out of his mind and not coming to assault us. Yeah, you already know where this is going. He frantically pleaded with us, asking us if we had seen anything weird coming from the water before, before he was running through the woods. We looked at each other a bit confused. We were confused and had no idea what he meant. Shrugged it off. I mean, we were just high school kids. We had no idea what was even possible to come from the water, let alone having seen anything like what he was saying. So we honestly just told him no, and asked him why. He stopped for a moment, catching his breath as he panted heavily under his large frame while staring down at the road where he came from. He spoke again, and all of us could feel the very air being sucked out from around us, and every hair on our necks stand up with goosebumps, forming across our flesh, listening to the words none of us would have ever thought to hear. The guy said in between breaths, I were running through the woods when I saw it, this thing coming up out of the water, just coming right at me. It had huge black eyes and a large black frame, scaly, these long spiked fins along its back. This thing was unlike anything I've ever seen before. It was alien. It looked like the creature from the Black Lagoon. I thought it was a prank, but there's no way this could have been one. Hearing these words, I thought he was pranking us, but seeing him get so worked up and emotional, you could tell he was reliving this horrifying experience. Thinking about what he said, seeing this thing had before he swallowed hard, as if trying to force down every bit of fear he felt inside, while letting out one last deep breath. He told us how it wasn't more than 20 feet away from him, where the three of us stood now, and with more conviction in his voice than ever before. We could tell by the look on his face, he truly believed every word coming out of his mouth. We just stood there in silence for a good while, nobody really knowing what to say. I'm sure you know what we were thinking, too. We wanted him to think we believed him, so we could get rid of him and just go on swimming like nothing happened. Because, honestly, this seemed so weird. Who would believe this? In my head, I just assumed this guy was having some sort of manic mental breakdown or something. Some hallucination. I mean, it sounded ridiculous, telling us such wild stories. None of us bothered to ask if he had been drinking or something, but we didn't smell any booze on him. Still in shock by what he told us, and feeling utterly petrified, no less, my friends and I just let him be, and went back to enjoying our time together near the lake, as nothing had happened at all. We were all still surprised at how this guy had appeared out of nowhere, and told us such stories about what he saw, coming from the water, and running away in terror. You know, none of us really wanted to admit to ourselves that we actually believed him. At least I didn't, but my friends would later tell me. I think deep down inside, we all knew that his words weren't just lies being passed off. If they were, he was the world's best actor. Now, that evening was uneventful, Aside from one thing, which I'm sure you've already guessed, there was a noise again, like there had been the previous night. Except this time, it wasn't just coming from one place. It sounded as if the whole lake itself was alive, wailing sounds through the entire depth, and it lasted for maybe 12 minutes. Then everything was finally quiet, as if nothing bad had happened. Now this freaked us all out. Either there was some sort of paranormal thing happening, or something. The next day, we all decided to gather at the lake. Smart, right? Because something was obviously going on. Now we were seriously creeped out. At first the guy seeing this strange creature out of the water, and then the next this horrifying screaming from the lake. We couldn't make sense out of what was happening. I mean, we weren't even sure where to even start. I feel like we should have called the Scooby-Doo gang on us. 
but eventually our gut got the better of us and we finally came clean with one another in the midst of all this about believing the man because honestly now we had no reasonable explanation for what had just been going on here while we never saw a sea monster quite yet we experienced the screaming which was strange so a following night we're back yet again at the lake with some other friends who had come to see what was going on now we're all terrified to get in the water we all told them about our tall tale friend and his stories but we didn't mention anything about this monster not wanting to give any of us more reason to freak out than necessary it only took a few minutes though before we began hearing noises coming from the same direction that we'll call the man ryan said he'd heard it from in the first place it sounded like something big was moving around now we were all scared and i felt myself growing pale looking around to see if there could have been any explanation in fear none of us were able to say a word we all kind of whisper panicked asking one another if they hadn't just heard that too or what it was once again we were looking everywhere but there wasn't any sign of anything out there in the water or along the edge where it was lapping against the shore eventually we decided to just play it safe this part is still so vivid in my memory as if it happened only yesterday we heard some rustling next to us and we all looked and we could see this large shape moving toward us in the dark in the woods something large something dark moving in the same direction that ryan had told us about a few nights previous it appeared to be big and standing upright like a large man this was enough for us we all panicked and for whatever reason we decided to run to flee now we had never saw that other man anymore who we called ryan but we weren't going to tolerate this any longer we tried and tried to play the investigator game but to no luck this lake was obviously haunted or something some sort of crazy paranormal thing going on about it between the screaming and the strange noises and the feelings and this thing now watching us i couldn't figure out what was going on for several nights now this had been going on and this was more than enough for us my dad and i were coming back from a family reunion in tennessee and we decided to go to some places that had made him the happiest as a child seeing as how our family had moved from that area before he was far old enough to really remember them we arrived at one specific location and we noticed a famous stream that he would always talk about as a kid that he loved to go and fish at play and just be a kid had been replaced by a small highway so we drove around a little while longer searching for other areas we found another good one a little place that he liked to hung out as a teenager this area was now full of discarded cans and garbage it wasn't all that great as we're kind of looking around this area further back there were trails that he would usually hike down and you know being a teenager was full of debauchery he's motioning for me to continue down this trail that led just a little bit deeper into the woods now keep in mind at this point a lot of the surrounding wilderness had been turned to highway and much of the surrounding swamps were now being used for development not like they were back in the 80s now the surrounding woods we were entering were very thick very dense it even kind of cut off light the further in you went and you know i don't know exactly what it was at first i guess i kind of just got a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach not anything specific like what you tell in your stories where people get the feeling that they were being watched nothing like that it was more just a gut instinct like it's probably not safe to continue on further in that moment i assumed it was maybe because there might be dangerous homeless people around or drug addicts or what have you since there did seem to be signs of homeless camps what with all the garbage and cans and stuff or worse now out of the blue my father stops dead in his tracks sticks out his arm as if to stop me from walking further 
and I look up at him, and he's staring right at something, and he has the most serious expression on his face. So I'm asking him, Dad, what do you see? What's up? And I look out to where he's looking. Well, directly in front of us was kind of this little marsh, I guess you can call it. There was a cement wall on the other side that led to a lone road. Well, on this concrete block, or concrete wall, I guess you can call it, was a medium-sized storm drain. And out of the storm drain was climbing this, what I'll describe to you as a lizard man. I feel silly for even typing that, but that's the only way how I know how to describe it. I mean, imagine a person in a lizard costume or something. Except the movements were so smooth that there's no way this would be somebody in a costume. All the way out here, it didn't really make any sense. We weren't exactly miles and miles out from town. But we also weren't in the middle of a metropolitan area either. And who in their right mind would be climbing out of a storm drain in that sort of costume? We saw it kind of climb its way out and climb down into the marsh. Luckily, we were kind of tucked away back in the trees enough where this creature or animal did not seem to notice us. But my father and I got a very good look at it. Honestly, it kind of reminded me of like a half-man, half-dinosaur sort of thing. The head was very much so reptilian-like. The body was covered in scales, and it had a man very much like a body. Two arms, a chest, body, legs, all that stuff. Which is why I made the lizard man costume reference a paragraph ago. Once it climbed down out of the storm drain, it began walking off in the opposite direction, into the thick tree line, where there's more dense, thicker swamps. It never turned to look in our direction, and never seemed to have noticed us. My dad, of course, his gaze was locked on this thing for the whole 20-30 seconds that we watched it disappear. I think him and I were in such shock and awe, but more so him. I kind of couldn't believe my eyes, but he seemed to have this look on his face that just screamed danger. After this thing disappeared into the thicket of the trees, he finally broke his gaze and looked at me and just said, we should leave now. You know, I wasn't going to challenge that. I didn't ask any questions, so we quickly headed on back up the trail, maybe no more than a half a mile, up to the original spot that had all those discarded cans and garbage, made our way back further, and got to the car. After some time, I was the one to finally break the silence and ask, Dad, what did we see out there? I mean, we both saw it, right? Is that some sort of unidentified animal or maybe undiscovered species? He remained quiet and just looked at me with a very cold stare and said, I don't know, son, but I didn't like it. I mean, I know it's a very anticlimactic ending to my encounter, but that's really all it was said, and my father and I have not talked about it since. I mean, I don't really see much of a reason to, but uh, I thought in recent events with the world... I would maybe try and find some time, now that I had off, to reach out to different paranormal investigators and even story narrators, which is why I'm kind of drawn to your work and your channel. So, I thought I would shoot you an email. And hey, worst comes to worst, I don't get a response. And best comes to best, you read my story and your audience can help me out, since it appears they've helped out so many others. Best of luck and thank you so much. It was at night time, and I was driving along Highway 24, right around the area of this old mill house. This is when I stopped at a stop sign, and I see something large coming out of the tall field grass. At first, I assumed it was maybe a deer, but then I saw it was clearly no deer. The creature I saw, well, I can't identify it. I can tell you this, though. It was a behemoth of a thing. Maybe 800 pounds, and I'm not exaggerating. And its body was large and very serpentine-like, or snake-like, I should say. The head alone was maybe two or three feet large. Yeah, I'm not kidding you. This thing was massive. 
and it just seemed to kind of rise up out of the grass so calmly. It got about 10 feet away from my car and just glanced on by, as if me being there wasn't a big deal at all. In fact, it really didn't pay any attention to me, like it could have cared less that I even saw this thing. And as you can imagine, seeing something like this for the first time, especially at night, feeling extremely vulnerable, having no weapons, nothing, I was terrified out of my mind. This giant human reptile thing walking around with two red eyes. Part of me wanted to just stick in my disbelief. This creature checked off every box in a horror movie cliche, but at the same time, I couldn't deny what I was seeing its gait, its movement. You could see its muscles and skin. I mean, either this was somebody in the most convincing Hollywood monster costume I have ever seen and that's ever been made, or this was something truly out of this world. What's your opinion? This story takes place back in 2014. I was in a two-story house with my brother, kind of out in the backwoods of Missouri. He and his band rented this house out collectively for rehearsal. It wasn't an out-of-town too far, but you had to drive maybe about 10-15 minutes to get to it. And being a good brother that he is, allowed me to stay in the upper two stories part, which is just one big open room, which I used for my bedroom for a couple of weeks after getting out of a very toxic relationship. So, very early on in the morning, I'd say three or four, I was having trouble sleeping, and I'm out there on the balcony, looking down, just at the woods and the surrounding area, lost in thought, and I suddenly see a huge, maybe six, seven foot tall dark figure darting across the tree line. It caught my attention, and I thought it was an animal at first, until I looked. That's when I could see the figure much more clearly, because it moved. What I was looking at was a large bipedal animal, and believe it or not, it kind of resembled a cross between a gorilla, a lizard, and a human. Although, I couldn't see every enunciation of detail. It was very dark in color. Not just its coloring, but the lighting as well. Its head was huge. It had big long arms, and its body was also large too. The head, though, was more elongated, and, like I stated, easily six to seven feet tall. The only reason that I even saw this thing was because it was a full moon that night, but where the moon was positioned and angled in the sky did not, unfortunately, light up this thing so I can get a look at it. It was in fact on the other area of the sky, giving just enough light that I could see something was here, but not all the details that I wanted. I know it might sound kind of morbid, but I was kind of wanting to see what this thing looked like. Only because it was so unique, I guess. It stood there in the tree line for maybe, what, 10-15 seconds, and then it kind of disappeared deeper into the woods. I was the only person at the house at the time, and I actually wasn't that creeped out. While it was slightly disturbing... I kind of just wrote it off as maybe the darkness playing tricks in my eyes. Maybe the stress and emotional baggage from the bad relationship was causing me to see things that weren't exactly there. I slept on it, and after getting up the next morning, I realized last night was indeed not just stress, but I actually saw something. I've always been a believer in monsters and animals we might not be able to explain. And I've even seen some strange things in my life. But this, my friend, was definitely the strangest I had hands down ever seen. I was on this big adventurous hike to a lake with my friends. We had to walk through at least a couple of mile of woods from where we parked to get to said lake. And for the sake of the story, I'm going to keep the name of the lake anonymous. But... I could tell you that it was a very popular lake, still is, and since I was leading me and my few friends, I was of course in front, and as we're walking through the woods to get to said lake, 
I noticed something weird. I saw this big shadow, and I looked at it, trying to figure out what it was. I noticed it was kind of watching us from in between some trees, and it stayed perfectly still, so that's why I didn't exactly catch it at first. My first inkling was that it was maybe a man, but the more I looked at it, even with how dark it was, it looked wrong. Now, before I go on, you might be thinking, oh, well, you just saw Bigfoot. But I'm telling you, Bigfoots don't look like this thing did. This had a much more reptile-like appearance. The head was very long. The arms were very long. It kind of reminded me of a serpent head on a human body, with scales and everything, but just dark. After looking at it, I stopped my friends and had them look too, just to make sure I wasn't going crazy. As soon as we all stopped and began gawking at this thing, it immediately tilts its head up to look at us and starts jolting after us. We all start screaming and began running back the way we came. We could hear it chasing after us in the woods, and it caught up very quickly. I mean, it was probably no more than 30 yards away at max, and it was in a section of woods where it wasn't so thick we couldn't see it. It's like it was waiting there for somebody, for us. The thing chased after us, though, and it was moving so fast. I didn't think it was possible. We didn't know what to do, so we ran and we ran, and we were able to ran back to where we had initially parked. I was so scared. I mean, all of us were. We were all looking at each other like, did that just happen? What was that? I'm not sure why, but... I believe whatever this thing was could have caught up to us and grabbed us, but it didn't. It just, it's like it wanted to chase us out for whatever reason. We were only maybe a half mile in the trail, and we all said that we could all hear it almost right behind us, right in the trees. I'm not sure why it never reached out and tried to grab any of us. That's kind of a mystery to me. So we all get in the car and we drive off and we're trying to speculate what it was. What animal could it have been? A few of us talked and argued that it was a Bigfoot, but Bigfoots don't look like that. Not that I'm aware of, at least, unless I'm missing something. Yes, we were all terrified, but I strongly feel that this was something else entirely. I don't know if lizard men exist or snake men exist, but that's the closest thing I could even compare it to. It was my son and I, and a friend. We were out trout fishing at a local lake, not too far away from home base. It was a late summer evening, around maybe 9.30, just enough to where it was getting pretty dusky, but not quite dark yet. We were all sitting at the end of a dock fishing, and we had our dog, Jody, with us. He's a sweet boy, a Labrador retriever, we take him on all of our outings. He, at least we like to think he keeps us safe. He barks whenever there's a predator around, so he does a pretty good job of warning us and warding off any potential danger. And thanks to him, with this encounter, we saw what we did and potentially saved our lives. We're sitting there with our lines in the water, lost in conversation, and we hear Jody start barking and barking at something. I turn my attention, and I see he's barking at the water, off to our left. Then, I look a little closer, and I see the shape of something large coming up out of the lake. I motion to my friend and my son, and they all look in unison, and we're watching as Jody now begins to bark frantically, going crazy, and then... Out of the lake steps this horror. I don't even know how to describe it accurately in detail. It kind of reminded me of a half-man, half-alligator. Really ugly and grotesque looking. Covered in scales and that thick armor plate that alligators are known for having. It just kind of ascends up out of the water. This elongated face. It turns and looks at us, stares at Jody, and casually walks off into the thicket that's right there, 
maybe no more than 10 feet from the water. As soon as it fully ascends out of the water and onto the shore, Jody begins whimpering and running back towards us, as he's terrified of whatever creature that is. My son, nearly soiling himself, was screaming, Dad, Dad, what is that? What did we just see? And my friend, of course, was silent, as was I. We couldn't really say much, but we all three agreed in unison. Let's leave. I just didn't feel it was safe there anymore. On the drive back, we all kind of talked about it a little more and said, man, I don't know what that thing was. But as soon as we saw it, this feeling of we should leave now, it's not safe, just kind of took over all of us. I mean, had it not, I don't think we would have left. Something was wrong. What that something was, I don't know. Look, I am not an advocate for the strange and paranormal. I don't believe in ghosts or any of that, or even Bigfoot or strange creatures. But I can't explain this animal. I don't want to go so far as to say it was a lake monster. I feel like that's ridiculous, but I've never seen a reptilian that was bipedal that also came out of the lake. That was a first for all of us. Let me just say this first and foremost. I'm not a conspiracy person. I don't own a tinfoil hat, metaphorically of course, and I'm a pretty rational, scientific-rooted person. But I have no way to explain away this experience that I had back in 1998. Let me tell you, I was just a sophomore in college, and I was working in a bar in a small town in southwestern Florida. It was a great place, frequented by locals, many of whom I knew and many of whom knew me. We had a lot of regular faces. It was a place where people could get beer and never have to worry about somebody making them feel uncomfortable or getting hit on or getting in a fight, at least not while on my shifts. It was a fun place. At the time, I was the only girl working there. I was the bartender and the only female that served beer. So, I was the only female that had to work at the bar. The place was a small old building that had originally been a gas station and years later was converted to the store and then eventually became a bar. The bar was in the front and the back of the building held the kitchen, a small office, and the bathrooms. So, enough about that. It was a Saturday night. I was working the bar all by myself, which I was accustomed to. I had worked by myself quite a bit, and I'm not going to lie. I have never made as great as tips as I ever have in my life working that job. But tonight was pretty slow. The place only had a few customers, and I was chatting with a group of maybe three people who were sitting there at the bar. Just small talk. Just joking around and having fun. I thought I was having a pretty good time, and until this particular man walked in. He walks up right to the bar and I turn around, cleaning a bar mug. I did not know this man. I had never seen him before, but there was something interesting about what he wore and the way he looked. I did not know anybody else who knew him. In fact, I wasn't the only one startled by his presence. Everybody in that bar seemed to kind of have that Hollywood movie moment where the guy walks in and where everybody just stops and kind of stares with a blank expression. That's the perfect way to kind of captivate this moment. He sits down, never breaking a stare. I mean, he's a big guy, strong jawline, dark hair. He had a black shirt on and jeans and looked like he had just come from the gym. The thing that struck me the most, though, was his eyes. They were these incredibly dark eyes. Not like fully black or anything, but he just had really stark, contrasty eyes. They were almost hypnotizing, and not in a lustful, romantic way. It was almost like a trance, like he had this power. I know, I know, it's a bizarre description, but that's what it was. He had this very intense look on his face, almost like he was waiting for somebody, me to say something. So... I kind of stood there without a word, just staring back at him, wondering who this guy was. 
After a little bit, maybe 10 seconds, I nervously just said, can I help you? Without him ever breaking his gaze. He just kept stare, smirked a little, and just said, I think so. Now at this point, I was getting creeped out. His demeanor, his attitude, everything was just weird. I mean, I've worked here already for a while, and no guy has ever just came in here and looked at me like that, without saying anything. I didn't know what he wanted, and I did not know who he was. So, my response was, um, okay, what do you want? He paused for a moment. Keep in mind, during this entire interaction, I don't even think I saw the man blink once, let alone break eye contact. It was the creepiest thing. He calmly just says, I want you, in a very monotone. At this point, not only am I creeped out, but I'm confused. And in the moment and being nervous, I was like, um, I'm working, what do you want? He smirked again and said, I would like to buy you a drink, if you want one. I had to politely kind of shoot him down and say, well, I'm working, so I don't drink right now. But maybe if you stick around, you can buy me one later. So he said, okay. And he just sat there, looking at the menu. And so now I'm kicking myself for even saying that. Stupid, stupid. Why did I give him such an invitation? Oh gosh, I was a nervous wreck. The people sitting at the bar just kept staring back at me, staring back at him, staring at each other, exchanging glances of confusement and, oh boy, she's in trouble kind of look. He sat there quiet, and I was busy cleaning and doing my job duties. Maybe 45 minutes goes by and he's still sitting there, staring at the menu. I think I asked him, have you thought about what you wanted yet? And as he turns to look up back up at me, here's the terrifying part. As he lifts his head up in response to my question, his eyes were not normal. They were something wrong with them. They looked like snake eyes or something. They were this dark green and had these huge black slits in them. And maybe like a half second later, no more than a second, it's almost like they turn normal again. Like the same way an alligator does. You know, how they have those secondary eyelids. It was like a blinking, but not with his actual eyelids. I kind of screamed when I saw it and kind of flung myself back. He did that blinking thing and his eyes were normal again, just very dark. And he looked puzzled, but still very mono-expressive. Tilted his head very robotically and asked, What's wrong? I told him, You need to get out of here now or I'm calling the police. Then, without ever breaking eye contact, he slowly stands up then turns his head and his body and slowly goes to walk out the door. As he gets to the door, he stops as his hand touches the door, turns around, looks at me again, and says, It's a shame. You would have made such a great addition. Then immediately turned around and walked out. That was the last I ever saw of him. My skin felt like it was crawling. I was so creeped out. The guys at the bar were like, who was that guy? And I told him, I don't know. Well, luckily, my regulars were very kind and nice to me and said, hey, we don't know who he was, but we all got the creeps. We'll stay here late if you'd like to you close to protect you. I thought that was very kind, and I took all three guys up on the offer. And they stayed with me until my shift ended at around 1 or 2 in the morning, kept me company. The guy never reappeared. So that's my college story. Now, here's an important note. Fast forward almost 10 years to about 2009, and my aunt is very big, still is by the way, into the paranormal and things like conspiracy theories, reptilians, you know, all that kind of stuff. Nothing that I really ever pay attention to. But I guess she was telling me there are these beings called reptilians. They apparently have the ability to shapeshift into people. I kind of laughed the notion off at first and then she went on to show me some clips. People being caught on camera, like newscasters and TV hosts and celebrities, except their eyes change. And she showed me that. I felt my skin crawl again. That memory of that night instantly came back to me. 
That's exactly what I saw that night. I didn't tell my aunt anything. I mean, I always thought she was kind of crazy, but I just kind of shot her down and was like, yeah, that's, that's terrifying. But I knew deep down, something was wrong with that man. I can't sit here and say with concrete evidence that was exactly the case, but the resemblance to the video she showed me, to what his eyes looked like and his strange odd behavior, sure is uncanny how close they're related. Hi, what lurks beneath? Before I tell you this, I trust you'll keep my name anonymous and my location anonymous as well. And I also trust that you'll at least hear me out. And if I'm lucky, read my story. I know you're a busy man, and so I bet with all the stories you get, you probably don't have much time. Well, here's mine, and feel free to use it if you'd like. I lived in the swampy areas of Illinois for a very long time. I was deer hunting in the swamps, well, about three years ago now. This day in particular was very foggy, and I was busy walking along a path in the swamp. I heard a noise that was not something I'm used to hearing. It was like this very fast pitter-pattering. Except the pitter-pattering was not that of light weight. These were heavy, more like thuds against the ground. I knew it was something because, again, I never heard anything like this before. Thinking maybe it was an alligator. I got down, crouching and listening for a moment. It was actually coming up in the trees around me. Not on the ground. I'm thinking to myself, what the? And then I hear branches kind of breaking and moving up in the trees around me. So I get up from a crouched position and I'm looking around. Instantly, as I turn behind me, I see these glowing pairs of eyes looking at me. This was during the day, mind you. So my visibility wasn't exactly poor. What I was looking at... I have no explanation for. It was just this big creature. It looked very dinosaur-like, if I can describe it. I had a hard time seeing the entirety of the thing, even though the light was good, because of how it was holding onto the tree. It was kind of crouched, on a large branch, actually, higher up in the trees. It had a pretty big head, and looked to be bigger and taller than I was. I didn't waste any time. I ran back to my truck, and I've never really sat down to tell anybody this before. But I know what I saw, and it was not a deer. What this thing was, I don't know. To me, it reminded me of some failed genetic experiment somebody tried to do by splicing human and dinosaur DNA. Sure, it sounds like a science fiction plot gone wrong, but that's what I saw. This was back in 2016. I was with my friend Josh on a run in the Pine Barrens in southern New Jersey. It was a cool autumn morning. The sun was out, and the leaves were just starting to change color. And it was the perfect morning for a run. We were running a trail, you know, just for exercise and to get some good fresh air. A nice, brisk pace always helps the body. And this particular trail was slightly challenging, with it being uphill. We were both talking about how nice it was out and how much we enjoyed being out here in the woods. So, here's a quick note, before I go any further with my story. Yes, I'm aware that Pine Barrens is home to all sorts of strange stories and encounters. Things like UFO sightings and bright lights, alien abductions, Bigfoots, and yes even the Jersey Devil. I've heard it all, but I've never experienced anything myself, never seen anything, never felt anything weird, and I've lived here for a long time. Not all my life, but enough and enough time in the Pine Barrens hiking and running around that I feel like if those things were true, I would have seen something, at least by now. Well, that mentality that I had was proven wrong this day. As I was saying, we were running on this trail when, up ahead of us, we see something. Now bear in mind here, this is what we saw. We saw something big climbing out of the ground. At first, we kind of stopped thinking, what is this? 
but it happened very fast. This large, lizard-like thing pulled itself out of the ground within a matter of seconds, like it just kind of dug itself out. Think of how in the movies where it shows, you know, zombies digging themselves out of a grave and pulling themselves up. It was similar to that, but it was way faster. It was like a slick, solid motion of just arms out, body coming up out of the ground, boom. I feel like the phrase pooping bricks is a severe understatement to how Josh and I felt. We were frozen, as this being had pulled itself out of the ground, and its expression was kind of stunned and shocked that we were there, like it wasn't sure how to react to the fact that we had seen it. And we were kind of just locked in this stare for, I don't know, maybe five seconds before Josh just grabs me and takes off going the opposite direction. My body reacted and we both ran as fast as we could. Somehow, we managed not to scream and I'm really surprised I didn't scream like a little girl after seeing what we did. We get all the way back down the trail and get back to the parking lot. We stop and try to catch our breath. After heaving and breathing heavily, maybe a minute goes by and we're finally able to breathe enough to where we can ask each other, what was that? Did you see that? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And yeah, I can't believe we saw that. What was that? None of us knew. None of us even could even think about what it could have been. Like I told you already, I have lived here for at least 10 plus years and have never even heard or seen of anything remotely like that. Let me give you a good description of what it was since we had such a good view of it. This thing was a dark green, almost black, and it was covered in scales. It had a body similar to a man, but very large clawed hands and feet, and the head was almost kind of like a velociraptor, at least in shape. The eyes were a very contrasty yellow, very piercing, actually. We never saw any teeth, but I guess the best description I would call it is a dinosaur man, because it was like half man, half dinosaur, I guess. I also didn't see a teeth, but this thing was also ripped. I mean, through its scales, you could see its rippling muscles, all over its arms, all over its chest and stomach. I did not see any genitalia. It was not wearing any clothing or anything to cover that. I don't know what it was, and I don't want to go back in those woods to find out, if we're honest. In my early teens, my brother and I would always go out to the backwoods to hunt for treasure. We often implored the use of a metal detector. We found all sorts of cool but useless stuff in hindsight. Bottle caps, old knives, cans, forks, things like that. Nothing too exciting, but as a teenager, it was like striking gold. The adventure would usually start with us being out after dark coming home muddy and exhausted. I mean, hey, it got us out into the woods and burned a lot of calories in the process. I guess this is why we always stayed in shape, which would come in handy for what would happen in the story. Let me just take a brief moment and explain the layout of the land. Our father owned a vast amount of acreage on the back side of our property. You had multiple creeks, and it kind of dipped down and you go further and further back and then the land kind of goes up into a hill. Once you get to the top of this gradual slope, you could go back down again into a deeper section of valley that was all just forest upon forest. Now, during the fall season, my father would use these areas as hunting and even had multiple deer stands set up all throughout there. My brother and I never really ventured that far out. I mean, we're talking hundreds of acres here. So... We generally stayed within maybe a mile or two, at most, of our own house. Don't quote me on the distance thing, though. I really have no way to verify that measurement. It's just from my recollection. So, we often had this evening ritual. We'd be out there pretty much all day, playing and trying to look for stuff to hunt for treasure with, and of course, using our trusty metal detector. By about evening time, sometimes, we would sit and relax my brother and I on top of the far back large hill and just kind of hear the crickets slowly fade into the night and see the weather and sky change. 
it was always really peaceful. Sometimes, well, more often than not, we would actually see foxes and deer. I can't dismiss it that it was really cool. But there was one night that I feel for me and my brother, but I can't speak for him. It kind of changed things. So we had a fairly normal day of hunting for treasure. And again, I don't believe we found anything extraordinary, at least not that I can recall. And we were doing our usual of sitting atop this large hill, looking out into the night valley, or should I say almost night. That's when we started to hear sounds from the hill below us, something big moving around. My brother was the first one to hear it, as it got his attention first. He starts looking in that direction and knocks me on the shoulder, saying, Hey, listen, and you could hear something big moving around. We thought it might be a buck or something, just due to the amount of noise it was making. But you could hear it was moving, and you could hear it wasn't walking, like the way a deer would. It was two-legged, whatever it was. And so now we're both really curious, trying to look through the trees and see if we can see anything. But we don't see anything. At this point, in the sky, it's pretty dusk. It's not totally black out yet, but it's getting dark. And my brother and I were never afraid of walking back to the house at night, since we knew this part from the hill back to our house pretty well and we were pretty hardy teenagers. We just kept thinking, there's no way somebody's back here. I mean, the only way to access it is you'd have to go all the way around, maybe another 40 or so acres in either direction. And quite frankly, if somebody was out here, they would have a lantern or some sort of flashlight. And there's really nothing out here. It's not hunting season. There's nothing of value. There's no reason why anybody should be back here. And... The other thing is this movement sounded like it was coming from something very large, much bigger than just a man. All these thoughts are going through my head, and I'm sure my brothers at the same time, and we're looking and we're looking. And then, my brother and I at the same time in unison see these red glowing eyes just appear down in the bottom of the hill, and they're moving up towards us. I believe again my brother sees it first. And he hits me on the shoulder, and he says, look, and points. And we both see it. This figure, this tall figure is coming towards us with red eyes. I remember saying, what is that? And it gets closer and closer. And I think at this point, we were both so scared, we couldn't even get up to move. I know the natural instinct is to probably get up and run. But when you're that terrified, on a primal fear level, it's different. It grounds you in a way that you can't physically react like you're supposed to. It got closer and closer till the shadows and darkness of the tree coverage became lighter and lighter, and we could start to make out what it was. It's almost like the lack of darkness allowed this thing to be illuminated by whatever little light there was supplied by the stars and the moon. My brother and I got a front row show to the horror of whatever this creature was that certainly was far from anything human. And after seeing it with my own eyes, which I later verified with my brother in verbatim to make sure we saw the same thing, this looked like some sort of lizard alien thing. I'm not sure what else you'd call it, to be honest. But I can tell you, it had a flat face, slitted pupils, large red-yellow eyes, a very reptilian shaped like head. It was very tall, not really built strong full of muscles like you would see in a bodybuilder, but more so very lanky in its torso and its arms and legs. And it had this large tail behind it. It was kind of like a large lizard man, I guess if that's the best way to describe it. It never opened up its mouth, so I never saw any teeth but I could tell that its face, like I said, was flat, and the nose had slits. It also never made any sounds, other than the crunching of leaves and coming up from the brush. It was maybe, I don't know, 50 feet away from us, when my brother manages to jump up, grab me by the collar, and yank me and pull me. Somehow, 
like kick starting a motor. That's all my legs needed in order to run back to the house. And at this point, it was dark. Maybe not pitch black, but darker. And the second we go running down the hill, back towards the slope up to our property, we can hear this thing now picking up its pace, chasing us, running behind us, and it's gaining quickly. Trust me, I did not look back. I know all about that. I was not going to risk that happen and falling and tripping over a rock and just being bait for whatever this thing was. Again, it never screamed or let in any noise, just that it gave chase. We made it to the bottom of this hill and the gradual slope back up to our house. I think it must have stopped either way, somewhere along before we hit the bottom, because afterwards we didn't see it anymore or hear it, and I really have no idea what it was. We'd made it back, just in time. Our parents weren't home, and so I didn't want to tell them anything anyway. I talked to my brother, asked him, what do you think that was? Because we both saw the same thing. We're not crazy. We didn't just see stuff. We did not hallucinate. That thing was as real as flesh and blood can get. And it's safe to say we didn't sleep that much that night. As terrified as I was from the whole experience, I tried to think analytically. Like, okay, this is obviously some sort of large predatory animal, bipedal or not. Then I start thinking about the logistics. Well, there's a lot of food back there. Tons of deer. Tons of bear and foxes. Lots of food. Lots of places to go undisturbed and hide. If there was anywhere, there would be some sort of creature like this. That back side of the property is exactly where you would find one. Although, I'm sure that my father has maybe had sightings himself, but he would never tell us, I'm sure. We had gone back there since multiple times, and yes, even at dusk, but we never saw this thing again. You might call me either brave or stupid for going back there, especially at dark. But, you know, when you're a teenager, you think you're practically invincible, as we did. We felt that if we had a bowie knife and the proper tools, we would be more equipped to handle a situation like that, which we kept on us all the time from that point forward, but never encountered it again, whatever it was. Being out in the desert, it's not uncommon to see strange things. Lights in the sky, weird sounds, even beings. And I have an account that is absolutely terrifying to the core. In fact, I'm sure you may not even believe me, but all my friends who were at this bonfire can testify that what we experienced was something of the evil supernatural realm. So let's clear out some details first. We're all about 1819, and since the pandemic, we've been driven crazy. So on this night, we were looking to go out into the desert and just have some fun, away from being locked in, and our parents, of course. It was a group of about seven of us, me, my girlfriend, a buddy of mine, his girlfriend, a couple mutual friends, and one of their family members. And so we drive out to this small area that's not too far from home, build a pretty good bonfire, and, of course, like any 18-year-olds do, bring some booze and some snacks and get ready to have just a fun night of just letting loose, because we were all getting pretty tired of being stuck inside, for one. This was actually, too, about a year ago, maybe last June or maybe last May. It was still right when the pandemic was in the thick of everything. So we got the bonfire going, we're having a good time, cutting up, laughing, and talking. I think none of us had had dinner yet, so we were eating some snacks and just talking. We did have beer set aside, but nobody at this point had even drunk yet. And, for whatever reason, unknown, my friend's family member, we'll call him Craig, starts talking about skinwalkers, which really creeped all the rest of us out because the conversation was, I think, about some funny memories or something, and he just starts talking and going on about skinwalkers. 
something some of us had never even heard about. And then my buddy is like, you shouldn't talk about them, you're going to draw the energy of them here. And even more so being nighttime, all alone in the desert night. They start bickering and arguing back and forth. And then my girlfriend and his girlfriend start to get really creeped out, while the rest of us are trying to tone it down. I mean, the argument or discussion got pretty heated. It ended up with them calling each other a few names and voices rising for sure. But maybe after five or so minutes, we're able to calm both of them down and successfully and change the topic of conversation. But it doesn't seem like that lasted long because Craig just shut up altogether and just sat there. Just as I start to feel the good vibes coming back, of everybody smiling and laughing again, we all, all seven of us, hear the sound of what appears to be large, multiple animals coming towards us, but staying and circling around the fire. Like they were just outside the light of the fire, by, I don't know, a couple car lengths? However many feet that is. And this was maybe 20 some odd minutes after the initial conversation of skinwalkers was started. And we all hear it. And so we all turn around, looking for the source of this noise and whatever animal or animals are making them. It kind of reminded me personally of a couple of loose cows, except extremely aggressive with the way their footsteps were. But they did not sound bipedal. It was definitely four legs, and there was at least five or six of them, just kept circling us around the fire. We try not to think much of it, like maybe it was just some loose cattle, or maybe horses. There's got to be a reason for it, right? But as time went on, and by time I mean five, ten minutes, we're trying our best to ignore this, but the noises, all the strange sounds are just getting more and more apparent like the hoof sounds, or so it sounded like, the snorting, the hissing, even growling. And not long after, we are all freaking out. So one of our buddies decided he was going to walk the quarter mile or so back to the car to grab an adequate flashlight and expose these what he thought were loose steer for what they were. So he starts jogging back the direction of the cars, and not even two minutes later, comes sprinting back towards the fire, and we see him running from a distance, and so we're calling out to him, asking, what's wrong, what happened? And he runs right up to the fire, and he is pale as a ghost. I had never seen Devin this way. I'll call him Devin for the sake of the story. He was as pale as a sheet, and he looks at us all in the eyes, and his eyes are about as big as a plate, and he keeps saying that he was chased and we're like, what? What do you mean chased? He said that he got a good look at those things because one or two of them broke off from the other few and followed him as he walked towards the car in the night. He said that he kind of saw what it was. He described it as being half man, half reptile, but that it was skeletal looking. And he was all choked up and scared and shaking as he's telling us this. Now, the entire night... Multiple of these things continued to circle around us. Maybe, I don't know, if I had to guess, 30 feet beyond the light of the fire. But they would never get closer than that. Even as the fire died down, we had already planned on being out here most of the night anyway, until the early wee morning hours, so we had plenty of wood. That wasn't the problem. We were just terrified to leave the light of the fire, and the entire night was incredibly fearful unexpected, and unsure of what was going to happen to us. I think at some point we all decided that we're just going to have to stay within the light of the bonfire until light. We don't have a choice. And I've never in my life felt like I was living in a real Hollywood horror movie until this night. And at some point, a huge argument which turned into a fist fight with Craig and a couple of my buddies ensued because the buddy... Not the one that saw this thing and walked to the car, but the other one flipped out on Craig saying, you caused this, you brought these things here to us because you mentioned skinwalkers. And the fist fight ensued, they're fighting, rolling back and forth. 
we had to break that up. And it seemed like whatever these things were were really drawn to the violence. Like it excited them, I guess if you want to call it that. It was very strange. But we were basically forced to stay up all night and keep the fire going until there was just enough light. And as the dawn came, and just enough light peeked over the horizon to expose somewhat beyond the light of the fire, we didn't see anything. So maybe whatever it was knew that the sun was coming up and retreated. Either that or they were very well camouflaged. So we put out the bonfire as soon as we had enough light to run back to the car. And we all bolted. And it's not like we were anywhere special. We'd all just pulled randomly off the side of a road at a spot we all thought would work. And if you have the car, you could look out and see clearly right where a bonfire was. And like I said, you're out here in the desert. It's flat. There ain't nothing to hide behind. And that was the last time we've done a bonfire. I still talk to my friends, but we've not done anything like that since, at least at night. And as a matter of fact, I just tried mentioning this probably about a week ago because the story popped up in my head and I felt like talking to one of my buddies and wanted assurance that that actually happened. He flat out refused to acknowledge that it even happened. I've not spent any time questioning any of my other friends who were there, asking them, what do you think? Did you see the same thing? But I feel like if we had to stand witness for it, we all could which is why I stand by what I originally did in my opening paragraph. There was more than just me. We all experienced this hell as a group. No matter how terrifying it may have been. Oh, and one last thing I need to include. If you do decide to read the story, which I'm not sure if you will, please leave my real name out of this. Thank you. I'm only one-fourth native, Chickasaw to be specific. My grandfather, who the majority of this story is going to be about, married a white Slovakian woman, and if he of course was full-blooded Chickasaw. He's got all sorts of terrifying tales of a creature that he saw that he described going from being a man to shape-shifting into this reptile-like thing, or as he called it specifically, the man-dragon, because of how terrifyingly fierce that it looked. It was also extremely violent to not towards just him, but the tribe itself, and any man that it came across. It was full of bloodlust. He says that the entity, although disguised itself as a man, distinctly still looked different and tried to blend in with the tribe, but everybody knew what it was, and it was always opted out. On several occasions, it had tried to kill several of his grandfather's siblings and other fellow tribe members back in the day. And at one point, they just stopped seeing it altogether. And that was the end of that. It really makes you wonder exactly what it is they experienced and saw. It got to such an extreme, though, that the tribe, at one point or another, had sent about three of their top warriors to go after this thing. They returned unsuccessful, and were not able to locate it, but that at nighttime, this creature would slowly find its way within the village and often try and attack several of the tribe's members, if not steal the children and attack the women, really anybody it could. The tribes knew this thing as some sort of reptilian shapeshifter creature, or the shapeshifter dragon they often referred to it as in the Chickasaw native tongue. Because I'm only like one-fourth native, I don't know enough about my own culture to really understand the language that much since it was never spoken to me. Although my grandfather has taught me some of the language, very small amounts though. My parents, and even he, mostly talks to me in English. I'm just glad I never had to see this thing myself. And I guess other tribes in the entire Oklahoma area in northern Texas also have written and verbal stories passed down of the Dragon Man and how it has the ability to take shape and form of people, and can shapeshift at will, knowing the very limited amount of knowledge I do about my own culture and my own people. Is it possible that this is some sort of skinwalker, or maybe something else entirely? I don't know. I mean, 
my people do have a lot of stories about Bigfoot, too, and dogmen, puckwudgies, and several other cryptid-like creatures, even flying ones, and ones that live in the water. My people even had lakes that were marked as not safe because of certain beings that lived in them and dwelt at the bottom of the lake. Is it possible that this dragon man surrounded itself in the woods nearby and was just waiting until the right time to strike? Which it probably never got because my people pursued it endlessly until it just stopped coming around. These are questions I'll probably never have the answer to. And my father doesn't have many answers to them either. Or my grandfather. But it's something I look to explore more of and hopefully come back to you with a lot more terrifying stories. I had my own creepy, eerie encounter back in 2004 when I was still in high school and used to have Saturday night halo parties with a small circle of friends. It was pretty much the same thing every Saturday night. We would show up, mom would order us a pizza, and we would just play halo till the wee morning hours. Usually be pretty exhausted, but filled with enough soda, pizza, and adrenaline to sometimes carry us up to 4 or 5 in the morning. I remember that well, because we would usually get so excited, end up yelling and keeping his mom up all night, when after inviting five 15-year-old boys over for a video game night and having to get up for work early the next day, it was probably sleep suicide for her. But there's always one night that stands out to me, as was easily the creepiest, and I'm pretty sure if I talked to all my friends who were a part of that circle, they'd all remember the exact same thing. I can't remember the exact time in the morning, but I can tell you it was after 1 a.m., because on this night, his mom stayed up pretty late with us, just hanging out, talking, making food. She was actually one of the most coolest moms you could ever meet. She wouldn't play video games with us, but you could tell she tried to be into it with us and try to sit and have conversation. It was really nice, and after a couple of glasses of wine, she made the decision to turn in for bed, since she'd have to be getting up early, like 5 or 5.30 in the morning, something like that. So, we said our goodnights, and we continued staying up playing. My friend, I think, was getting up to grab a slice of pizza when we heard a sound outside the sliding glass door. Before I continue with my harrowing story, let me explain the layout of his house. So you first walk in, and you're greeted by an enormously oversized living room with his large TV right in the corner. So as soon as you step in and turn to your right, the TV is tucked in the corner, facing you at a diagonal angle. But if you were to turn your head directly straight, it would go right into the kitchen with a large island. Now keep walking straight. To your left would be the hallway where the bedrooms were. Keep walking straight, and now you're right at about the fridge. Now if you were to turn right, you would run directly into the island. So going around it are the sliding glass doors. His entire kitchen, dining room, and living room were just like one big open room. I think it was a custom house they had built, but that's irrelevant. The sound we heard outside was almost like an animal, but I actually thought it was somebody trying to open the sliding glass door. Thinking to myself, okay, maybe somebody's trying to play with us or play a prank on us, but also mildly worried in the back of my head because I realized none of us had stepped outside for any reason. But after maybe 20 seconds of this, the sound had stopped. We all had heard it. I thought it was weird, but just assumed it was probably a raccoon or something. So we went back to playing our skirmish death match. Maybe another 45 minutes rolls around. And now we all began to have this strange feeling. We all discussed it openly. We felt like there was something outside the house. I don't even know how to describe it to you. We never used the term paranormal, ghosts, or demonic entities, of course. But whatever it was, the electromagnetic energy around the house and in the house changed. It felt like you were standing next to one of those rubber balls. You know how, like, when you're a kid, somebody would take a balloon and rub it really fast against your hair and then make your hair all staticky and stand up. And you could kind of feel the electricity in the air. That's kind of how it was, except all over the house and we all noticed it, several of us making comments. 
we almost wondered if it was a thunderstorm that was about to happen. Then, on the outer wall, right where the TV is outside, we hear this incredibly loud thud, like something very large jumping ten feet off the air onto the dirt. We didn't hear anything after that. So, we all got up, kind of wondering what on earth was that. We go to the window, which is closer to the opposite corner of where the TV is, and try to look out. There's no porch light, or really any light for a matter of fact on that side of the house. It was just pitch black. We didn't see anything. So, things were getting weird, but nobody chalked it up to anything just yet. Now we go back to playing Halo, and now it's maybe closer to 2.30 in the morning, finishing off the pizzas that we had bought. I'll never forget this moment. We were playing a game called King of the Hill in Halo, where you have to try and control a small area of territory. I remember, I was just about to cap the time when we heard my friend's mom scream bloody murder. We all stop, look back. We hear her scream a second time and come running out of the room in a complete panic. We're asking her what's going on, assuming maybe a mouse had found its way in her bed, or maybe a snake. We had no idea, but we were all a little on edge with everything going on. And she's beginning to cry, saying there was this really creepy lizard face watching her from the window. We all assumed it was just somebody in a costume trying to play a prank. Now, the majority of us were very worried, but my friend, the one whose mom it was, decided to call the police right then and there, and we're going to catch this person who's trying to prank our house. While my friend is on the phone with the police, and they're about to send somebody over, his mom is still in hysterics because, for whatever reason, this grown woman was terrified at seeing a supposed man in a lizard costume staring at her through the window. But I guess I can't blame her. She was probably terrified that this person was planning on breaking in and doing God only knows what to her. So, now we're all freaked out, on edge, Halo has kind of taken a back seat, on pause, and the only weapon we have besides knives in the kitchen is a steel baseball bat. Now we're all kind of scared to go outside, but we determine if we go out in an entire group, whoever this punk is can't do anything. So, we each grab a knife, and my friend, after getting off the phone with the cops, grabs his steel bat. We turn on the porch light, and we all step outside in a very close-knit formation. We're looking around, and we realize in that moment, we can't hear a thing. This was in May, so the night is usually alive with crickets and sounds. It was so quiet. It wasn't just quiet, but it was like an eerie quiet, like anything was about to happen. So here we are, all on edge, standing out on his front porch, weapons in hand, expecting some psycho in a lizard costume to come attacking us. We also had a flashlight. At least one of us did. The rest of us were poorly equipped with our phone's flashlight apps, which, you know, in the dead of night, aren't really that bright. As we're all huddled together, looking around, expecting to see this psycho walking towards us, we see headlights coming our direction, and I bet we looked like fools, because it was the officer... He pulled up, very freaked out by seeing how freaked out we all were, about to draw his weapon, asking us if everything was okay, and we quickly explained that we were on edge and told him the situation. We were obviously able to calm down enough to not provoke any sudden action from an officer, like him shooting at us because we had weapons on us. So, we calmly explained what was going on, and right then and there, as he's taking our statement, we all... The officer included, my friend's mom, and all five of us hear this loud banging sound on the back side of the house. Right now, it's probably close to three in the morning. We're all standing in the front driveway, speaking to this officer. We hear this noise, and immediately, all of our attention is brought back to that side. The officer, looking concerned, tells us all to quickly go inside, and he holds onto his gun and works his way towards the back of the house. We all run inside, lock the doors. Now we're freaked out, because whoever this intruder was, was trying to break in. 
It sounded like somebody throwing something heavy at the house. We actually hear the gunshot go off. Pam! Pam! My friend's mom starts screaming, and my friend tries to calm her down. But now we're all like, dude, what on earth? What if he had a weapon? What if he was trying to get in and kill us? After we heard the two gunshots, it went quiet. Probably about seven or eight minutes later, the officer knocks on our door, and he's pale white, tells us that whoever it was is now gone. We began storming him with questions, like who was that? What happened? Why did you have to fire your pistol? And he calmly explained, as nerve-wracking as possible, that this person in a large reptile suit came charging after him, and he had to fire two shots. They apparently acted extremely hostile, and were faster than any person he has ever seen. Once he fired both shots, this person disappeared. So he did a full sweep of the perimeter, several times, didn't see anything, and for whatever reason, you could tell by the expression on his face, he was covered in cold sweat, and was pale, like there's more to the story that he wasn't telling us, that this wasn't just a person in a reptile suit. He seemed very short of breath, drained of color, and kept muttering to himself. He finally said that he's going to stay around, stick in the area, just in case this person decides to come back. Now none of us know what's truly going on, and we're all terrified to know that somebody might come and break in, and potentially harm us, and they somehow survived two gunshots from an officer. The rest of the night went quiet, but we were all pretty much huddled together on the couch, just waiting for sunrise. I'd like to tell you I at least got an hour of sleep, but I really doubt it was even that. From that point forward, to probably 7 or 8 in the morning, it was kind of just a blur of adrenaline and fear, hoping this person does not come back. So this is where the story really changes. We go out there at 8 in the morning, because the officer comes back to talk to us, and one of our friends goes and scouts around, now that it's daylight around the house. We all find large tracks walking all around the house, because the dirt at the side of the house where this person had been was very soft, and they left tracks. Instead of finding human prints, we found large prints indented pretty deep into the soft ground. The only problem is, they were like three or four toed, and very alien looking. It literally looked like a giant reptile was walking around. Seeing that scared all of us, and I can tell, it even made the officer a bit unnerved, but he did a pretty good job of keeping his professional composure. That's pretty much my story. The only thing different that I would really add is that as time would go on throughout the rest of high school, the mom would talk about going outside at night to smoke cigarettes or to take out the trash and feeling very bad feelings at night, like she was being watched or that somebody was out to get her. She never felt quite right after that experience. I think they ended up moving out of that house, but I can't remember. It's been so long. 16, 17 years now. The major things that crept me out were two things of my story. The first, the officer kept acting like he knew something and just wouldn't talk about it, and he seemed so sketched out over something that he saw or dealt with. I mean, he shot two shots off. That's saying something. The second, is the tracks we found the following morning on a bright, clear, sunny day. There's no way a person in a suit made those tracks, so that can only really mean one thing. There's some sort of upright walking dinosaur that tried to break into the house, apparently. Whatever it was, or whoever it was, tried to attack the officer and failed. I would also like to conclude that it was probably more than a person, because why would a trained officer be so shaken up at what they had saw and shot at. That's just not very likely. And somebody who gets shot by a Glock doesn't just disappear. You go down, you get arrested, more police show up. The older I get, the more I'm convinced we dealt with something that certainly was not human. I've endured some pretty wild experiences while I lived with my father just outside of Waco, Texas, 
from the age of 15 to 20. Man, I got so many stories I could share with you. So, I'll start with one. This would have been in the summertime of 2013. My father was busy setting up his gun range of the far back side of the house. He had a bunch of old tires he was building a gun wall and setting up a really nice range. During this, he said he felt a strange feeling. A feeling of imminent danger, like he shouldn't be there. He thought the entire thing was strange and fought off his gut instinct as much as possible. After all, this was our property. We've had no problems with intruders ever before. And now this? So, ignoring it, and quelching any emotion, my father continued pulling old tires out of the back of the pickup, setting up the gun range, and he sees this figure, a blur, go right by him. He quickly turns, in reaction, and sees this large green figure on all fours, off in the trees, and as soon as he laid eyes on it, it looks over at him, and they make direct eye contact. He said that he felt that this thing was intelligent, just by looking at it. It wasn't just some giant oversized lizard. It was of incredible size anyway, though. And so he quickly put his hand on his Glock and got ready, just in case this thing decided to make a move and act aggressive. And as soon as my father put his hand on his Glock, and this thing watching him the entire time, grabs hold of the nearby tree and stands up on two legs. It grabbed hold of the tree like it needed the support to pull itself up which my dad always noted it was very strange to see that. From there, it appeared as if the stare-down between my father and this thing deepened in intensity. This thing slowly opened its mouth, revealing a loud but deep guttural hiss. And it was in that moment that my father felt imminent fear and danger. So he readied his pistol, taking aim, but not firing yet. But he felt that this thing was getting ready to attack. Just by the look in its eyes, he told me, Son, when you see this specific look in a wild animal's eyes, you just know they're getting ready to attack. And that's exactly what he claims he saw. So he pulls back the hammer, and this thing immediately begins charging at him on two legs, with its arms outstretched and kind of dangling. He fires three quick shots. Bam! 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 And whatever this thing was, immediately stops, drops down to all fours, turns to the side and bolts off, heading for the tree line, and quickly disappears into the brush. It was large, so as it was going through the trees and brush, it was making this terrible loud crashing sound, traversing off deeper into the backwoods. It about scared my pop half to death. I mean, even to this day, we have no idea what he saw, and he's told the story to me countless times. I wasn't there for that one. But, before I move on to the next encounter, let me give you a little bit better geography on that encounter. So, where he was setting up his gun range at, with the tires and target practices, there's a few trees, loosely spread out, and an actual tree line, maybe 60 or 70 yards away, completely visible from where he's at. When he first was alerted to movement, this thing, he said, was much closer to him, and somehow managed to run by him, eluding him, hiding in the trees. When he went to look, this thing was already behind a tree, getting ready to watch him or do something. He said that its entire demeanor was very suspicious. It was acting shady, like it was not only trying not to get caught, but that it was up to something, and mentioned that this thing did not like it, that my dad spotted it, because its entire expression changed once they made eye contact. Like it was telling my father, you're not supposed to see me. That was back when I was probably around 15 or 16. I wasn't there for that, but my father has told me that many times. The next encounter would be when I was about 18. I was just finishing my senior year of high school, and I was home with my dad one evening, digging holes in the back. After a little bit, my father went inside for something. I can't remember what so it was just me out there alone. The house is maybe roughly 100 feet in front of me, directly in front of me. I'm surrounded on my right, left, and behind of woods. So there I go again, digging, completely ignoring. And then 
I notice everything around me goes completely silent. But looking back, it was the eeriness of the whole thing that I picked up on. And then I just continued on digging, because I thought it was strange, but just thought, whatever. So I kept digging, ignoring the strange now silence. That's when I kept hearing rustling all around me. It sounded like some big animal was moving just beyond eyesight off in the trees. I would occasionally glance over to see if there was anything, thinking it might be a bear or maybe a cow, since there are ranches around here, and sometimes cows tend to get lost sometimes. But it didn't sound like that. It sounded more like a really big person, trying to be quiet, sneaking through the trees. My dad owns a lot of acres and trees back here, so I can't think of any reason why there would be anybody back here. The terrain isn't exactly the nicest, and there's nothing out here to get, steal, or have any interest in, period. Plus, it's all backcountry, so there's really nothing of interest out here. As I'm sitting there digging, and I'm thinking all of these things, it's all running through my mind, and I'm trying to process what's going on, and my father still has not returned. I begin to feel like something was watching me, very closely, not just watching me, but intently watching me, like they were making a maniacal plan to do something to me. I got really creeped out, stopped what I was doing, and just thought, you know what, it's not worth it. I'll just walk back to the house, tell my father, and I'm sure it'll be fine. And that's exactly what I did. So, as I get back to about maybe 20 feet away from the house, I hear what sounds like a mix between a low guttural growl, kind of like a lion would make, and a very deep hiss. If I could describe it to you in terms of animal noises, I guess combine a lion with a Komodo dragon maybe, and you have that same kind of growl hiss quality. That's kind of what it sounded like. But here's the issue. Since the trees run far behind me, all the way to the side of the house in front of me, I never heard it once walk parallel with me from where I was at digging that hole all the way to about roughly 20 feet away from my back door. And what that means is by the time I heard that noise, it had walked parallel with me to keep up with me because that noise was just off to my left, maybe no more than 50 feet because the tree line isn't straight. It kind of curves and weaves in and out. And at this spot, it was really maybe 50 feet away from me at most. So whatever was there was right in the trees, and tucked away just enough that I could not see it. But it was certainly keeping tabs on me. I was done for the day at that point. My walking quickly turned into a sprint. I ripped open the back door, told my father what had happened. Luckily, he took my concern very seriously and just told me to keep a weapon. Now, during this time, I did not think at all that, that this was the same unknown animal he encountered a couple years back. This was just its own isolated, terrifying incident. As the year would progress on, we never saw it, but we definitely felt the strange feelings of being watched, like there's just something off in the tree line that we can't quite discern or the weird sounds, this weird, strange, raspy breathing that we can't quite place. My dad likes to think it was a hog, but it sounded different than a hog. And then, finally, in the following year, now I'm about 19, and we go fishing, and it's about September or October. It was still warm out, and hadn't yet reached the cool point in fall, so probably early October would be my best guess. There's a small creek, about five or so miles away from our house. My dad and I love to go fishing, recreationally. We're not professional at it, but it's something we love to do to go for an off-time outing event. So we get to this creek, the same creek we've been going to for years. And right as we get to our spot, the same spot we've been going to for years and have had no prior issues, we smell this terrible odor. I can't even begin to describe it. It was kind of a rotten smell, but it had a unique smell profile to it. I wish I could describe it to you. It just smelled like dirty, rotten death. But there was an underlying stink that I just can't put my finger on. It was really thick in the air. No, it wasn't a musty odor, 
or anything that people think or smell with Bigfoot. I've had an encounter with Bigfoot myself, but I'll get to that in probably a separate email. This smelt entirely different. Imagine maybe leaving a goat carcass out in the hot sun for a few days, and then adding hot garbage around that, and then adding an extra layer of earthy dirtiness to it. That's kind of what it reminded me of. Stinky Bog Death My father and I make a comment about how strange the odor is, but quickly get to fishing, and just try to ignore it the best we can. After maybe 20 minutes, the smell seems to be intensifying and not dying down. My dad mentions there might be a carcass somewhere close by, which could be the cause of the smell. So we decide that maybe we should go looking for it, or change spots entirely, just to see which direction we should go. Right when that happened, both my father and I's attention is turned across the creek to this large opening or a clearing in the brush where this, what I can only describe to you as a reptile man, steps out and walks directly towards us on two legs, two feet, mind you, the same as a human being. It looked very gaunt, very frail, but also lean and muscular at the same time. The expression on its face was that of anger, and it was walking directly at us. But one thing I'll never forget, besides how scary it was, was the just the sheer intensity in its eyes. Like it wanted to hurt us. It was going to, had it gotten the chance to. My dad, quickly reacting, pulled out his Glock, fired a few shots at this thing, and it screamed and let out this terrible noise that I've never heard from an animal ever in my life. We threw down our fishing equipment and just ran towards the vehicle, something my father has always been very adamant about never doing. Never run from an unknown predator. But this, well, this was something else entirely different. We don't even know what this was. We didn't look back either to see if this thing continued its pursuit. We made it back, about a quarter of a mile back to the truck, and we got out of there pretty quickly. We did come back to the creek the next day for our fishing equipment, which was still there. Again, because this was kind of backcountry, not that many people go to this creek, unless you're local. And at that point, we all pretty much knew each other anyway, so didn't have to worry about anybody stealing our stuff, which is nice. But this funky creature, it was weird looking, man. It kind of had a very elongated head. Think of maybe like an iguana or some large lizard. And its body was very skinny, but still very lean. It was a strange dark and pale green that kind of interchanged. I could see some faint muscles on its stomach, chest, and legs. But that was about it. And it seemed to have a tail. But it all happened so fast, we watched it for maybe a few seconds as it walked towards us, and didn't waste any time. And after we shot at it, we heard it scream, but never looked to see if it was chasing us, which I'm sure it did. And maybe we encountered its territory, or got close to its den. I don't know. One thing I know is that we've never smelled that stink before. And since all these happenings, we had since gone to that creek to fish or just to hang out. And as a matter of fact, the last time we had visited this fishing spot was probably back in June or May. So, really, I don't know what you want to title this. I guess you can call it the Backwoods Texas Lizard Man, but whatever it is, I'm glad I haven't seen it since. After I hit about 20 years old, I moved away to a friend's, and we've been roommating for a while, before I finally found a good career to go on to. That involves being in a little more civilized area, with more buildings, not so much backwoods. Do I miss the backwoods? Yeah. Do I miss seeing that thing? Not so much. I'm not exactly sure what I encountered, but the sighting of these things that weren't clearly human still haunts me. This is back in 2010, and I was in Colorado, bird watching. In fact, it was a beautiful Saturday morning, and I lived out on beautiful property with a large field off to my right. I was going to the bird feeder at the edge of my property, and out of the corner of my eye, I see three dark-colored creatures 
literally flying across the field towards my house. Completely panicked and terrified, I ran in the house and waited. My husband wasn't home, so I really had no weapons to defend myself. When my husband got home later, I didn't bother telling him what I saw, because he probably wouldn't believe me. Then, a couple of days later, the following evening, I was birdwatching again, and as I went again to go to the bird feeder, I see these same strange three creatures flying towards the house again. Panicked, I run back in the house a second time, and I pull up my notebook and jot down exactly what I saw, what their descriptions looked like, because I didn't want to forget it. We didn't have a computer in the house at the time. Trust me, I know. Being 2010, you think everybody would be. There'd be other nights where, again, my husband wasn't home or was in bed, since he had to get up very early for work. I'd be sitting out on my porch alone at night, and I'd see strange dark figures emerge from the woodline and work their way slowly towards the house, almost creeping. I was completely terrified, unsure if I should go wake my husband or just stay on my ground. It seems like every time I'd always look back, they would disappear completely into the underbrush, and I never got answers. One incident specifically really terrified me. I saw a few of these figures slowly approaching the house when they vanished. Shortly after, I see this large dark shape in the sky come right over around our property and start emitting these strange red flashing lights. It was like a plane, but much larger and much lower to the ground. It was almost kind of a diamond shape. I kind of went in and out of consciousness. My memory's very blurry. And I'm not exactly sure what happened next, because I ran inside. It's a very strange experience. The next day, I became so violently sick, my husband had to take off work and take me to the hospital. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. But I nearly died, twice. And I was confined to a hospital bed for four to five days. I believe that that shape in the sky had something to do with it, although I'm not sure. The only other strange account I could possibly recall that I know of in my community is that a young woman, not too long ago, well, before I had my experience, was walking her dog on a sloping hill one evening when she felt something strange in the air, is how she described it, and she sees this large emaciated dog approaching her. Instead of turning around, the woman said that she just continued walking, picking up her pace because she felt terrified. She said that in response to her picking up her pace, this thing also picked up its pace and began running after her. Now completely terrified, she went as fast as she could, back to the trail where she was on and back to her car, where this thing eventually dove off into the woods. But the entire time, this thing still continued to follow her, making all sorts of horrible growls and noises in the woods, like it did not want her there. She described the creature as looking like a starved dog, hunched over on two legs, incredibly ugly, and very frightening looking. We didn't spend too much longer living on that ranch, because me seeing these three beings would be a reoccurring thing over and over. Finally, maybe no more than a year later, we moved to a different state entirely. Normally, I'm not really a believer in ghosts, paranormal, UFOs, or aliens. But that experience, now 11 years ago, really completely changed my entire perspective on what I even perceive as normal and our reality. Lastly, let me go ahead and share some details with you that I had written down in my notebook about these three beings that I would see over and over again. They were tall. They were very dark. They almost had a very slender and human build, very bulky up by the shoulders, and almost a reptilian-like head. Large bulky arms, too long for their body, with hands that were completely oversized, and long white claws. Their faces were very serpentine, but deep set in eyes, and teeth that were very reminiscent of a fish. Tiny, but millions of sharp little teeth. Could these creatures have been aliens? I'm still not exactly sure what this was to this day, so I'm hoping, since you're kind of the monster master here, 
you can kind of help me pinpoint exactly what it is. I'm just hoping you'll respond back to me and in an exchange of emails can give me some much needed answers because what I saw just doesn't make sense. All right, let's cut to the story. I won't bore you with long, unimportant backstory details. So to cut to the chase, me and a good buddy of mine were exploring and hiking up in northern Colorado, not too far outside of Boulder, in the general vicinity of the Rocky Mountain National Park. I think closer to Red Feather Lakes, if we're trying to get an exact location. And at one point or another, during our several day long hike, we had found the mouth to a very small cave. It kind of led at a 45 degree angle down into the ground. So the opening was big enough and we weren't properly equipped, but we thought, what the heck, might as well explore what we can and deviate from our already out of schedule hike because we were supposed to be back a day or so before, but we were having such a good time that, whatever, our family could suck it up. The opening led to a rather small chamber, maybe 20 feet across and 10 feet tall, tall enough that we could both stand up in. We thought it was pretty cool, and since we didn't have a map of any of the caves around here, him and I are both aware that there are many uncharted little caves all throughout this mountain range even if these caves are so small that they're not even considered caves. And I know you gotta be careful, because some of these could be considered dens. We kinda shined our lights around, looked around casually, didn't see much, didn't notice much. We were just thrilled to be in here, until we shined our lights a little further, and saw that it dips down about another 45 degrees, down deeper into the earth. Debating on whether we should go further, because we only had flashlights that weren't that great, and we didn't want to stray too much away from the light outside, bleeding into the first chamber. We decided, what the heck, let's go a little further. We felt a little adventurous, so we press on and go down to this next little tunnel, and now it's almost completely pitch black. But this next portion, this next chamber, opened up much larger, to a chamber that we couldn't even see all the way across, due to the angle at which we were at, it sloped down even further in this large opening, kind of like a mini cliff, and our light would not shine all the way down to the bottom, so there's no telling. My buddy picks up a rock and throws it down there, and you could hear it kind of poom, 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 all the way down to the very bottom. It sounded like at least a several hundred foot drop. I guess not uncommon to find tunnels and caves like these. We stood there for about another moment or more, figuring that we certainly did not have the equipment to scale this. We just decided to cut our losses and headed back to the first chamber. As we're exiting out of the first chamber, back out into daylight, we hear this sound coming from within the cave. It sounded like a dragon. I mean, I know that sounds pretty crazy of a description, but I can't think of another description to use. It would be the stereotypical sound you would hear from some sort of large prehistoric reptile used in a Hollywood movie, I guess. At least, that's what came to my mind. And my friend's mind, too. We heard this loud squawk, roar type sound. My friend and I both turned to each other and gave each other a look, like we're in complete disbelief. And a look like, did you hear that? Or was that just me? Are we crazy? We both look back, but don't see anything and we hear the sound of something approaching. Something big, coming into the first chamber. I mean, it couldn't be too big. The opening to the second chamber to the first was maybe 10 feet tall by maybe six or seven feet wide, but we could hear something big moving. And when you look into the mouth of the cave, it only allows you so much light, so you can't see all the way to the entrance to the second chamber. We decided it was probably best not to stick around and find out. So we got out of there quickly and walked about maybe five, 600 yards into the thickness of the forest where we could hear the sounds, those same exact dragon squawking sounds, I guess you'll call them, outside, probably back the way we came, back by the entrance or the mouth of this cave. It's definitely had a lasting impression on my friend and I anytime we're in the woods. I'm not saying at all that dragons exist or anything like that, but it did sound like some sort of pissed off large reptile I don't know. I'm just glad that we didn't stick around to see what it was. I can only imagine.
Call me crazy, but I could have sworn, a month ago, me and my girlfriend, while walking on a dike, saw this strange reptile-like creature, hunched over, crawling out of the storm drain, right near our house. My girlfriend and I like to take hikes on the dike often, since it runs several miles all up and down the river, and to our left is a large storm drain opening. The only people that ever go down there is other teenagers, people who do drugs and maybe graffiti. There's really no point in going in there. It's just that, a large empty storm drain tunnel that leads out to the small river. As we were walking by, somewhere I think around April 4th or 5th, we're just walking and having conversation. She looks over and it's like, hey, look, check that out, Brayden. I turn and see this thing that's all white, but kind of like a pale green, crawling on all fours out of the storm drain like it's struggling to move. Then it just kind of plops down and quickly scurries off into the brush. My girlfriend and I were both like, what did we just see? I'll try and describe it to you as best as I can, because it was daylight. Even though a little bit of overcast, we still got a pretty good look at it, and even saw its face. Its skin, though, was hands down the weirdest looking. It kind of reminded me of a large blanket draped over its skin that hugged tightly, like its skin was all interconnected. There wasn't a distinct arm and leg. It was all, like, webbed together, if that makes any sense. And it had these dull, kind of white spines protruding out of its back. I don't even know if they were poking out of its skin, but they were bony and lumpy. The head was just like a person's, but it had these little nubby bumps all over its skull. It was more green on the head, and it had scales from what it appeared. The face was flat, the eyes being very big, sunken in, and what appeared to be yellow. I couldn't see a mouth, but I can tell you it did not have a snout, so I didn't see any lips, or a nose really. Not at the distance we were. It even had a tail too, that was very similar to like an alligator's tail, except not as spiny. The whole experience, I mean, whatever we were looking at, was freaky looking. It kind of reminded me of something you'd see off Star Trek, like some reptilian alien race or something. I don't know. My girlfriend isn't really into sci-fi movies like I am, so to her, it just freaked her right out. She always refers to it now as a failed science experiment, or some sort of creature that broke loose from a lab and escaped in the storm drain. Oh, and the size of this thing. It was easily the size of an adult, which is one of the reasons why we were so freaked out. And it moved so awkwardly, like it wasn't comfortable moving in the position and the body that it was placed in. It was not fluid and smooth at all, like it had stiff joints or something. I don't know. Even just thinking back to it creeps me out. What surprises me too is we were maybe only 40 feet away from it, and we had a clear view of it. Had it looked up, it would have looked up directly at us, even though we got a pretty good look at its face, its body, everything, and it just quickly wanted to scurry off and hide as if it knew it was vulnerable and exposed. Me and my girlfriend have since walked that dike and have not seen it again since. And now, sometimes, we'll kind of dare each other to go down to the storm drain to see if there are more of them or that thing is back there. Anyway, talk about a strange experience. I honestly... Hi, I've watched a few of your episodes and it was interesting and I thought I would send you my story. If you do decide to put this on your channel, you may do so by condensing the story in your own words. For the sake of authenticity, I had to type it out lengthy. Here it is. My story. Alien paranormal in my room. I live in a crowded place in a city, not a remote rural area. In India, the paranormal or cryptids or UFO encounters are extremely rare, not like in the United States, as it's populated and people have been living here for many, many years, much longer in comparison to places like the US. Sorry, my English is not very good, like native English speakers and writers. Please bear with me. This happened back in December of 2017. I hadn't worked a job since 2014. 
and finally got a job as a technical support engineer in an IT company. In my city, around October 2017, that I got this job, it was only roughly 30 to 45 minutes away from my house, so pretty close by. It was a graveyard shift job. I had to sleep in the morning from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was a very professional experience at the workplace. I was providing technical troubleshooting support for an electronic online streaming product. You might have heard of it, but I won't disclose it. I was handling troubleshooting for TV channels. The first four TV channels, mainly. Ones that are very popular, that you probably all watch. So my room layout is simple. In the mornings when I used to sleep, I would have considerable amount of daylight in my room. During the month of December 2017, there was an increase of work pressure at the office. I was scrolling through the American TV channel listings during break at work and saw this TV channel called Shudder About Horror. I don't think too much of it, nor do I relate looking at it at the office to my incident. Once I did receive a call, and I'm not able to remember very clearly, but I do remember a call with a very oddly toned voice seeming to be speaking an unknown language with me. It kept going for some time, and I followed the instructions, we procedure, and disconnect the call. This happened during the end of December 2017. I used to be tired after work, but during the end of December 2017, around the Christmas week, I would return home and sleep, but would never feel like I really slept. I would feel as though I just came home, slept, and an hour or so had only passed. The first. One day I woke up and saw the walls pinkish metallic in lights, still laying in bed, partially asleep. I was saying in my sleep, I need to tell my mom she has really made the room look great with these lights while I was asleep. But when I woke, I thought it was a dream, as my room was just the way it was usually. Number two. The second time, I felt like sleep paralysis, but something lifted my right hand and bumping its fist with mine, pushing my fist back with its overpowering strength to push back my fist pointed towards it. When I tried to wake up, it was like I had a dream effect where I won't feel pain or fear and was just really drowsy and sleepy. Once my mother had brought me some coffee during my sleep, and I had grabbed her hand and pulled her all the way while I wasn't in control of my actions, I had snapped out of it and then gone to sleep again. I seemed to have some scratch marks, not severe in my hands. I would take it lightly. So, here's the actual story or encounter. One day, I was sleeping in the morning. I felt there was something or someone in my room. I thought it was my mother or father, or even both. Since my mother would come into my room occasionally to tidy up the room or give me something to eat. This time, though, I felt the person in the room was more than just one. I assumed it to be my dad and mother. All the while in my sleep, I assumed this. I was having this sort of sleep paralysis sensation. But in it, I was praying, Lord Jesus, help me wake out of this, and it released. So, I turned myself on the bed and slept on my belly downward. A minute later, I felt a hand under my belly, and it flipped me on my back, belly up. I weigh 110 plus kilograms, and this time, I was off in my sleep. I wanted to wake up, yell at my mom or dad for flipping me over to change the bed sheets. My mom or dad would occasionally change the sheets in this manner when I was younger. During those seconds, before opening my eyes, I was thinking, why and how are they doing things? being able to flip me belly up with one hand. Unexpectedly, I opened my eyes when I was flipped belly up and saw this humanoid towards my leg walk backwards 
and vanish to the left, into the wall. Another doing the same, both now realizing that I was awake. I clearly saw its face, body structure. It was dark, and there was some kind of metallic glittering on it, like light being reflected from it. But this light was emanating from its body. It was thin, and having long arms. It looked like the leader of those things, a crown-like pointed head. I sat and saw it walk backward into the wall and then vanish. The other side of the wall is the interior hall of the first floor of my house, so there was no way it walked into that room. When it walked into the wall in reverse, it posed as though it's aligning itself into some portal similar to how we would position ourselves while entering into a crowded elevator and tuck our body, face, and hands inside before the elevator doors would close. I would have witnessed it for as long as 7 to 10 seconds clearly. I didn't see any portals though. I'm a graphic designer as well, and I have attached a recreation of how they appeared in my room. Now to think of it, they looked very similar to a species of gaming characters that appear in a video game called StarCraft II, but a bit more slender. One thing I can say, we call them aliens, or UFOs, or in the paranormal realm. Nowadays, instead of demons or devils, because if the devil exists, the world doesn't like to acknowledge that God also exists. With this, I came to the end of my experience. Surely in my family, we have witnessed quite a few paranormal incidents, but in all my experiences, nothing as close as something as touching and flipping me over as though to examine me. Hi, my name is Derek, and I've been listening to a few of your alien UFO encounter episodes. I've heard a few stories now about how people are engulfed in this mysterious white light and then transported several hours into the future, remaining in the same spot along the highway or on the side of the road, depending on the story, but traveling several days in the future, or maybe a few hours. There's also countless stories and encounter stories about this on Reddit and the internet. Well, I'm here to share you my own personal experience, but I have a different experience. See, I too in my car, driving down a small two-way highway, was also engulfed in a white light that I can't quite explain, which led me to your channel, looking for answers. And I was surprised to hear how people had very similar events happen, but different outcomes. What I mean by this is I too was engulfed just like them, by a bright, overwhelming, angelic light. But, instead of time passing, like these people had, for me, the time remained the same, except instead of that, I was transported over 400 miles away in an instant on a completely different stretch of road and highway while a second had not even passed. This was just back in 2018 and it was around 7.30 p.m. I was driving home from a friend's house and I had about 15 minutes till I got to home. I saw a dark object coming towards my direction in the night sky but not thinking much of it, because I'm pretty sure there's a military base in the area, and there is a low hovering aircraft. Well, things around me started to get gray, and then from gray, it turned to a bright, overwhelming light that ate up everything around me. The only way I can accurately describe it is an all-consuming white light, almost kind of like a heat flash, if you will. And it happened all within about two to three seconds, going from our normal light setting to being completely taken over and consumed in white light. Once it happened, it immediately dissipated, and I was driving in a completely different area on a completely different road, over 400 miles away from my actual house. As soon as the light dissipated, I realized I had no idea where I was. Immediately pulled over, pulled up Google Maps, and I remember panicking, thinking this couldn't be right. I was well over halfway across the state. It would take me hours to get back home, roughly five. So, I slept in my car that night, panicking 
trying to figure out what to do. The next morning, I spent the five hours explaining to my boss the reason why I was late. And obviously, he's not going to believe that UFOs took me, which I didn't even realize at the time. But I didn't really know a way to explain it. So I just explained to him that a family emergency happened on the other side of the state. And very fortunately for me, he gave me grace. I ended up getting back to my house about 1pm the following day, because, like I said, nervous breakdown, sleeping in my car all night, and trying to navigate my way back. Without Google Maps, I wouldn't have really known where I was, or the area. Keep in mind too, this side of the state I have never been to, especially this area. So, when I got back home and went to work, that night I was freaked out driving back home, hoping the same thing would not happen again. I seemed to be okay. Nothing different about my car, my clothes, nothing. I have no way to accurately explain what happened, who, why, or what, which is why I was desperate for answers. So I started looking things up and eventually found your channel. I know this occurred back in 2018, so I've been waiting to write this up for a while, and I didn't exactly find your channel right away. I've spent some time doing some research, and have been ever since, so I should more say that I was led to your channel eventually, not right after. But your other encounters and stories have answered many questions for me. The only other question I can think of is why wasn't I taken forward in time? What was the purpose of instantaneously transporting me 400 plus miles away? I wasn't microchipped. Nothing was implanted that I've seen. Nothing wrong with my car. I can't quite explain what happened. I also don't have any memory lapses. So there's really nothing to explain other than I firmly believe I was abducted and taken without reason. My name is Joanne and my husband Nathan and I moved out to the country so we can try and have a little peace and quiet after everything, with his sister recently dying and everything. But now, things are getting stranger by the day. Not only are we having strange lights in the sky, but I also believe that an old Navajo witch is trying to hex us and our family. I'm not going to lie, we've already been through a lot. After Nathan's sister passed away from cancer, we both just wanted to get out of the city and try something new. A mental breath of fresh air. We chose this place because it was pretty close to civilization, but far enough away so you can see the stars much more clearly. I don't know if you've ever been out here, but let me tell you, there is always something happening in these parts late at night. First off, Nathan now stays up all night with his telescope, looking at space and trying to take photos on his phone. He thinks he's the only one he could see them. It never really bothered me until one day when I accidentally went into his photo album after borrowing his phone for a quick second. I literally had to ask him what he was looking at with his telescope. I swear to God, if it wasn't a planet or a star, talk about weird alien stuff happening in the sky. The first time I remember seeing something strange was when we were walking our dog after night. It was dark out and we could see these red eyes staring back at us from across the field. Now, the odd thing about these eyes, they didn't have any white part around the eye, like you'd expect to see. They were like glowing embers, just staring at me from inside some sort of goat skull face, or whatever those crazy hillbillies wear these days. But yeah, so after that happened, we walked a little further out in the field and Nathan starts yelling about how he sees UFOs in the sky, like all the time. I look up and can see something. Something swirling around inside this bright white light up in the sky. But it's moving so fast, I could not make out what it was. On another occasion, after seeing that thing from before, we were laying out on our backs, staring up at the stars, and these bright red lights started to fly over us. They were flying so fast that they were just blurs, they stopped for a second, right above us, and then just dissipated. This all happened in a matter of a few seconds. I think that whatever these UFOs are, or weird things in the sky, are brought on by the figures that walk around out here in the forest. 
what my husband believes are skinwalkers. I don't know if there's a connection to UFOs and skinwalkers, but my husband seems to think so. After that, we begin to hear some odd things in the middle of the night, and they always seem to be after we went inside for bed. The first thing was thumping on a roof, scaring us half to death. We didn't know what it could have been at the time. One morning, Nathan goes outside and finds footprints all around our house. So he starts asking me if I'd been up before him when I got up for work early one day. I thought he was crazy when he said this, but when I actually went out there myself with him, sure enough, there were these weird wolf prints all around my car and porch. That's not even the most disturbing part, though. After that, there were all kinds of things being left around my car. For instance, one day, I come out, and my side mirrors are missing, and my windshield wipers are gone. I was so confused. I mean, it wasn't windy at all. So, who would come by and steal those things off my car? Or did they blow off from the wind? I don't know. None of it really makes sense. I eventually found out why somebody would do that, but it's pretty creepy, though that they would come and try and steal something like that off my vehicle. Another time, Nathan comes home and all the oil is now leaking out of his truck. It didn't seem like a big deal at first until we realized how much oil had actually leaked out. The engine had almost burned up. Nathan got pretty mad about this, but everything was fine after several weeks when we had got it fixed. We assumed that was the end of it. Now, about two weeks later, Nathan was driving home from work again and the truck began making really bad noises, just dying out on him. We were so scared to find out why this was happening. It's even worse than what we'd expected. When Nathan had finally got his truck back, he told me he found all sorts of animal hair stuck inside the engine. Everything along with some other very suspicious things. I'll never forget how freaked out he looked when he told me this. The hairs he showed me that were covered in gunk, but they were long and stringy, like an animal's, or like a big wolf or something. But before I go, I have another story for you. It's actually about my brother. It was last year sometime when his now fiance lived in a townhouse with her sister, right outside of Rexburg, Idaho. One day, after waking up, she noticed something strange about the front yard. It's as if every single blade of grass was pushed over to one side, creating a trail that led off into the woods by their house. All three girls were scared, so they locked themselves in the townhouse for several hours until Nathan could come up from Salt Lake City, which he was already scheduled to come up and visit. When he arrived, nothing happened at all that night or during the weekend, but when they went home to Rexburg the following week, everything started up again. And then at nighttime, their door would randomly bust open, and the lock and the deadbolt would somehow be mysteriously undone. They quickly grabbed the things they needed and locked themselves in a hotel room for several days before they felt safe enough going back. It obviously wasn't a burglar. Everything was untouched. Nothing moved at all out of place. And the first night back, they'd try to stay up all night, watching TV. It's common for your eyes to trick you when you're tired, they did not want this intruder to sneak up on them while they were asleep. It was just after three in the morning, and something woke up one of the girls very suddenly. When she looked over at the door, she saw what Nathan had initially described as the most terrifying thing he'd ever seen, come walking through the house. It was not human. They were skinny white little beings that appeared to have rotting flesh falling off their body. They all terrified screamed and ran out of the house. Now, get this. They discovered that there was an ancient Indian burial ground just only a couple miles away from where they lived. I can't say for sure if that's at all connected, but considering how many weird things have happened to them since, I wouldn't be surprised at all. And then you take into consideration what happened to us. It really makes you wonder... I had been spending the summer in Coronado National Forest, which is located in the Huachuca Mountains. It's a beautiful area, and I loved going into the mountains to look at the stars at night and just take in the beautiful scenery around me that was the forest and nature. On this particular night, 
I was really tired after a long day of work. The skies were clear, weather was great, and there was a new moon out. It should have been pitch black outside except for the light from my campfire burning down. I went to bed inside my tent right around 9.30 p.m. I always sleep with my knife within my arm's reach in case you never know what might happen out there in the wilderness. Where I've lived before, in San Diego County, I've had some crazy things go down, so it always makes me feel safer. Call it an illusion or something, but I find it works. A few hours later, something woke me up. Something cold and hard pressed up against my face. I could feel a weight holding down on top of me. It was pressing so hard that it woke me from a sound sleep. I felt slightly panicked as I didn't know what it was. I opened my eyes to see the silhouette of a large man standing over me, his hands on both my shoulders pinning me down under him, with a large knife pressed against my face. Not the blade portion, though, the flat portion. And there was only darkness around him where his head and face should have been. Instinctually, I was to reach for my knife, which thankfully was right next to my waist. Holding the handle tightly in both hands with the blade pointed upwards at the mysterious figure now being above me. I tried pushing myself up off the ground to throw him off balance, but he was much stronger than I, and I could not budge under his weight. I used all my might, swinging the knife upwards, and was rewarded with a sharp pain in my hand. I felt wetness dripping down the handle of the knife onto my hands. When I looked up again, there was nobody above me. He seemed to have disappeared into thin air, like he never existed. What happened next is what scares me the most about this whole experience, and I'm still haunted by the memory. My campfire had burned down into embers at some point during the night, while I slept, but miraculously burst into flames once again, moments after whatever or whoever had been on top of me, disappearing without a trace. It wasn't until much later that I looked down at my hand, then realizing that something sharp had grazed it without my knowing, leaving just a small trail of blood. I tried convincing myself I had not had a nightmare and hallucinated it. I was looking around, waiting for it or him to come back, because he kind of just dematerialized once I knifed him. But the entire rest of the time I slept, I could just feel a presence around me, like something or someone was watching me, waiting for the right moment to come back and do it again. I didn't waste any time. I packed up everything and began to leave, even though the fire that was just crackling embers was now a roaring flame, as if his spirit or whatever energy he was manifested as a roaring burning fire, a fire I should have put out. Generally, I have found that people who have had sightings of skinwalkers get very nervous about telling their stories, or get really angry and upset when asked. I understand. I get it. I've been through it myself. The ridicule. The embarrassment. It was actually a family member who had told me about Skinwalker Ranch. I didn't believe it at first, but today, I'm convinced that there is something very unnatural happening in the Indian Hills, Kansas. Let me give you some background knowledge on the area of the country. Fort Scott is smack dab between Joplin and Pittsburgh, Kansas. It's not exactly a bustling metropolis, with five-star hotels lined everywhere and top-shelf shopping malls lining every street corner. So, when people say they don't want to live here anymore, you take notice. People leave once their military deployment is over, and they complete their season for the seasonal work they do in St. Joe which, by the way, has one of the highest unemployment rates in the state. They go home oftentimes to St. Joe, where things are more modernized. When they visit, there is a noticeable difference between the two towns. When you talk to people who have left Indian Hills for one reason or another, most leave because they feel very unwelcome. I'll give you a bit of background info here on the area as well. See, back in the 1980s and 90s, Families were fleeing from what was believed to be the Satanic Panic Era. Satanic ritual abuse cases were happening at local churches, schools, businesses, you name it. 
The Yogi Bear Campground sat empty for years before being turned into another campground that remains active today by a church. In the 1990s, an 80-plus acre farm and house sold for only $4,000 due to it sitting abandoned after several reports of severe and violent paranormal activity. This is before it started getting reported back in the late 80s. People would tell you that they just felt wrong there, or there's something not right about the area, and nobody wanted to live there. In fact, going back to the public records of the house, there had been no single owner or family owners that had lived there for more than 12 months at a time, all stating the same thing. Severe, violent, poltergeist activity. So, what do I think is going on here? Well, back in 2010, an apartment complex was set ablaze by a young man who claimed he was possessed. He lived at the complex with his mother and sister. After setting the fire to their apartment, he walked out of the burning building with no injuries, and the very next day shot himself in front of his friends and classmates. Residents believe this happened because they were being attacked by ghosts, and he himself was possessed. Now, why would somebody feel that way? unless something truly evil has taken up residency here. Right after the man killed himself, several residents reported seeing shadows walking around their homes at night. These are actual quotes from people claiming to have seen these things. One woman actually stated that she had seen people standing in her own backyard staring into her house. She also claimed that she saw somebody walking through her kitchen one night, but when she turned on the lights, there was nobody there. Another man reported seeing shadows running all across his walls and ceiling every time he got up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. He has since moved out for the state of fear for his life and his family's safety because he believed that there are evil spirits that are trying to possess him or harm him or his family. So what happened? You might ask yourself, if something did indeed take place here, why haven't I heard about it till now? Well, I live here. This is my hometown, just like many of you reading this right now. I don't think it's a coincidence that the town has been hit hard with hard times, and some very strange and unlikely events happening in such a small geographical location. Is Indian Hills truly the gateway to hell? I cannot say for sure, but if something doesn't change soon, we may all find out. Now, that all covers the paranormal side of it, but what I wanted to talk about today was how there is the skinwalker side of it. Now, before you're quick to brush this post off and say, oh, skinwalkers don't exist, let me remind you that it's been reported that skinwalker presence will cause a massive upsurge in paranormal activity. And I believe that due to the ancient Indian burial grounds around the area and the other skinwalker sightings, that all the paranormal happenings, the demonic spirit activity, everything that would link back to the insane, satanic ritual abuse and everything is interconnected, is all due to, in part, the skinwalker activity. They are the gatekeepers. They are the ones causing everything. And they lie in wait in the shadows, controlling everything like puppet masters, using demonic spirits and entities to do their will, to harm people. This way, they don't ever have to step out from the shadows, revealing themselves. They can control destroy and drive out an entire community and town just from their sheer minions. Thanks for listening. I grew up roughly 30 miles northwest of Los Angeles, and one of my favorite pastimes is to go into the nearby mountains and explore. When we were younger, we would ride our dirt bikes, but as we got older, that turned into four-wheeling and hiking. I can remember this one time, we were coming back down the mountain, and we came up to a clearing, and just below us was a small town that I did not know existed. We decided to stop and take a better look, so we went down towards it. After getting off our bikes, we started walking around and looking in windows. All of a sudden, something caught our eye. There was what looked like somebody hanging from the roof of one of the buildings. Upon closer inspection, it turned out to be none other than some sort of dummy. We quickly figured out what was going on. The police had been used for filming horror movies due to its isolated location 
where you can do anything you want without anybody ever knowing or even caring. Apparently, it had been abandoned for some time, while we found out that the way things looked the way it had been was just a little creepy, in my opinion. We heard a noise behind us, like something had just fallen and that was big. We saw a light that seemed to be coming from behind one of the houses. At first, I thought it was somebody coming out of their house to see what was going on, but when we got a closer look, the person or light never showed. We got close enough where I could make out what it was and what it looked like. It looked very strange, and in a way, I can't exactly describe without sounding crazy. Out stepped this person wearing a black hoodie and a face with dead eyes and almost plastic-looking skin. I couldn't take my eyes off of him, and he began to slowly kind of move away from us, stopping right about 15 feet away. It felt as if time itself had stopped, and the only sound that could truly be heard over our heavy breathing was the faint sound of crickets off in the distance. It turned the light on again, but a light illuminated from his body, and very slowly in front of us, ascended about 20 feet in the air, as if he had levitated, and he began chanting all sorts of hideous, horrible, demonic things, before exploding into a ball of light. My friends and I, we ran as fast and as hard as we ever could have, not talking a word about what we had just seen. From what I know, and what I've studied, this was a skinwalker, but I don't know for sure, which is why I'm posting this. I'm hoping somebody can answer me. This sighting happened in northern Idaho, March of 2015. I was driving home from a late night of working at a gas station. It was cold, windy, and snowy. I turned up the heat in my car as high as it would go, let my four-wheel drive take me home, since there were several inches of snow on the roads. As I drove down this stretch of road that leads to my neighborhood, I came around a curve and saw something going towards the road ahead of me, very fast. At first, it looked like a naked old man sprinting. He was very slender and wearing all black. But as I approached closer in the car, his legs were so much longer and thinner than any human's legs should ever be. He also seemed to be more loping and hopping than anything else. I kind of slowed down as I passed him to get a look, and then sped up. And right as I passed him, he kind of veered off into the woods right next to me. This will always stay in my mind. When I passed him, he, or maybe I should say it, turned to look at me, and it was the head of a coyote, but the body of a man in what I can describe as black robes. He turned to look at me, turned away, and disappeared. I think I saw and dealt with a shapeshifter. I know they're true now. I know they exist. I live in the Mantee, Utah area with my wife and kids. One night when I was younger, in my early 20s, I was up late working on a vehicle in our driveway when my dad comes out to look at what I was doing. I was startled by his sudden appearance and instinctively drew my pistol, aiming it at him. He noticed the gun and told me to put it away and come inside. We sat in our living room for a while when we heard rustling outside. Somebody was walking around outside of the house. I didn't pay much attention to it since I thought one of our neighbors might be visiting them or something, not really thinking too much about it until we heard two low growls coming from the window behind. Now, uh, growing up on a farm in Nebraska, I've heard plenty of predators before, but none of them sounded like this. Whatever made that noise wasn't an animal that I'd heard before. It had a sort of creaky, grunty, growly sound. I asked my father what the sound was, and he said he didn't even hear it, even though I had been raised in an area that allowed me to be familiar with pretty much every animal sound. I had never heard anything that sounded like that before. The longer we sat there listening to these things outside, the more uncomfortable I became. I could feel that something wasn't right. But again, Dad told me it must have just been our neighbors and suggested that let's go outside and investigate just in case. 
surely whatever made the noises by now had been gone. Sitting at the round kitchen table, talking about the day's events for a bit, we began hearing other noises and growls coming from outside, the kinds where it sounds like something was in pain. We went out again to investigate, but didn't find anything this time either. It seemed whatever was making that noise had disappeared for good after that, but it made me wonder if there are other things in the world at large that I don't know about. Hello. I would like to start off by saying that this took place in either 2007 or 2008. I can't really remember which, but I do remember it was summer. I had just moved out here from California to help out my grandmother with her bills and stuff. She needed help around the house. She was getting older, and I would go to work with her during the day. Well, I woke up one night. I heard what sounded like kids outside, right outside my bedroom window. But it was late, so I thought maybe it was the wind or something. But then all of a sudden, it sounded like wood breaking and stuff crashing around. Instinctively, me being the hothead that I am sometimes, gets out of bed, thinking it's some idiot kids out there causing trouble. After throwing on some clothes, I went out to yell at them that lived down the street from where we lived. As soon as I opened the door to go outside, all of these things started growling, and at first, I could see that there were two large black shapes huddled over something on the ground before I saw their green eyes from underneath there. There were six of them in total. I was completely horrified. And I quickly walked back inside, locking the door. They disappeared after that, but every now and again at nighttime, I would hear them outside. I would hear these voices. I would hear these sounds, this growling noise, and the sounds of somebody talking, but in hushed tones and whispers like somebody frantically speaking. It stopped after a while, but to this day... When I sit here and think back on it, I still get chills thinking about what happened on that summer night. This is why now, I prefer to stay inside, especially during the nighttime. Who knows what would have happened to me if I never saw them, and had mistakenly stepped out of the porch into the yard where they were. In the fall of 2009, I had an encounter with a skinwalker or at least I think it was one. The reason I believe it is is because my family has lived in the same house since 1874, when it was built by my great-great-grandfather, Hector Montoya. We are members of the Jemez Pueblo tribe and live in northwest New Mexico, which is Pueblo country. We are surrounded by native reservations, which is where I assume this creature came from. Or maybe that's just my naivety talking. My family and I went to bed right around 10 p.m. on a Thursday night. All was calm. However, there were still strange things going on in the house. It had this electrical buzzing inside of it, along with flickering lights that none of us could quite figure out. The, all the electrical was fine. My parents claimed they would look after it after they had gotten some sleep, but nobody expected what happened next. Right at about 1.30 a.m., my younger sister starts screaming for help. Something was attacking her. She claims that she felt someone or something jump onto her bed and try to choke her out while tugging on the flesh of her face. She said that she was screaming so loud she felt like her life was in danger. When my father rushed into the room, he saw what looked like a shadow of a figure through the window. But before he could grab his gun, it jumped off, ran through the roof, and ran away at an incredible speed. Now everyone who knows anything about skinwalkers knows that they are fast creatures and can shapeshift into animals, or even worse, take on a spirit form. However, despite this knowledge, I still did not believe, until... A couple of weeks later, on a Friday night, we were all home alone watching movies when there was another attack by the creature. My brother came face to face with it, while walking outside to take care of our dogs, whom, may I add, seemed to be barking like crazy, even though it was in the middle of the night. He said he saw what looked like an animal running across our front yard, jumping on top of our neighbor's house, which is about 50 feet away from ours. 
when he went back inside to tell my father about it, they heard something hollering at them through the window. But this time, they caught a glimpse of what appeared to be a man wearing some type of animal skin with his face covered in red paint and blood. After what happened, we all kind of just sat there, not knowing what to do, till around 3 a.m. We decided to use some raw meat as bait. For almost three hours, nothing came. So we thought maybe it had just gone away. But then, around five in the morning, when my little brother woke up for school, we saw it in our living room. My dad said he just stood there, staring at it, until he was brave enough to pull out his gun and shoot it in the arm. We all heard a loud yelp and assumed it had run off. But after ten minutes of silence, there was now so much commotion outside that every dog within miles began barking like crazy. My sister looked out the window to see what was going on, told everybody to come look. She believed it may have transformed into something else before making its getaway. And when I say commotion, I mean police sirens, ambulances, fire trucks, you name it. Whatever was there must have been bad. Every kind of emergency vehicle you can think of was in the distance. The weird thing about this is that my dad works with the tribal police, and none of them would tell him what had happened. They did say that a lot of people got seriously injured, or worse. I found out a couple of days later from my sister's friend, who lived in that area, that she was walking her dog and saw a woman being dragged by some type of large coyote with red eyes. Skinwalkers are evil creatures. In fact, they will use their powers for dark things, such as hurting others mentally or physically to do their bidding. So, if one is aiming to do something terrible, make sure you don't get in its way, because I guarantee you, it won't think twice about taking your life. I was in my early 20s when this happened. It was a very, very hot day. Very little wind and no clouds in the sky. I decided to go for a run along the local bay. It was during this time of year that we had a bad influx of strange lights over the water at nighttime. My sister and I had been out on my boat earlier in the week and saw some of these lights ourselves, which were absolutely fantastic. I ran for about 30 minutes before reaching one of my favorite spots in the bay where you could see seals, lots of birds, and some potential ships coming in and out of the port. This day, they were more than normal as some big company was having a convention down by the docks. Lots of people making noise with their boats and laughing and drinking. Trying to find a good spot to sit and watch for a bit before running back, I saw what looked like a man or animal standing on top of one of the medium-sized ships. As I watched it slowly walk down the side of the ship, this is where my thought was, oh, it's going to jump in the water. I sat there for about 10 minutes, watching it swim in the water. Then it would descend under the water and change form into something more hideous. It would come back up and surface and change again to part man and part something. I don't even know. I watched this go on for about 25 minutes, realizing that I was seeing a shapeshifter. I believe that whatever this creature was had to have been a skinwalker of some kind. My name is Mary, and I am writing this in anonymously. In 1999, my husband at the time had been divorced from his first wife for about a year. They were having problems with their eldest daughter, who was 12 at the time. In order to rid her of her bad habits they thought she was having, they took her to a medicine man who lived on a California Indian reservation near San Diego. Every day, all summer long, there were dogs just going crazy outside the house. It got so bad that even my husband wanted to move closer to where he worked in Poway, California. It was too difficult to work from home due to all the strange activity and things that were going on. After we moved into our new place, he went back up north every week until school started again, helping his ex-wife until their daughter started school. I awoke one night and heard a static noise right outside my front door. I opened the door, and there was nothing. Nothing but the dogs that were barking like mad all around me. 
I decided to sit at the table in my living room, looking out the window that faced our carport. We had five large windows in our living room. Looking out into the dark, I saw three huge black figures walk by every other window on two legs, arms swaying back and forth. I cannot express to you how terrified I was. Although I did not recognize this as some supernatural entity, but three intruders who were going to break in, rob, and who knows what else. To this day, I'm sure who I saw, but refused to come forward with the story. My husband woke up when he heard me running outside, in the back, in the darkness all alone, when he could hear these things in the front yard. I guess he got his gun and shot at them, and they all ran on all fours and ran away. He knew what these were. He had grown up and dealt with skinwalkers before. But we never talked about it again, until some time later when his own ex-wife told him that their daughter had seen what looked like her father only she claimed it wasn't her dad. It had yellow eyes, but had knocked on her window, tried to get her to let him in. His voice was very similar but more distorted and staticky, and his cadence, the way he spoke, was also different. This girl was so scared of what she saw, she told her own mother, but wouldn't tell anybody else about it for a while. The medicine man would not even let them ask any questions, because he said if they did, the demons would follow his daughter home. He claims that these were also skinwalkers and they could take your DNA to turn into you and mimic you or something as equally as strange. After this incident, every time I heard dogs barking outside our house, my husband would start up north again to help out his ex-wife until their daughter got used to finally being back at school. One night, after he came home from working with them all day long, I was busy sleeping on the couch. I had fallen asleep after reading a book. He comes in and wakes me up, tells me that his daughter had seen one of these things again outside, trying to attack the dog. The description the daughter gave was about the same thing. Yellow piercing eyes, taking the form of her father, and after nearly killing the dog, ran off. Now it was starting to torment the house. None of the kids in the family could really sleep after that, and they would spend the rest of the night in their mom's bed, afraid to close their eyes. I want to see this family protected from any kind of ridicule on my part. I realize there's not much I can do myself, but I feel that in part of sharing this with you today, getting the information out there that these things are dangerous, and they can take shape of other people and animals to do whatever evil bidding they decide. I just hope there are those out there who will hear this and take it a little more seriously. Thank you. This was in the early morning hours of New Year's Day in 2017. I was driving along I-5 south towards Medford, Oregon from California with his girlfriend at the time. It was about 6 or 6.30 in the morning and we were still about an hour north of Grants Pass we saw something large moving ahead of him on the road. First, he thought it was a deer, since there's quite a bit of forest along this stretch of highway. But once they got closer, he realized what it actually turned out to be. The creature heading straight for the highway, but it crossed over to the woods again before reaching them, disappearing from view completely. He wasn't sure what he had seen and his girlfriend didn't see it at all. She had just glanced up, asked if everything was all right continued to sleep in the passenger seat since she was tired from parting of the night before. He is just now willing to submit his sighting as there was quite a bit of disbelief, even pressure from him around those who were not aware of his experience. He's still not sure what it is, but is open to suggestions and theories on what he saw. I had to write this. I still can't believe what happened. It all began back last year when my family and I were traveling around the country, trying to find a new place to live after we lost the house in New Orleans due to Katrina. We found this cute little town that reminded me of home, so we took it. Right off the bat, you can tell there was something different about this place, but nothing too weird. The people seemed nice enough, 
that there was a lot of them actually who had been there for generations, stretching all the way back to civil war. They had some old traditions and odd ones too, like burying their dead below their homes, rather than in a graveyard where they lived. But hey, why not try something new, right? The town was called Meadow, and it was located just south of Little Rock. We found a plot of land for sale with an old abandoned house on it. We decided to buy it up, fix it up as best we could. We did not have much money, but we knew we wanted to settle down somewhere and this seemed like our best chance. Fixing the place up wasn't too hard. There were only a few things wrong with the house after all. First, it smelled like rot, mostly like from flood damage or something rotting in the walls. Second, there were weird scratch marks all over the kitchen floor and countertops. The house happened to be above ground. And lastly, and scariest of all, there were what looked like claw marks on every door, including the doors that led outside. The claw marks freaked me out a bit, but I shrugged it off in time and, and convinced myself that they were just from some stray animal trying to get into the house or something like that. The scratching on the floor was alright too, although we did end up throwing away all the rugs, which seemed to help with keeping down any new scratching sounds. We never heard them at night, luckily. We found this old decrepit-looking chair, covered in dust and cobwebs, sitting near one of her couches, decided to put it in our bedroom for no particular reason, other than we didn't want to take up space anywhere else. We ended up finding a few pieces of clothing tucked between the couch, but we didn't think much of it. Then things really started to happen. My first time hearing the scratching wasn't too bad. I was sitting in bed, deciding to take a shower. While I was showering in the bathroom, the doorknob began to shake as if somebody or something was trying to get in. Once I came back into the room though, whoever or whatever was there disappeared. And it wasn't until about a week later that I would hear anything else as far as strange sounds go. We were all awakened at 2.30 in the morning by what sounded like heavy footsteps. Stairs in our room were shaking. It was just one set of footsteps though. I couldn't believe it. My husband and son were in different rooms and we all heard it. Then we heard a door slam so we had gone downstairs to check it out. There was nobody there but our stuff had been knocked over for some reason. So we tried to straighten everything up and fell asleep again. This would be the only time anything like this would happen all year long, even during the winter, when things usually got a lot worse. Then August came around, and time of school started back up for kids, my boy at least. Things started back up again. The scratching sounds became constant, sometimes waking us up. I was too tired from work though to get up. The footsteps had continued through the night, but none of us ever left our rooms to investigate them for some reason. Then, one night, things got pretty bad. If you can imagine that even being possible. Predictably, the scratching started again. But this time, there were now different voices coming out over top of it. Almost as if there was a chanting or a singing. I don't know how else to explain it. I'm not one for believing in this kind of stuff, after all, mind you. So we all ran downstairs, turned on every light we could, sat together, waiting for whatever it was to come back down. Well, luckily, it never did. But the scratching got louder, and then just stopped completely. We all felt eerily calm after that, so we sat in silence for a while, before deciding to go back to bed. My son was the first one up in the morning, waking us all up at around six. He had found a dead animal on his bedroom floor. It looked like somebody had broken in and placed this dead coyote on the ground. Its throat was visibly torn out. He called for me when I came in the room, and I saw it. This was one of the many times strange stuff happened, but it never happened again afterwards, at least an animal body being left in the room. Jump ahead to February of this year, 2017. I had just gotten home from work, and my son came bursting through the front door, telling me he saw something outside in our backyard briefly before running off into our forested area at the back of our property. I got him inside immediately, but by the time I went out there, myself, 
nobody was anywhere to be found except a fresh set of wolf footprints leading it directly into the denser part of the woods. I had my husband go out there looking with a flashlight and a gun for about an hour. He came back shaking his head, telling me that although these did lead into the part of the woods where it was denser, they just appeared to stop suddenly, as if whatever it was just vanished into thin air. He tried to inspect it and investigate further but could not find anything. A couple of days passed with no further activity, and my son tells me that when I was at work, he heard a blood-curdling scream come from outside the house, only for him to look out the window in response and see this large coyote walking around on two legs, kind of limping, going in and out of the woods before disappearing again. I had tried my best to do some research on the property and the history of the house, only to really find nothing. But when I asked around, I was told by some people in our community that they've had some Native American problems. I guess back in the 1800s, when part of this area was settled, there was a mass Native American grave where hundreds upon hundreds of Native bodies were dumped. And it seems that ever since then, massive amounts of ghost sightings have been occurring. Other people talked about strange upright wolves running around the woods. And what one older gentleman suggested to me was that there was a big alpha male wolf spirit, is what he described, that was causing all the paranormal happenings around the community. And then it sounds like we saw it ourselves. I'm really not sure what to think about all this, even now. I lived on a ranch in northern Florida for many years. One day, in the fall, while hunting, I somehow got lost. It was getting dark, so I just decided to lay down in a clearing where I'd be able to see the stars. When suddenly, this upright coyote comes out of the woods, stops about 30 feet from me, turns back around, and walks into the woods as if nothing happened. It was completely black and terrifying. I will never forget it. But what I don't get is why did it turn around and casually walk back into the woods? And the weird thing was, before it walked out of the woods, I swear to God, I heard a woman's voice say in a strange tone, like, you shouldn't have come this way. It gave me chills even now as I think about it. It was like an old, scratchy woman's voice, like through an old AM radio. I'm not sure what that was all about, but easily one of the most frightening things to have ever had happened to me. In the winter of 2009, I was working the night shift at a gas station here in Augusta, Maine. I had taken up hunting with my friend and older brother that year. We were out to hunt coyotes. We didn't have a lot of money, so we were pretty limited on equipment. I only had a 22 rifle, along with my buddy, who had his old 30 odd 30 because he wanted me to carry his gun since mine shot further. We came across some fresh tracks while driving around, looking for some good spots. It looked like one or two coyotes went through there recently, but were gone by the time we got into position. We spent about an hour waiting for them to come back, and we realized we might be in the wrong spot due to lack of activity. We decided to go on the other side of the field and try our luck there. We drove through some brush, came across a mauled section where two coyotes were seen fighting. One was really behind, so I figured it would be an easy kill for me since he was between us and my buddy, ready to fire if he needed to. We shot at once, but only mine hit its target while my friends seemed to bounce off. He had just bought that rifle, used no iron sights or optics, so I told him don't worry about it. My coyote took off into the forest, while his friend went running in the opposite direction, towards a deep thicket on top of a hill right next to a house. As we got closer, I realized something just felt wrong, but with the adrenaline still pumping, I figured it might just be nerves. It wasn't until we got up next to it that I noticed something was really off. The coyote didn't look like a coyote at all. Its fur was darker. It looked almost black, even in the moonlight. And its face was much different, like it was deformed. 
and the way it moved was very odd. There were also no sounds of crickets, and the night was quiet. It gave us a really bad feeling, so we just left it be, and actually didn't even bother chasing after it. We jumped in my truck, took off back towards the gas station, since we would need help tracking something like that down. After about 15 or so minutes, we decided to turn around and go after it. We went back out there three more times throughout the night, never found anything, even with a trail of its blood. I'm not sure what we saw that night, but I know it was not just a coyote. I've been hunting since I was very little, and I have never seen anything like that before. It was almost as if it were something else entirely. Maybe like something wearing a coyote's skin to fool us into thinking that perhaps this was an ordinary animal, until we got too close. Whatever it was, it messed with us for months without even knowing about it. My friend had nightmares for weeks afterwards about being chased by some weird monsters in the woods. Now, about two years later, while he was home on leave from the Navy, my buddy came over to see how things were going. So I told him all about this story while we shot at some tin cans with his old rifle. I told him about how I wanted to post it on Reddit, so he said he would write up something similar, but not nearly as bad as the first time we had seen it. He went back home after spending a couple of days with family and me. I'd figured I'd give him a few weeks before sending him a message, asking what had happened. Now, a four or five months had passed without hearing from him. I began calling around to see if anybody had any idea where he was. He was not answering his phone. I finally got in contact with one of his friends, who told me that they were out drinking with my buddy, and he broke down about seeing this weird thing again. Apparently, he could not stop talking about it. He said that he had taken him home, made sure he was safe for the night. I mean, he wouldn't shut up about what had happened. Even kept begging his friend to go out there with him again, despite saying we should have left it alone. The next day, his friend told me my buddy had just disappeared. All of his stuff was still at his parents' house, where they had been staying. Nobody has seen or heard from him since, but I get that feeling that whatever we saw out in those woods is the reason why. That's pretty much the gist of what happened between us and this skinwalker, or whatever you want to call it. It may sound like I'm making this whole thing up, but after reading these stories online, it feels like there might be some truth behind them now. So now that you know how everything started, let me tell you about my friend, what he wrote, and his encounter with this awful thing. And keep in mind that my friend's post is very long and descriptive, so I've tried to sum it up into short paragraphs for easier reading. This all takes place over the course of seven nights. Here you go. When I was about 13 or so, I got a part-time job working at a gas station near an apple orchard in southern New Hampshire. We had around 1,000 acres of woods behind our house, which people were constantly dumping things because it was state game land. So no hunters wanted their time looking for deer back there. So people used it as an excuse to dump trash. My dad's best friend was in the Navy at the time and came to live with us after a while with going through a bad divorce, especially coming back on mid-tour leave. So me and him decided to go out there one night, right around midnight, he wanted to shoot something. He had his Ruger 1022. We got back there just before it started getting line out, thinking that anything still alive out there would be easy targets for our guns, due to the lack of light. It didn't take much time after that, until we heard something moving big in the woods. But it sounded too heavy to be deer, so I was already preparing myself for a fight. Right after we heard it, it started rustling around and a very large black bear came out from under some coverage and just stared at us, blankly. It must have been the first time it came to our area. It didn't know what kind of threat we were, compared to those that had chased it away before. So my friend had asked me if this was something we could scare off, like a mountain lion he saw one night at his house. I told him no as quietly as I could, with my heart literally beating out of my chest. All sorts of horrible thoughts started going through my mind right then and there. But after about 30 seconds or so, this bear, it was just acting different. It wasn't acting like a normal black bear, and you could tell something was up with it. Upon closer look, its eyes looked more human than you could imagine. 
and it kind of just waltzed off after giving us a strange expression. So on to the second night. After that happened, I just wanted to go home. But my friend said he had one more idea for us to try out, asking if it was alright if we went up to the hill behind our house to see how much more noise we could make without scaring away any game. After saying sure and waiting for about 10 minutes, he pulled out a big knife and said something like, let's hope this works. My friend was pretty strong for his age, so after traversing through some rugged terrain between the base of the hill and where we were, he began hacking away at branches with his knife, trying to make as much noise as possible. As soon as he got tired of doing that, he threw his knife to the ground and we started shouting at the top of our lungs while clapping our hands together. It didn't take long before we heard rustling in the leaves off in the distance and saw something big again moving very quickly up ahead. It was that same black bear from before, but this time was running after us, acting very aggressive. We retreated back to the house, and my friend told me that he was doing this specifically to pull out what he thought was a skinwalker back in the woods. He told me, normally, when you're attracting quote-unquote game, you're not going to try and make as much noise as possible, but we were trying to lure out this skinwalker, which I was convinced lived back in those woods, and I was right. If you notice that bear, its eyes looked different, it acted different, and the way it came after us after making that noise. Pretty sure that's exactly what we were dealing with. I don't know why, but after he told me this, I felt a little bit better. He said so after grabbing my father's shotgun, told me to get in the car with him. He seemed hesitant at first, but it sounded like what we were doing with our time was possibly illegal. He even offered that if we happened to get caught, he would pay for everything. And we both agreed that if something came out of the woods trying to hurt us, there wouldn't be any point in trying to load all the shells into the shotgun fast enough before it could do anything drastic. So, instead, we decided to bang on things with sticks while yelling as loud as possible like last time and hoping it worked. After getting back up there, something big was moving around again, and we started banging on things as fast and yelling like we could. We stayed up there for about 20 more minutes before I literally begged him to take me back to the house so I could get away from whatever was out there that night. It was scaring me really bad, even more after he told me that he heard something running between all around the houses. What my friend was doing, what I would later find out, is he was trying to do everything he could make all the noise he could to try and bring the skinwalker out in the open so he can kill it. Little did I know that he was actually a skinwalker hunter, or so he called himself, but anyway, when my friend would later take me back home, after this, him and his family decided to go on vacation. He'd went out of town with his sons, and at home, I was by myself, and I started to feel really cold while seeing shadows moving around everywhere. Obviously, this was the skinwalker enacting revenge. I believe it was casting evil spirits into the house in retrospect. So now fast forward a couple more days and my navy friend is back. But regardless of how everything has gone so far, I don't think anything could prepare me for what I saw next with my own two eyes while taking a shortcut home through an alleyway between houses. I saw shadows and blurriness suddenly starting to make sense as if they were following me. What I saw wasn't a man or a woman, or any normal living creature that I could tell. But all of my senses were telling me to run as fast as I could without looking back, if not for the fact that it seemed to be reaching out at me. But I heard my friend yell. He was right around there and took a shot at this thing, striking it before it fled. This thing isn't human, and if the stories are true, it definitely doesn't need any help from us. It already knows everything there is to know about this world. It is supernatural after all, including what happens and what happens before we die. I don't want to believe like anything like this exists, but the fact that it is able to shapeshift and take forms of a bear or a person or whatever it wants is startling and unnerving. This was me learning for the very first time that skinwalkers and the things that go bump in the night are very, very real. My story involves UFOs and a Snow White craft. I was in the Marine Corps from 98 to 2002. But before my enlistment, 
I lived in San Diego with friends from high school. In late 2000, we had gone camping and hiking up Mount Lagana, which is east of Alpine outside of Big Bear City. In order to get there, you have to go through Julian, California. This isn't an easy hike by any means and makes for a long day if you're going out and back. Even more so if you plan on going over Blue Jay Peak at some point along the way. Our original intention was to just do a quick overnight trip. But once we got into the mountains, that idea left us pretty quickly. It's all uphill. I mean, not literally all uphill, but you get the idea. I know that there was four of us because at one point, we split up and did our own thing. We were so tired. I don't remember who was with me, but I know my buddy brought his dog. When we finally got to the campsite, which was a little more than a wide place in the trail in an outhouse, it was getting pretty late. The sun had just gone down, and even though it was early December, there wasn't much cover from trees or anything else for that matter. It's just barren Sierra mountainside. We quickly set up camp, made dinner, and decided to turn in as early as possible. The next day was going to be rough on everybody. I don't remember if we even had a fire, which makes me wonder how cold it actually got overnight. I do recall seeing the breath of one of us, or two of us, as we slept. I was almost asleep when it happened. At first, I didn't know what it was. Maybe my buddy's dog was growling at me to wake up. But that didn't make any sense. There wasn't anything monstrous or dangerous in our campsite, and certainly nothing about this experience seemed threatening at first. It definitely wasn't a sound that any animal would make. So, what was it? This is where it gets tricky to describe. Let me try. It's like somebody sighing or breathing very heavily, except the sound came from everywhere and nowhere all at once. And just like that. Almost as if somebody stuck up behind me and whispered in my ear. All of a sudden, there was anxiety and fear and I felt like I had to be extremely careful with every movement I made. Even the slightest noise of shifting rocks underneath me would send shivers down my spine. It was like something trying to warn me against staying, but not having the actual power to make it happen. So, after what seemed like forever, but might have only been 30 seconds or so, the sighing breathing noise came back again, but softer this time. I wanted to run, but I was frozen with fear. When it finally stopped, I got up and started walking back towards camp, which wasn't by far any means, kind of like something had possessed me. As soon as I get back to the others, it felt like whatever was trying to scare us away left too. It's hard to explain, but now that it was gone, my body felt normal again and everything seemed clear somehow. We were all wired from having our lives threatened in some way, so one of the guys went for a walk. Another stayed awake looking out into the darkness. And me? At this point, I just passed out cold. The next day, we packed up all of our stuff, made sure to take out anything we brought in, like the campfire, and started on our journey home. After a while, my buddy's dog and the other two got thirsty, so he was going to go scout out some water ahead. We stopped to wait for him at one point, but after about 15 or so minutes, he still had not come back. So the other guy went to look for him. No dice, no sign of them anywhere. So me and whoever else couldn't stand waiting around anymore decided it'd be best if we all just kept moving forward without them. There really wasn't any other option. When they finally caught up to us, they were both pretty bummed. Just as they got close enough to see us, they realized we had just disappeared. They thought maybe we were ghosts or something. Eventually, after another few hours of hiking, they caught up to us again and he told me what happened. After realizing, I was gone too. His buddy turned around to go look for me when all of a sudden, he saw the three of us standing there watching them. We were standing awfully close together and we definitely weren't there when his friend turned around. I understand a lot of this doesn't make any sense. But what I'm trying to say here is that we all saw mirages of each other. Mirror images. Mimics. I know this is probably a lot to take in, but I think it's important. And my buddy and I really want people to know and hear the story. Maybe be able to give us insight. If this was extraterrestrial, paranormal, or something else altogether. My time in Vietnam was not easy. I saw a lot. Killed a lot. Did a lot. It ruined me. I was drafted into the infantry in 1968, landed at Da Nang on June 6th of that year. My tour of duty ended on November 6th, 1968. 
I said some things during that time that I regret now. Like promising my mother that while she might never see me again, I would always write to her while overseas. And then promptly dropping off the face of the earth. Or calling my girlfriend's mom before coming home to let her know what I was coming home to. But on one day, it still stands out in my memories. One hot human morning, our platoon was on routine patrol to the jungles near our base camp at about 25 miles inland. Our platoon went out every day to check for enemy activity in our area, but it was always pretty quiet. We saw nothing that morning, and were headed back to camp when we opened up everything we had into the jungle all around us. We couldn't see anybody though, but our point man had seen something in the trees ahead that he said looked like a large man. Myself and two others fired into that cluster of trees for all we were worth. To this day, I'm not sure I actually hit anything, but at that time, it was irrelevant. Firing was simply an act of solidarity with my fellow platoon members. I have no idea how long we fought or what happened during those frantic moments, but after what happened seemed like only seconds the fight had ended as quickly as it had started. We were grouped around our leader, who told us there was nothing to shoot at anymore. We should head back to camp. Even though nobody could explain why this first contact turned into a battle, I was post-haste relieved to be headed back to the hot meal and a warm cot. As we moved through the jungle, I found myself walking alongside one of my battle buddies from high school. It was unusual for me to walk with anybody because of how it made me feel. He was quiet, as usual, but held his M16 at the ready as he scanned the jungle around us. After all, we were young, probably barely 20, so I talk when there's still work to do. The two of us fell behind the rest of our squad as they continued their way out of the dense jungle towards a clearing where a chopper could pick us up and take us back to base. We were walking in a line when all of a sudden, my friend stops dead in his tracks, raised his rifle up against the thick vines hanging from the trees next to him. He looks through his scope at something and says, You're not going to believe this. What I saw next haunts me. An eight-foot-tall being slung down by its side. The thing was humanoid, but had dark green skin and a strange bald head. What stood out most about this being was it didn't have any eyes, just smooth skin where one would expect human features, and it had a large mouth full of all these horrific teeth. I was frozen in fear, and all of a sudden, I felt like I had to escape not just from this creature, but from the jungle itself. All the heat and constant humidity and insects that had been my constant companions since arriving here in Vietnam. Everything suddenly seemed to suffocate me, and this thing standing before me was impossibly large, impossibly still, and impossibly quiet. It was far from human. It had no face, no eyes, and this large mammoth mouth, and these teeth that curved inwards, as if when it gripped onto meat or something, it could pull. I knew it wanted to kill us. My friend slowly followed behind what we would later learn to be a Yeren. I was paralyzed with fear that my friend had to actually yank me forward from my shirt in order for me to follow. My heartbeat being so loud, I was sure that our tracker would hear it. But his attention remained focused on the strange creature making its way through the thick vegetation of the jungle floor. I wanted to ask what we should do next, but realized any sound from me might spook this thing and incite a deadly response. So, I simply followed on silent feet as our squad gradually fell further behind. Their guns raised into the canopy above them, lest another creature like this suddenly appear. We walked for about 20 minutes until our squad could no longer be heard. I quickly turned to our tracker, asked him what was next but I stopped dead in my tracks when I realized the Yaren was gone, as if it had never been there. My friend would later tell me he had seen this creature walking through the jungle for about an hour before we finally came within sight of each other. We were both frightened yet amazed by the experience and swore never to speak of it until years later, when we had reconnected on Facebook and compared our war stories over beer in college. The only thing I could think of is that maybe this thing tried to communicate with us telepathically, or maybe it was simply watching us. Although, without eyes, my guess is it felt with sonar, like a bat does. I'll never forget it, though. It was horrifying. And I think to myself, what if this creature would have tried to attack us? It would have ripped us limb from limb. 
How much does a bullet gonna do against something that's eight feet tall and built like a tank? It was a killing machine. Gosh, I hate the jungles. In the 1980s, I had been stationed in Brazil for six months as a part of a small army unit attached to the Brazilian army as an engineer. The job itself was rebuilding old roads and building new ones, some on existing roads, and others which required us to clear entire areas of forest with machetes and chainsaws. This area had seen lots of fighting during the 60s and 70s, and there were enormous minefields in some areas that we would have to walk into. I therefore carried a machete on my belt at all times. If you didn't know where it was, you would wander blindly until you found yourself kneeling down with one foot on either side of an unexploded landmine. Brazilian soldiers would be sent out ahead or behind our unit, sometimes for days at a time to do recon. They would also spend a lot of time in the rainforest hunting down gangs who were hiding out. One night, while I was there, one of the Brazilian soldiers came back to camp absolutely terrified. He reported that he had seen something which no human should ever have to. He said he saw a tall reptilian humanoid, about 9 to 10 feet tall, covered in scales, with reptilian eyes. He described its face as having scales and skin patterns, and where its mouth was, was full of sharp, reptilian fangs. His fellow Brazilians thought he must have been hallucinating. Everybody knows those don't exist, except him. To this day, I believe him. He was completely petrified. Serving in the Air Force as a fighter pilot, I was stationed in Tehran for several months. There was an incident about eight years ago now during my stay there. We had encountered some unusual aircraft as we were conducting routine exercises over the Iranian mountainside outside of Tehran. Naturally, our first reaction was to wonder what it was and whether they were friend or foe. Our orders were to fly only if we knew who they belonged to and that wasn't until they locked on and engaged us with missiles and gunfire that we would return fire. Two of these things began pursuing us from behind, so I rolled hard left and dove towards them at high speeds, over Mach 3, directly away from Tehran. All throughout my flight, these craft were able to match me move for move. When I pulled back up at a different angle, they did too and continued to dogfight chase with us. One of them was keeping its distance, while the other closed in on us at very high speeds before screeching off into the sky again. Completely black, solid missile shape. My theory is that we had stumbled across some sort of secret U.S. patrol testing, seeing if their equipment and our tactics were good enough to take down our F-14s or MIGs. We never heard about it from anybody after we landed. But now, as soon as I read about things like the TR-3B, I think this might be one of those craft. Of course, no footage exists. I was not allowed to have any sort of recording equipment on my person during the mission. We were even forbidden from taking photographs from one another. What gets me, though, is that these craft matched us move for move and accelerated at very high speeds with ease. This goes against our known physics, but only if you think about it for a bit, more than five minutes, does it really start to make sense. I can't tell you how exhilarating this experience was. The first thing they did when we landed was confiscate all footage and signs of me and my team being there. All that remains are some blurred photos that could not be used as evidence, nor taken seriously by most normal people. Sure, it's also possible that this was some experimental U.S. technology, but the way they were able to match me move for move makes me think something else is at play. I'm just glad I was chosen for this mission. It really woke me up and made me realize how much more there is to still learn about reality. It's funny to me when people have talked about sea monsters and things. When I share with them my story of when I was just off the coast of Italy and saw something on a radar that can only be attributed to a larger-than-life animal. I'm not saying it has to be a giant squid, but I've scoured the net, and there's nothing that comes close to what we saw. I'm an imaging technician in the United States Navy, and every day of my life, except for one particular time on this mission, we spent aboard a submarine. Some background. Our boat is an Ohio-class ballistic missile sub, 
which means we carry 24 Trident II missiles, each one capable of delivering 4 H-bombs on separate targets. We can split those bombs between 8 different targets, or concentrate them on one big target. We used to carry Polaris missiles. This is back when I joined the Navy, but have been Trident boats since the mid-80s. I was a high school graduate from a very small town in Colorado. I did not go to college right away. Instead, I got a job working for the local power company. It was a good job that had benefits and good pay. But after seeing an advertisement on TV about joining the Navy, how it would give me the opportunity to see the world, travel and all, the adjutant EP3 took me under his wing, and together we went through boot camp and eventually A school training in San Diego. After A school, he told me something that has stayed with me ever since. Lieutenant, he said, it doesn't matter if we're here on base in San Diego or at the bottom of the ocean. The only time we feel free is when we are on our mission. I knew what he was saying as it made sense to me, as well as having seen different scenarios that I would be a part on my boats. He added, You can always count on your brothers and sisters who do your mission with you. There's no judgment, and they will back you up for anything you do or say. He said this knowing full well how I am and where his advice came from. But he also knew it had taken him years of drinking and fighting before he figured out. I became a whole technician second class in the missile department on the USS Henry M. Jackson SSBN 730 in Bangor, Washington. Our missile tubes are 24 feet in diameter and can launch with enough force to break windows over 5 miles away when launched underwater from a boat. A Trident II missile weighs 70 tons with a range of 4,000 nautical miles when fully loaded. That's about eight times farther than New York is from Boston. Today was one of those rare times when we were out on our patrol off the coast of Italy, doing some testing on our equipment and periscope operations. Normally, when this type of testing occurs, both our captain and the commanding officer are fully aware because there's risk associated with it. The Navy has a way to measure risk, but nobody ever seems to really know how much danger we are in. But still, you never want to put yourself in harm's way, if at all possible. Nothing wants to be escalated worse than it needs to be. Testing sonar equipment is not that bad. And this is since the boat stays stationary for hours at end, letting sound waves bounce off structures below us, creating an image of our sonar screens, much like you would see when looking through binoculars underwater. There are ships out there which conduct studies using passive sonar listening devices, called sonar. These are like giant ears that can hang down into the ocean, but they take up much more space than our periscope does. Today was one of those rare days that I had an extra time on my hands, so I decided to take a nap after lunch. Very low vibrations, which meant we were still there doing testing. We call this being in the hole. Normally when operating at sea, you have to be ready for anything. But here, when there's nowhere to go, just an endless expanse of water underneath your hole, you can only hope that nothing will come out of nowhere that you weren't prepared for. As I stretched out on my rack, I could hear the faint sound of a chopper above our boat. It was an E-2 from one of our sister boats, probably checking on us while we were stationary, just to see if everything was okay. All of a sudden, their voice came over the speaker in my room. Message from the hello. It said, and then there was a tone followed by another. I immediately knew something wasn't right. This meant only one thing. Submarine contact. He continued with his message, not knowing that just before he began transmitting our commanding officer had actually turned off all the speakers so that no alarm bells would ring throughout the boat, which is what normally happens when someone transmits an emergency message. My captain did this to make sure we weren't startled and only he would hear the transmission. I sprang up from my rack, ran down to see what was going on, I figured they had intercepted another country's submarine, and it was within our vicinity. They would be tracking it with their chopper, as well as running some tests on it to try and identify its type of class and sub. One of those tests is called a MAD run, which stands for Magnetically Assisted Detection. Basically, you fly over the top of them at a high rate of speed, not looking directly at the target, but very close by so they can do some readings off your metal body. It works similar to how an airport magnetic locator works. If you've ever taken geology course in college, only these are much more difficult to detect because you need to be very, very close. When I arrived on the bridge, I could hear a commanding officer talking about the helicopter, which is called the three ship, 
when referring to an E2. There were three messages being transmitted at once, so I knew they must have had one above us, and two others behind us or in front of us. The messages indicated that there was definitely something big down below, but no confirmation on what it was. One message said that there was a large bio-life form over the top, meaning submarine. The second message reported back with degraded MAD data. And finally, please advise status of sub. This meant that something was wrong with the sub and they needed us to come check it out, since we were the closest. Now, my commanding officer grabbed the mic, pressed down on the button, and replied, Undetermined. He then turned to us and said, I want all hands on deck downstairs, looking for anything unusual. Somebody get me a visual. We ran around like chickens with our heads cut off, seeing if there was anything down there that shouldn't be. We were supposed to report back any visual contact or unknown sounds and vibrations below decks. Of course, he knew it was an exercise, but you wouldn't think so based off how serious everybody took this drill, including myself. And all of a sudden, I heard a ping echo throughout the boat. I went to the sonar room and saw that their skipper had taken off towards us at a flank speed, 35 plus knots. We can tell how fast they are traveling by listening to how many pings per minute they send out. The more pings, the faster they are going. As soon as I realized what was happening, I immediately asked for confirmation from our commanding officer. After he looked at me like I had three heads, he ran down to ask himself. He would not see anything on our scopes and monitors, other than their submarine up ahead racing closer to us, and getting louder too, because of all of its machinery that makes noise underwater. So, I had asked the skipper if we could see anything on their periscope. He said that he had been looking through it for a few moments now, and still could not make out what it was, even though they were only about 2,000 yards ahead of us. This is when I realized that whatever was above us was not a submarine at all. Otherwise, they would know by now. Also, our skipper should have been able to identify them as friendly, because of the transponder signal we sent out earlier. They continued to close in another thousand feet or so, and slowed down to propeller speeds. The skipper was not able to see what it was anymore. He ordered his men now to turn off the Big Eye Periscope. He also told them to stop all the exterior lights, propellers, and reduce oxygen in their torpedo rooms, which would enable us to be completely silent while underwater. We were still running at flank speed, because we wanted to get away from whatever this thing was as fast as possible. All of a sudden... I saw something on our periscope with two blinking lights. They were about 600 feet above us and closing in fast. The skipper was watching them through his own periscope, so he had us immediately slow down to almost zero until they passed overhead. He couldn't make out any sort of shape but said that it looked like the same size as a submarine that we originally spotted earlier, meaning this thing must be enormous. That's right. Nothing made sense anymore at that point. There's no way it could have been anything else other than a giant sea monster that you hear stories about, which everybody thought died out many centuries ago. Except now, one has apparently returned just to hunt some marines for some unknown reason. We eventually got back to shore and told everybody who we had talked to what happened. They made us sign non-disclosure agreements saying that if we didn't keep our mouths shut, they would make sure we never worked in the industry again. They also implemented new protocols such as no longer allowing submarines to travel at flank speed. Apparently, these beings can hear from miles away. To date, I am still convinced that giant sea monsters exist, and spend most of their time hunting down anything smaller than them, which has led me to recently become interested in cryptozoology, because I believe science is not telling us everything. My name is Jeff. I wanted to share some details with you today, about the secret underground base located located in Dulce, New Mexico. This houses alien technology you would never believe that our country has at our disposal. I am a former military man who was stationed at this facility. I have only shared these stores with my family and one friend because, like most people of this nature, people don't really believe you. My father was also in the Air Force and stationed in Alaska many times throughout his entire career. He too has seen some crazy things but would never speak about them to others because he knew that they wouldn't believe him either. There are plenty of stories out there by other whistleblowers about Dulce, but their narratives seem so discombobulated they can hardly make heads or tails of some of the stuff they are saying. 
my experience occurred back in 1979, while I was stationed at the Kirkland Air Force Base right near Albuquerque, New Mexico, for some training required for my job. After about a week of working on our projects, we were given some free time to explore. We were only about 30 minutes away from Dulce at this time, and it had always been high on my bucket list since I had heard stories from my father when I was a kid, just about all the crazy things he saw up there during his tours during the 60s and even into the 70s. So the three of us jumped into one of our buggies that we drove around in downtown Socorro and headed towards Dulce. We first had to stop off in Farmington, New Mexico, on our way there to pick up some supplies at a Walmart. We had heard that the gas pumps out in that area were few and far in between. We then headed northwest, along Highway 64 towards Bloomfield, where I was told that it would branch off. We had no map, but some directions from one of my friends who grew up there. We must have taken a wrong turn somewhere along the line because when we got to the small town of Dixon, which is about 15 miles or so outside, something just didn't feel right. There were strange vibrations coming from deep underground all around us while we were on the main road through town. It got very strong as we passed by an old abandoned church that looked like something straight out of a horror movie. So, we decided to stop at this place and turn around. It felt evil. As I turned around in the gravel parking lot of the ancient Ridgeline Church, I felt that same feeling that I had when I was stationed in Alaska for six months back in 1984. As I turned around in the gravel parking lot of the ancient Ridgeline Church, I felt that same feeling that I had when I was stationed in Alaska for six months back in 1984. There's an old military base up there called Fort Wainwright, which used to be a part of the now defunct Project Greek Island. For those who don't know, Project Greek Island was a secret government project created during the Cold War to build nuclear fallout shelters capable of housing several thousand people all beneath Mount Weather in Virginia, near the small town of Bluemont. This project was heavily guarded for obvious reasons, and it supposedly still exists today. The strange thing about this abandoned church in Dixon is that there are deep underground tunnels beneath it, which lead to other nearby facilities. It's a placeholder, basically. After I turned around in the parking lot, two of my friends came running back to the buggy with looks on their faces as if they had just seen a ghost. They told me they both felt evil emanating from the front doors of this ancient-looking building and wanted to leave immediately. They felt that there was something inside that made them very uneasy and feeling very frightened. We got back on Highway 64 heading west after we passed some trees we saw that looked like a fenced-off military storage facility with security checkpoints at the front gate. Then, we saw another one of these storage facilities to our left, which looked like an elevated train station, but was abandoned as well, and even had some railroad tracks heading deep into the mountains. My two friends then turned around again, and we headed back towards Route 550, where we could see yet another facility that looked up to be a fenced-off apartment complex up on top of the hill, surrounded by no trespassing signs and barbed wire fencing. This place didn't look very big from where I was standing, but my friends claimed that this wasn't even half of the whole base. We then decided to go back onto Highway 64, heading west once more, instead of taking Route 549, which would have taken us more into Dulce because I wanted to go see the infamous Archuleta Mesa for myself. As we were driving, we noticed a strange dark green tube-like aircraft flying toward us from over the top of the trees. It was making a sound like thunder as it flew right above us in our buggy, which made all of our hair stand up on end. You could feel electric energy emanating from it. It was like some sort of prototype stealth fighter jet that reminded me of one of those old SR-71 Blackbirds that Lockheed Martin used to make. We then turned on a Forest Service Road 102, which leads directly to the top of Archuleta Mesa, where people claim there's an entrance into this secret underground base below. As we reached the top of the mesa, we noticed some strange-looking contrails in the sky coming from east, and there were also some unmarked black helicopters with no lights on them, flying towards the mesa as well. We decided to turn around at this point because I was beginning to feel very uneasy about what we had just seen. We then got back on Route 64 heading west yet again and started driving towards Dulce when all of a sudden, my two friends both pointed towards some strange beings that they saw off in the distance. They said that these things looked like little gray aliens, only much smaller. I quickly turned my head just in time to see something darting behind a house before I could catch more than just a glimpse of it. I swear that what I saw was a small gray alien, like in the movies. 
we all agreed it was time to get out of here now and start to head back towards Farmington. We got onto Highway 64 heading east this time, and we eventually passed by several unmarked black helicopters. They now seem to follow us for some reason. You have been warned. You have been warned. It's a very real place, and I highly advise against going there. To this day, I can't seem to wrap my head around all that we saw. For this report, I will remain anonymous. I will only be going by the name of General, which was given to me by my service with the United States Air Force. I have decided to post this here on Reddit for various reasons which I may later explain in this report. I was born and raised in a small town near a USAF base that is no longer operational. The base was closed due to what they call base realignment under the Clinton administration back in 95. Back then, my family did not have much money, so my father enlisted with the local Air Force base because he felt it would give him good benefits for his family. Plus, it offered stability, something we did not have much of at home. He began as an aircraft maintenance technician, otherwise known as an AMT, maintaining fighter jets such as an F-16 Fighting Falcon, working his way up into management when I started schooling. I remember being so proud when he brought me to the base where he worked, watching them do test flights. On a side note, it kind of sucked having a father since sometimes I would have to stay at my house because he had to work overtime or go to a friend's house just so I could have some stability in my life. My dad was eventually accepted into the local United States Air Force Academy, where they trained pilots and management personnel for the USAF. He ended up graduating from there with honors, even though he did not want to go at first. His time at USAF Academy finally gave him the structure his family needed, but it also killed him physically due to all of his training and exercise during college. Over his health declined fast that he was forced to go on disability and eventually retire from the USAF in the early 2000s. His time at the base also gave me a test run of sorts when it came to military life. My father, my grandfather, and even my older brother all served either for him or my grandfather, so military was nothing new to our family but I did not want anything to do with it since I always wanted to be out doing something else instead of sitting around. Even though our own town had once been an active base, by the time I had graduated high school, there was no longer any active duty personnel stationed there, just support members, meaning I did not have much exposure of what military life was like, except through stories. It was around this time that I met my now ex-girlfriend Maria. We both had just graduated high school and were planning to go off to college together, until she got pregnant with her son. And due to her condition, we decided that it would be best for me not to go away to college, but instead join the service after high school so I could help support my family. Apologies about the timelines here. I'm kind of skipping all over. Hopefully you can keep up. Before anybody jumps down my throat about getting a girl pregnant at 18, I will have you know that me and Maria are no longer together. She cheated on me multiple times. So, anyway... I joined the USAF straight out of high school on active duty as an AMT like my father before me. I did this for him but also because of my mother. She was diagnosed with depression and frequently self-medicated using drugs that were later deemed illegal by the DEA. I won't say which. I felt like it would be best if I joined so I could provide some kind of stability for her especially since she had just lost her husband whose health had been fading fast from what turned out to be cancer. In active duty, I worked as an AMT much like my father before me, maintaining electronics on F-16 fighter jets as part of a base located in Utah AFB. The workload there was pretty heavy, as we sometimes worked 12-plus hour shifts, five days a week minimum, leaving not much free time outside of being exhausted due to sleep deprivation or time spent with family. It was an active duty where I met my ex-roommate, Jake, who I'll define as a redneck, he lived out in the middle of nowhere, so always had to commute about an hour just to get to work, which really gave both of us time to bond, since we spent that whole time together in his car listening to music. While well, Jake was not the smartest guy in the world, he made up for it with sheer determination and hard work ethic and making him very valuable, on base due to his willingness to help out when needed. One night, while goofing off around the hangar doing some light maintenance on fighter jets, Jake told me something utterly disturbing. At first, I did not believe him. There were no apparent markings on the craft my father had shown me, but after he showed me what he saw on his cell phone, 
I began to see that there was more to our military than they were letting my father or I know. It all started when Jake and I were chasing each other around near some jet engines, testing out a new prank idea he wanted to try out. In the process of doing so, we both stumbled upon this small craft, looking almost identical to the one in my dad's picture, minus a few details here and there. Upon closer inspection, it appeared that this one did not have an official USAF emblem, instead having a symbol painted onto it very crudely, with what appeared to be a house paint made for use at the inside of homes. The symbol resembled a stylized letter K with what appeared to be a lightning bolt. After trying my best not to freak out, I decided that it would be best if me and Jake talked about it elsewhere. I mean, this could be some top testing project. With all of my father's briefings still etched into my memory, I knew that something like this out in the open was grounds for treason if caught by somebody other than the military personnel or somebody higher up in chain of command. We left the hangar shortly thereafter, but only got as far as his car before three men ran up on us, wearing black suits with earpieces, telling us to step away from each other. They further explained that they were taking Jake into custody, but I was free to go, and would not be held accountable for anything. Unless, of course, I stood in the way of what they were doing. And knowing that these men were most likely part of the men in black, I had no desire to stick around and find out what they wanted, so I got in my car and drove away, as fast as I could. I just pushed the events that happened that night into the back of my mind, knowing that it would probably never come up again. Until late December, I came back home one day, only to find an old man with a black suit waiting right by my front door. He told me he was looking for somebody else who lived there, saying he needed to speak with them about an extraterrestrial life form. He showed me his own identification, which confirmed he was an actual member of the USAF, and not just some kook. He then said it's about time for me to come forward with my experiences that night at the base. Somebody has been keeping tabs on what I knew since then, even going as far as making sure that I never told anybody about what I saw or risk being sent permanently to a mental hospital, where all the top doctors will claim that you have mental issues that they cannot cure. The fact that he told me this so bluntly made me realize that he believed that I wasn't going to tell anybody until the situation was purely out in the open regardless of whether or not his threats held any merit. Then, before leaving, he asked how well Jake took care of things around here, as if checking up to see if anything was amiss. I made sure to tell him that Jake always did his work, even when I wasn't around, so there was no reason to worry. The experiences I had with the UFO craft and the men in black has made me very creeped out, especially why they were here. But what disturbs me more than anything is how easily somebody can almost break into my house while I'm at work just to give me a warning, without any legal repercussions for doing so. They are the military. They can do whatever they want. And due to this experience, I've decided that Jake must have gotten into some pretty serious trouble while stealing files before getting caught by men dressed like agents. My father also cannot be allowed near anybody, again. If it wasn't for him being dead, I'm sure he probably would have gotten himself killed. So, my now thoughts are consumed with wondering what will happen to me, if I choose to inform anybody about the men in black visiting me, and whether or not they would believe it if it was real. This experience will definitely haunt me for the rest of my life. There's no telling where those black men dressed will be watching from next. I worked on a top-secret government bioweapons project in the 1980s. You might have known about this one. Project Feather. This project entails some of the most grueling and complicated genetics work known to man at the time, utilizing every bit of technology borrowed and then some to create these super bioweapons. I was a part of a team with one goal in mind to create essentially chimera humanoids, or in simpler terms, creating humanoid creatures that possess tremendous power, strength, and intelligence. The ones in my division of this project primarily focused on what many know as dogmen. We are going to develop them as a type of super soldier for the military. Ever heard of wolfmen or werewolves? That's what we were working on. Smart people. They became so much more than that, though. I was stuck on a seven-man team. This is not common knowledge by any stretch of the imagination. However, I'm coming forward because there are others who have contributed to this project who will no longer be with us soon if they haven't already passed and it must come to light before it's too late. They will not be able to share their stories with you. 
I am doing this now as a last request from those who have helped me, in my own conscience that has been plagued by guilt for many years now. These beings were created, were supposed to be used as super soldiers. They were strong, fast, and they healed quickly. There was a side effect, though. Madness. The science is solid. The strongest kind there is, actually. However, there's more going on behind the scenes here than anybody else knows about. Even Project Feather members themselves. Something much bigger than just creating from superhuman soldiers. It all begins the day before our first dogman birth. It would be difficult for me to type, mostly. But if somebody is out there reading this with the same mind, still at this point, uh, please bear with me. I also just want to state that dogmen have been around for a very long time. Project Feather set out to create our own line of dogmen. Before Project Feather began, all of us received extensive psychological evaluations from our superiors in order to weed out the weak individuals who may crack under pressure or go psycho with bloodlust, seeing as how we were going to be putting these things to hell with rigorous genetic testing and making them fight each other sometimes. I was deemed fit for Project Feather with flying colors. I'm not sure why. I had some weird thoughts and beliefs that seemed to come down and come out of nowhere as a kid. Maybe it was the bullies at school. All seven of us were deemed psychologically fit for the project, and we knew that we could be creating an army of super soldiers who were stronger, faster, and more intelligent than any human soldier alive on the planet at the time. But one day, everything changed. Everything changed because mainly, after all those years of genetic tinkering and giving dogmen some pretty crazy capabilities, superhuman strength, speed, physical endurance like no other man on Earth, it made them crazy. We didn't know it until later, though. So one night, a day before the first dogman of our project was born, I had overheard a conversation between my two superiors in which they discussed how it will be difficult to control them once they are let out of their dens. I wasn't sure why they were being caged. That was my first question. I asked it the following day, but that's when everything changed forever. It all began at night, as I was working my shift in the lab, as usual. Everything seemed quiet as I walked past a row of dogman cells, with only the dim flickering of the emergency lights to guide me down this dark hallway. All of a sudden, one of them had stood up and began pounding on the door ferociously, to no avail. Mind you, it was locked tight with a special alloy that we had created especially for the housing of these creatures. It could only be unlocked with special tools, with only certain individuals we had access to. I will continue the rest of this in part two. I was deployed in southeast Tennessee, in a wooded area outside of the small town of Manchester. I was taking an off day from training exercises and decided to go for a walk through some trails nearby. It being so remote, I was not too concerned about encountering anything else out there. I walked down one trail and I came across a fork. One path led deeper into the woods, while the other cut up over this ridge, leading back, not wanting to get lost after dark being unsure if anybody had been on that trail before me or not, and knowing that it'd probably be a good idea to check around that ridge, at least before going back over it, just in case somebody was over there. I decided to head up the trail. The ridge looked clear, even though I did notice that there were no signs of anybody else having been on the path any time recent. That didn't really concern me much, since it was too difficult to see by anyway. So anyway, I'm walking up this trail through the woods, when all of a sudden... I began to hear woods around me move. Being alone out here and being unarmed, my troop instincts began kicking in, so I turned around expecting to find somebody coming after me. Rather than finding an assailant, which I did not see, or anything even worth shooting, what I found was much more confusing. A canine figure standing bipedally roughly 30 meters away from me, looking at me. I couldn't make out any details because of the distance and the darkness, but it was definitely standing up on two legs. For all I knew, it could have been a bear. I've seen pictures of half feral dogs who stay like this before, so that thought did cross my mind. It just stood there watching me, which made me even more uncomfortable. After watching it for a couple of seconds, I decided to take some action since running wouldn't help much, with someone or something chasing after me, if they were already close enough enough to catch you. Plus, if it was a bear, then at least trying to scare him off would be better than doing nothing. 
so I tried yelling at it, making as much noise as I could while steadily backing away from it, hopefully buying me time. This being, whatever it was, didn't look any more concerned by my shouting. If anything, it seemed almost amused by my actions. It continued watching me, until I turned around and began running down the path. A couple of seconds after turning around, there was a loud crashing noise coming from where the dog-like thing had been standing. I guess to chase after me now that I had turned the tail. But when I looked back to see what was happening, not only did it not seem concerned about chasing me anymore, but now suddenly there were two of them. I saw it again, standing where the other one had been watching me. I don't know what happened after that. I just kept running, and I did not look back until I was well on my way. When I did, I wasn't sure if they were still following me or not, but something had occurred. If they wanted to attack me, why hadn't they done it yet? They had opportunities. They even chased after me when I tried to scare them off initially. So waiting all this time while I ran away seemed like a weird thing for wild animals who are trying to kill you. I don't know exactly what happened after that. They just simply disappeared. Why hadn't they attacked me? They had plenty of opportunity to. Another thing that really struck me as odd was that there were two of them. Had I possibly interrupted a hunt? Or maybe, or was this a male or a female? Did I possibly spring upon their ambush on its prey? And there were a lot of deer out by then. It's probably all just a coincidence, but it still doesn't feel that way. After getting back home and having time to process what happened, my thoughts are that beings exist that I had no idea do. Avid outdoorsman here. I've spent a great deal of time in the backcountry of Utah. I'm also a scientist. I was hiking with my wife and two kids, six and eight at the time, in Bryce Canyon National Park on July 14th, 2018. We were near the top of Queen's Garden Trail at sunset. I'm a huge fan of the outdoors and am also an avid cryptid enthusiast. I have personally seen multiple Bigfoots in Carolina, Colorado, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Montana. My family and I were all looking around at the beautiful scenery. We have been nature freaks growing up and have raised our kids the same. Suddenly, my six-year-old daughter points something out. Dad, what's that? I turned around and saw a large dark creature standing about 20 yards away on the edge of the trail. It was kind of leaning against a tree. I could not see its face, it was turned away from us. The creature was very large and dark, almost black. It was not human. I immediately grabbed my kids, and we began running down the trail. I looked back over my shoulder and saw the creature chasing after us. We ran all the way to the bottom of the trail, which was about half a mile, and it was gone. Now, what I find unusual about this encounter is that my wife and kids never saw a creature like this before. I have also investigated many sightings, but nothing like what we had encountered that night. It's possible this could have been a Bigfoot, but I've seen black bear and goats in the area before, which can be dark colored. Bryce Canyon is not known for any other sightings or cryptids, I think. It's possible we encountered something unknown, possibly paranormal, although I'm not sure. I've worked in law enforcement for well over 20 years now. I grew up in the area and have been going to Bryce Canyon since I was a kid. I've been a hunter and fisherman all my life, so I'm not some city slicker. I was on a ranger-led tour in the canyon on September 14th, around 11 a.m. The group was about halfway through the canyon when I spotted something moving on a ledge above us, about 100 yards away. I pointed it out to the ranger and we all watched as it slowly lumbered across the ledge, then disappeared behind a rock formation. It was definitely not a deer or any other type of animal that I'm familiar with. I've never seen anything like it before. It was black, had long arms that hung down below its knees. Its head was slightly larger than its torso. It did not look like anything I've ever seen. It wasn't anything that other people on the tour have seen either. I'm not sure what it was, it gave me a creepy feeling, and it's been on my mind ever since. One thing I noticed about it was, was that whatever it was, there was no visible neck or anything. 
just a big block-type head that appeared to flow into the rest of its body and long arms. I think it was male, but I'm not sure about that either. That's pretty much it. Just thought you might want to know, and I think you should pass this on. I used to be in the military, and am now a general contractor. I'm also an Eagle Scout, and have been camping and hiking all my life. I am very familiar with the area around Monroe Peak in Utah, having hiked it many times. I have also been deployed to the Middle East and have spent a lot of time in the desert and mountains there. Anyway, this is my story. I was out hiking with my dog on Monroe Peak on February 2nd, 2019, when I saw something strange. I was near the summit, just below the radio towers, when I saw what looked like a large black bear walking across the ridgeline about a hundred yards away from me. The thing was huge, easily the largest black bear I'd ever seen. But its body was more elongated and its head was too small for that of a black bear. It had very long legs and walked upright, like a human would. It was definitely not a black bear. I realized that very quick. I was terrified, quickly running down the mountainside, leaving my dog behind. I have never been so frightened in my life. I did not get a chance to get a good look at the creature's face, but it definitely was not a black bear, and it was definitely not a human. Plus, I was pretty high up and it was sunny out. There's no way this could have been a trick of the light. Has anybody else seen anything similar? I'm scared to go back up there. This is also one of several accounts with strange cryptids on Monroe Peak in Utah. In the fall of 2018, two other hikers had reported seeing a large black creature they believed to be a Sasquatch. And in June of 2018, another group of hikers reportedly saw a small gray creature they may believe to have been a chupacabra. These sightings are particularly concerning because Monroe Peak is located in an area known as the Nine Mile Canyon, a well-known area for its many paranormal activity. The canyon is said to be haunted by ghosts of Native American warriors, killed in battle. They still roam the hills, searching for their lost loved ones. Strange lights have also been seen in the canyon at night, and a number of ghosts have been reported amongst numerous cryptid sightings and strange magnetic anomalies. I'm a police officer in a suburb north of Salt Lake City, Utah. I've been with the department now for around five years and with law enforcement in general for 10. During the daytime, I work as a patrol officer and during my off time, I help run a cryptozoology slash ghost hunting group investigating alien abductions, cryptids, and other haunted areas. We get called to more than our fair share of suicides, but more often than not, we get to debunk calls from family members who don't want their loved ones labeled as crazy, so they call us instead of the actual authorities. It was just another day at work, and we had already gone on to several suicide calls. I decided to take it easy, and not to go on any more. I was on patrol and decided to take a quick break in my squad car, and just relax for a few moments, and I noticed something moving. A large black creature, standing around seven feet tall with long, thin arms. It was very thin and lanky, almost skeletal. It did not appear to have any fur or hair on its body, and its eyes were stark black. It stood there for a few seconds and began to move very, very quickly. I could not believe what I was seeing. I immediately got out of my car to try and get a better look at it, but unfortunately, it disappeared quickly into the darkness, and I could not find it anywhere. I was dumbfounded by what I had just seen and still can't believe it had happened. I'm not the only one who has seen this creature either. My friend and fellow investigator also saw it a few months ago near Moon Lake. We have no idea what this thing is, but it's definitely real and out there somewhere. I'm honestly scared to death of it, whatever it is. I have had several other people contact me with similar sightings in the same area, so it's definitely something worth investigating. 
Has anybody else heard or seen anything like this in Utah? Please let me know if you have. I'd prefer to know I'm not totally insane and I'm not the only person who has seen it. I've had three separate sightings. The first two were in Utah State, and the last one was almost exactly two years ago on my property here in Washington State, where I currently live. It's what finally drove me to leave Utah. The first sighting took place when I was about nine years old. I'm now 36. My parents and I went camping at this little spot up near East Canyon Reservoir that isn't really an official campground, but you can drive into there and park. It's mainly used by hunters during deer season, and if you're lucky enough, your camp will be broken into by deer thieves. Joking. Anyway, we hiked out a ways with our dog, like we always did, and decided to set up camp for the night. We did not stay in the official campsites because they were all taken, and there was no privacy. So we found a spot that had been used before, under a large aspen tree. After we got our tent set up, my father started a fire, and my mom was cooking dinner. I remember that night was very windy. I was cold. So I went over to the fire to warm up. That's when I saw it. It was standing maybe 50 yards away from us, watching us, like a person would watch something they're curious about. It was shaped kind of like a wolverine, but walking on two legs. It was not hunched over like a wolverine, but it moved kind of like a person would, and it was huge. The body length was easily seven feet tall. It was taller than I, and after a few moments, it turned around and walked off into the forest. We packed up our stuff and left after that. My parents saw it and it freaked them out. The second sighting happened roughly ten years later. I was still living in Utah at the time and working on an archaeology crew, doing survey work in the middle of nowhere. We were the only people around for miles. We were out in the desert doing a grid search. I was walking down one of the lines when I saw this weird animal standing about roughly 20 yards away. At first, I assumed it was a coyote, but I noticed its tail was different. It was dog-like in general, but completely covered in reddish-brown or chocolate-covered fur. I stood there watching it curiously, and then, very slowly, it turned around and took several steps toward me before I could get my wits about me, enough to yell out, Hey! after it. There's no way this was a coyote, because of how large it was. If I had to guess an animal size comparison, I'd say it's roughly two feet wide. Now the third sighting happened when I lived in West Valley City, near Salt Lake. A friend of mine who used to work on farms told me he had to quit his job there, because every time he saw it, it would be watching him, just out of his sight. He said it was the size of a large man and built very powerfully. He also told me it would stand on two legs and watch him for minutes at a time before disappearing back into the trees, like it was planning something, plotting to grab him. I think there were other guys working at this farm too who saw it, but they didn't say anything. I was also going through a pretty bad divorce at the time with my high school sweetheart, so that was really hard to deal with. A very stressful time. I will say this though, I've always been interested in the paranormal and have gone on quite a few investigations. I'm not saying that all these sightings are cryptids, but I do believe there's more to this world than what we can see with our eyes. I think it's possible more creatures than we imagine exist. But what I described to you, I have no answers for. Thank you for listening. I grew up in Salt Lake City, went to school at BYU, and am now a contractor living near Big Cottonwood Canyon. I am sound of mind and have nothing to gain from this, just reporting what I saw happen. I was driving home on the Canyon Road at about roughly maybe 8 to 9 p.m. on a Saturday night. It had been raining that day, so there were a lot of just washed surfaces around. As I drove up the curvy road, my windshield wipers were going full speed as visibility was limited due to the rain and mist blowing off the mountain slopes surrounding me. Just as I passed 
was Soch Boulevard. The mist parted for a second and revealed something with very bright eyes, about eight inches in diameter, standing right near my car on the passenger side. It was just there. I had not seen it or felt it approach. The being I was looking at was very thin and had a head that was disproportionately large in comparison to its body size. The eyes were completely black, devoid of pupils, iris, or anything else. This thing did not make any noise, move, or react in any way. I only saw it for a second as the mist quickly enclosed and around it again. I immediately accelerated and drove home. When I got out of the car, my hands were shaking uncontrollably and my heart was pounding so hard, it was the equivalent of chugging a six-shot espresso. Listen, I've been through a lot of paranormal experiences in my life, but I'm terrified of this memory. This thing is not human. I've been told there are a lot of military underground bases in the area. Could it be something from one of those? Possibly experiments or genetic experiment gone wrong, I have no idea. I've never felt like this before about any paranormal thing, and I'm really shaken by it. The eyes were almost reptilian in appearance, but there's something much worse about them that I can't put my finger on. I would never want to meet one of these beings outside my car at night on a secluded road. Not now, not ever. In 2007, I did some training for my job and was qualified to carry a firearm. I wanted to get more training, so I got into handgun shooting and carried it concealed at the time. I'm 42 years old, born in Pocatello, Idaho. My family moved to Mapleton, Utah when I was two, so I basically grew up there. Other than college years spent abroad, England and California, this is my home base. The area we used to hunt is called South Hills, located near Layton, Utah, about halfway between Salt Lake and Ogden, on Highway 89 headed south towards Provo. It's referred to as the Hills by locals, but it actually starts about 300 feet above sea level, rising fairly quickly west of the highway. The goal was to be able to sit in the area and call animals in without them catching our scent. We would use smell generators to power single-line bulbs attached to wooden crosses. The plan was that when it got dark, we would start placing these lights down at about 200-yard intervals across an area bordered by two dirt roads. During the day, it's a very nice forested area with medium-sized hills. Nothing too steep or treacherous. Perfect for us city boys who haven't seen this kind of wilderness before. Lots of jackrabbits, deer, etc., there are also coyote, skunks, raccoons, wild cats. Bobcat, I think, but never saw any bears or mountain lions which are said to roam the area. We would set up our light stations and then get in position to call the game in. As soon as it started getting dark, we would hear things moving around out there, sometimes very close by. We would see eyes shine from various animals, but never anything that caused us concern. On this particular night, while sitting with my back against a large tree, waiting for my partner to return from placing another light, I heard a noise above me. It sounded like a large bat or a vulture flying very close by. Then, landing on one of the limbs just near my head, I pulled out my flashlight, shined it up, and saw a very large creature looking down at me from about 20 feet away. It was much too big to be a bat, a vulture, or any other kind of natural animal. The light lit up its face, but all I caught were quick glances without much clarity. Whatever it was sat there for what seemed like minutes, but most likely not, and then took off in flight. It's hard to judge speed when you're dealing with something that belongs in the X-Files. I remember this encounter well. We were taught that if we encountered a mountain lion in the wild, the best thing to do was to very quietly and slowly back away. Well, that's what I tried to do. But then it dawned on me that this thing didn't seem concerned about me at all. Neither did it act or look like anything I'd ever seen before. So I decided not to play dead. It flew off and I never saw it again. I will say, though, 
that whatever creature this was, it was hideous, and its wings were so huge, I'm talking nearly eight feet across. It had grayish skin with long, thin arms and short legs with clawed hands. Its wings were very bat-like, except the wingspan was wider than its body. The head was maybe two or three times too large for its body, an elongated dome sort of shape that reminded me of a vulture but more hideous and deformed. The physical encounter lasted no longer than five minutes, but that image of that thing's face and body is forever burned in my memory, permanently. Right after this experience, I tried to read up on some Bigfoot sightings here in Utah and found there were quite a few. If you check any maps for reported Bigfoot sightings, you'll find that sure enough, a Big Cottonwood Canyon are plentiful of them. I was out bow hunting in southern Utah just a few years back with my brother. We were walking through a meadow that was bordered by a thicket of trees. We had just walked around the edge of the meadow and were about to enter the woods when we heard something large flying overhead. It was huge. We both stopped and looked up, but we couldn't see what it was. It was too dark. It sounded like a cross between a bat and a bird and it had wings the size of a human's arms. It flew off, and we never saw it again. After doing some research, I found out that this large bat-winged cryptid could be the giant screech owl. They have a wingspan of about six feet and can take prey up to the size of a skunk or raccoon. They are typically nocturnal and prefer woodlands, so it is possible that this eyewitness sighting was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. However... I thought you might find this information interesting. After all, Utah is full of weird things, cryptids and entities and a lot of paranormal activity. I have never seen anything anywhere else like it. If I ever saw it again, I'd be too scared to do anything about it. I wouldn't even know what to do. You hear the stories about people being abducted by aliens and especially out here, which are probably just interdimensional beings who could pass through solid objects and enter in and out of our world. Nobody really knows for sure, but giant bats? I believe that's what that thing was, and not a screech owl. People here have seen them quite a bit. They're very secretive and keep to themselves most of the time. There's so much hunting going on sometimes that my brother was also in an area known as Goblin Valley State Park, and he himself saw one fly over him at around 1 o'clock in the morning. This was back in 2009. He said it looked something like out of Lord of the Rings. They usually move around at night, so they could really blend in if they want to. It's possible there could only be one living right under your nose, and you wouldn't even know it. They too might be interdimensional. Not too sure. My friend also said he wasn't hunting in the dark anymore after seeing this thing fly over him at night. He didn't tell me what happened to his brother, though, during his Goblin Valley sighting. But now, I guess I know why he stopped hunting by himself at night. I think these are things just flying around here, watching us all the time. Nobody really knows who or what they are. It's really creepy. I also have a lot of personal experiences with these kinds of things. A lot of my friends and family who I've worked on investigations with all have had some kind of encounter with a strange bat-like cryptid. They're here. We just can't figure out why. I'm 23 and 6'3", weighing around 215 pounds. When I was 12, this is when my story would happen. My family were on vacation in the Cottonwood Heights area of Utah, between Salt Lake City and Big Cottonwood Canyon, the canyon that is home to the Albion Basin Ski Resort. We were walking up a dirt road towards the mountain we planned to go hiking. The time was early in the evening, maybe even dusk. It was still light out, but there weren't many cars on the road at the time, and the sky was beginning to change. As we're walking up this dirt road, my mother, father, brothers, and me, I saw what looked like an ape man running across in front of us. I remember feeling terrified and thinking this thing was going to attack us. It was running on two legs and was covered in dark hair. After it disappeared, it jumped up on a boulder 
and then disappeared a second time into the woods on the other side. It was definitely not anything human-like, and I remember being terrified after seeing it. Somehow, my family's lucky. They did not see it. They were a few steps behind me, so I could not point it out to them. I didn't think much of it at the time. We explored for a few more hours and never saw anything else like that. Also, about two years ago, again, I'm 23 now, I had this other experience. My buddy and I were driving a big Cottonwood Canyon road in his car. This time, it was dark outside. We were just looking at all the houses. When we got about halfway up, my friend said, Hey man, check it out. As he pointed ahead on the road, in front of us, where there is a turnoff from the main road, there was this figure standing next to one of those orange cones blocking off access to another dirt road. The man appeared to be completely naked and covered in hair. He looked almost identical to the creature I saw when I was 12. He had to at least be around 8 feet tall. He didn't move, just stood there next to the cone, looking down the direction of the road where we were driving. My friend then slammed on the gas of his car and got out of there as fast as possible. Once again, neither my friend nor I knew what it was, but I know what it wasn't. It was not human. It's also important to note that Big Cottonwood Canyon Road hosts some rather infamous activity. There have been several other reports of maulings by an unidentified animal, strange UFO sightings near Brighton Ski Resort, encounters with Bigfoot-like creatures all throughout Salt Lake Valley, and most notably, the Draper case, a series of events in which an interdimensional being stalked and terrorized a family for months. While it is difficult to say what this creature may have been, the description of the man as seen are very similar to other reports of entities encountered all over the state of Utah. It is possible that this is a warning sign from whatever beings are behind these strange encounters. Whatever the case may be, it is clear something is happening in Utah, and we are yet to understand. I've studied cryptids and the paranormal since I was young. Although, while I've never seen a Bigfoot, at least from what I know, I'm an experienced outdoorsman. I've spent a lot of time in the canyons and high deserts around Kanab. About a month ago, on a Saturday morning, my wife and I were driving to church. We turned off of Highway 89 onto a dirt road. This leads to some BLM land near Canyon Lands National Park about a fourth mile down the road, and we saw something flying over low, over the desert floor. It was big, much bigger than any bird I've ever seen. The wingspan had to have at least been 20 to 25 feet, easily. It was dark brown, or pale. It also had a long tail, with a sort of spade at the end. It was flying erratically, almost as if it were drunk. We watched it for a few seconds until it disappeared, behind a rock face. Now, I know what I saw, and there's no way it was a bird. I'm convinced that what I saw was a form of a pterosaur. I also know about some other pterosaur sightings that have happened right around the Great Salt Lake. I'm not exactly saying that's what I saw, but it's definitely strange and there have been other sightings in the area. After doing some research of my own, I have found several other eyewitness accounts of what people are calling living pterodactyls. It's possible that these creatures are surviving pterosaurs. I've even spoken to a paleontologist at the University of Utah about what I saw. His hypothesis is that it was most likely a young condor or something like that. I guess he would be the expert, but I know what condors look like. This did not look like that. If you've ever seen Jurassic Park, I mean, this looked like it flew right out of the movie. The thing I'm interested in now is why all the sightings have seemed to be located around large bodies of water. The Great Salt Lake and Canyon Lands National Park. Maybe they use lakes for drinking. I'm not sure. This area alone has seen a recent increase in the number of cryptid sightings. I think it's important that we investigate these creatures and find out what they are and why they are here. Let's also not forget about all the UFO activity that has been going on around the Great Salt Lake. Could there be a possible connection in any way? 
44 years old, ex-military, ex-law enforcement. I've seen a lot of things in my life and don't scare easily. I was raised around guns and hunting. I now live in the country, on five acres. So this takes us back a while. I was deer hunting about 18 miles north of Fairview, Utah, up on the mountain near South Tent Mountain. When I saw what I thought was a large man walking through thick woods, about 70 plus yards away from me. As I watched it walk across an open area, it became very clear and apparent this was not a man. This creature was at least eight feet tall and covered in hair. It had a very white chest and its arms hung down to its knees. It was also very muscular. I immediately became very afraid and began to back away from the area. I watched it walk into the woods on the other side of the open area and disappear. Then it did something very strange. About five minutes later, it walked back out of the woods into the open area again, and this time, it was only about 50 yards away from me. I could see its face very clearly, due to the lighting. Its face was very human-like, but the eyes were solid black, and there was no nose or mouth that I could discernibly see. It could be just because of the skin tone. It stood there, looking over in my direction for a few seconds, but I don't know if it saw me or not, because I was in full camouflage. It turned around and walked back into the woods. I'm not totally sure what I saw, but it was definitely not any animal I've ever seen before. I am 100% certain that what it was was no man in a costume or anything like that. I'm still very shaken up by what I saw. I mean, after all, this was right around 9,000 feet elevation. For somebody to be up here, prancing around the woods in a Bigfoot costume, would not make any sense. Friends of mine have told me, too, they've heard strange calls up that mountain from time to time. But no one in our circle of friends has ever been up there. It's a very, very remote area. I've talked to a few people, too, who live in the general area. And they confirmed there are strange things going on up there near South Tent Mountain. One man I talked to said he also saw a group of ape-like creatures walking behind his yard about 15 years ago. This same man has also seen several large black bear near his property and several deer. If these creatures do indeed hunt deer like bear do, it would make sense that these creatures would follow the food supply. I was out hiking with my family in the foothills of the Wasatch Mountains, east of Salt Lake City. The hiking trail is a relatively easy one with a moderate incline. It leads to an overlook of a reservoir and a vista of Mount Timpanogos in the distance. The hike starts at Aspen Grove, which is an alpine forest with over 20 miles of trails that connects to the city to mountain summits. It takes roughly four hours to complete the entire 16-mile round-trip hike. The trail also runs along the Provo River and has large open meadows with wildflower and season for about four miles until it reaches the southwestern slope of Mount Tipinogus where you would go up steep switchbacks through dense second-growth forest to its summit. We had been overdue for a family hike and we were headed up for a hike up Mount Tipinogus. The trails in the area are also very popular, and we hadn't surprisingly seen anybody else at all on the trail since we'd begun. We were only about a mile in from the trailhead when we saw something large moving in the distance. At first, we all thought it was an exceptionally large coyote, but then it did something that startled all of us. It stood up. I could see now that it was larger than any coyote had ever seen and this thing was now definitely not a coyote. This creature looked a little bit different. It had a long snout, very large pointed ears. It actually kind of reminded me more of a hyena than it did a coyote. It was also covered in gray and red fur and kind of had more hunched over posture, like it was carrying a lot of its weight awkwardly. Its eyes were also glowing a faint red, and I knew right away upon seeing this thing there was nothing natural about it. And instantly, my family and I understood we were in danger. 
The thing just stood there staring at us for a few seconds before finally turning and disappearing. I felt like it was studying us, like it knew who we were and what we were doing there. It gave me the creeps. I've been hiking the Wasatch Mountains my whole life, and this was a first. I'm not sure what it was, but it still gives me the chills when I think about it. I've also reported my sighting to the local authorities. They just told me I probably saw a bear. Figures. I know it was not a bear. There was a feeling of utter terror that had taken hold of me. I knew that I was in danger, and it made sense to be afraid of the creature. The creature was taking advantage of my vulnerability. That day, I saw a large, furry, unknown bipedal humanoid. I don't know what it was. I like to consider myself a rational, sensible investigator. I'm not quick to draw conclusions about the paranormal or supernatural, but I attempt to keep an open mind. When I was around six, I knew not what fear was, nor did it scare me. I used to run around my house at night with a blanket over my head, screaming like a banshee. And my parents could do nothing but let me get it out of my system. As time went on for about a couple more years, I would have moments where I would think somebody was watching me. This continued happening more and more, often, until one day, when right near our backyard, which was full of trees that bordered an area with woods behind them, while walking back to the house from our hay barn, I heard footsteps walking beside me. I turned, quickly thinking it was maybe my dad trying to play a prank on me, since he's like that, and I saw this hideous face, this figure. It looked kind of like a goat, but more human at the same time. Its horns on its head were very much like a ram's, except twisted and spiraled and pointed upward and backwards. Its eyes glowed this ominous orange, and it appeared to have a very angry look on its face. Angry, like I caught it. I'll tell you what, I can never forget the bad vibes that washed over my entire body. It was like something bad was about to happen to me if I did not get out of there. It's been a long time, after that experience, and I still feel like those memories are just as vivid as ever. And it affected me so much, I had to sleep with the lights on, in my room, until I was almost 18. It was that traumatic, and I wish to never relive anything like this ever again. My name's Darren. I'm 25, 5'8", and 160 pounds, clean cut. I do not drink or do any drugs, not even smoke cigarettes. I'm very outgoing and also very open-minded to all possibilities. This event happened in 2009, during July on a Thursday night, at around 10 p.m. It had been raining earlier that day, so everything was still wet but dried up quickly due to the hot weather months we have in the state of Utah. This particular area that I was in has no sidewalks, just grass. Now, I can't remember exactly what brought me outside that night, but... I've always loved being outdoors, no matter what time it is. It was a clear night. No clouds and the moon gave light to everything. I could see for miles into the distance because it was so dark, without any lights. Only the moonlight. I walked into my backyard when is where this happened, thinking there might be deer out since it's their mating season. And deer are everywhere in these parts. And I reached about halfway through my yard, it's not super big to begin with, and something caught my attention towards the edge of our backyard fence, to the right. Upon looking at what appeared to be a black silhouette of something moving around, just beyond our fence line, I noticed that it had an abnormally long slender neck, kind of like a swan's but curving inward slightly to give it more of a snout-like appearance. It appeared to be sticking its neck to the ground, but I could only see its head and part of its body. It was very dark out there. No real light sources other than the moon, so it was hard for me to make out any colors besides its dark shade of black, which made it blend in quite a bit with everything else around it. If it had not moved when I looked at it, I probably would not have seen anything at all. 
I felt uneasy because this thing was right behind our fence line, picking around in our yard, looking for something. So, now, I'm beginning to panic a little bit, thinking that this animal is potentially a Bigfoot, or was. But in that moment, even though I was scared, I decided to see if I could creep a little bit closer, which I did. And when I got about 20 feet from it, it quickly stopped, stood up on two legs, and stared at me right in the face, and then just swiftly disappeared. There's a large open field behind our house, and that's where it went off to. It was definitely not anything like I'd ever seen before in my life. I'm not sure what else to call it, other than a cryptid. I've never told anybody this story because, well, I'm embarrassed about running away like a little girl. But maybe somebody with a similar experience knows what it was. I'll be taking this story to the proper paranormal authorities, filing a report soon. When my grandfather was 22, he traveled to Utah with his brother and sister. They were living in Nampa at the time. While they were traveling through the state of Utah, they were near Goblin Valley when they spotted a tall, apish-like creature that was covered in black, thick fur, heading into an area where a cavern was. The three of them decided to follow after it. As my grandfather began crawling into the cavern, he see these two red eyes staring back at him. When he made eye contact with whatever it was inside, the being screamed at him before getting up on its feet and running towards him, nearly taking my grandfather out. His story has never changed once and has been the same every time he tells it. I researched this and found something similar to what my grandfather saw. He claims that whatever it was had human-like features except for the face and body, which were more ape-like in his opinion, but claimed the face was hideous looking and very deformed. I'm not 100% sure if this is a cryptid or paranormal based on his story, of course, and unfortunately, he passed away three years ago and never told anybody else this story. In fact, the only reason he ever shared the story with me is because he's known that I've been obsessed with the paranormal and all things strange. It would be great if I could research this more thoroughly. I wonder if it was a cryptid or possibly just a figment of his imagination. Either way, it makes for an interesting story. And for his time when he was younger, I don't think he's lying. There's no reason and way he could have made up something so horrific and strange. The whole concept of Bigfoot was not even around when he was 22. I am an atheist, or at least I thought I was before all of this. If anything, I'm very skeptical of anything paranormal. I have never seen a ghost, nor do I believe in them. I have, however, had several experiences that have left me completely baffled and cannot be explained by easy means. This story is one of those experiences. For you see, a little over 10 years ago, when I was still in high school, my family and I moved from a small town in northern Utah to a suburb of Salt Lake City. We had bought a new house on a large lot at the end of a cul-de-sac. My father had his first real big breakthrough in real estate, and so we wanted to put the money towards a nice house. The first few months we lived there were uneventful at best. However, about three or four months after moving in, my younger brother, who was about eight or nine at the time, would come running into our room right around midnight, hysterical, claiming that this monster was right outside of his room and going to take him. The first time, I immediately ran into my parents' room where I found them very upset as well. Apparently, my brother had been screaming so loud the entire house had been shaken awake. When he calmed down enough, though, here's what he told us had happened. My brother would say that he woke up for no apparent reason in the middle of the night, and for some strange reason, he had this inkling in him to look towards his bedroom window, which is right next to his bed. It's a very small room with barely enough space for a bed and a dresser, let alone a window. Anyway, when he looked out the window, he saw something standing at the end of our cul-de-sac. He described it as a monster, 
and said it had huge, glowing eyes, long, gangly hands and claws, just standing there, looking right at him. He said the fear paralyzed him, and he could not move. The only thing he could do was scream for help. And finally, after what felt like an eternity, the monster turned and disappeared into thin air. My parents immediately contacted the police, who did come to our house and did search around a bit, but they didn't really find much of anything. We also had a few people come over to check out the house, see if they could find any explanation for what my brother saw. But again, nothing was found. This experience has haunted me for years, and I've never been able to explain it. We leave that house today, and have been living in a different home for the last seven years. My brother insists this was not a dream or his imagination. He swears up and down he saw that monster looking back at him from the cul-de-sac on that night. And this has not been the first night or only night this has happened. This has been kind of a reoccurring nightmare over and over. And I say nightmare metaphorically. We've tried to do some research and can't really turn out much. I've tried to research this before, but never found out anybody else who has ever reported anything quite like this. It's almost as if this has happened in a completely different universe or something. I did find, though, that there is something called a cryptid, and it's called a skinwalker, and it's also rumored to live all over the southwestern portion of the United States. I have no idea if this could be what my brother saw or not, but it's the only thing I can think of. It was winter of 1996. I had just finished my master's degree and was traveling through the southwestern portion of the United States, specifically through Utah. I was going to complete the research for my doctoral dissertation. I had been visiting mainly Native American reservations over the course of a few months. The last reservation I visited after returning to Salt Lake City, Utah, was the Ute Mountain Reservation. I was staying at one of the main tribal buildings with a number of other people who were visiting for various reasons. It was later in the evening when one of them had asked me if I wanted to go for a walk around an outdoor courtyard that he had used as his meditation space. He said it would be part of my welcome to this place if I went with him. He felt I needed to be a part of the energy that was present there. So, we walked around, and he talked about how it had become his place for meditation due to the energy he felt there. While we were walking, one of my friends who was standing on a porch nearby watched us, called out to me. She said that she could see some people coming up over the hillside where I'd parked my car earlier in the day. They were carrying something large between them, like a stretcher or a longboard. It looked like they might have been trouble carrying whatever it was where they were moving towards this main part of the building. It wasn't too far away from us, maybe 200 yards at most. So, we began walking in that direction, just casually talking, and my attention was really brought over there. Well, as we got closer, I could see that they were carrying indeed something that wasn't human. It was a large black creature. It was completely still and lying there. Those people who were carrying it were natives, and they looked terrified. As we got closer, I could see that the creature's body was completely covered in thick hair and limp. I don't remember anything else after that. I passed out from the shock of seeing something like that when I woke up. When I woke, I was inside and my friends were surrounding me, asking me if I was okay. They told me later that the creature had been killed by the tribal members who found it and they'd brought it back to the main building. They were frightened. They had never seen anything like it themselves. I have no idea what it was, but it's something that still haunts me to this day. I can't help but think about what it might have happened if I had gone for that walk with the other person. I might not be here now. I mean, what if that creature ended up killing me? So many things about that whole sighting still baffle me. I may never know what really happened, but that experience has changed my life in ways that I can never imagine. Not so much in a traumatic sense, but in a way where it really showed me there are more things and creatures out there than we could ever imagine. My husband works construction, so the weekends are really the only time he gets off, 
and when he does, he's exhausted. So my husband and I decided to take a little trip out of state. As my husband and I were driving out in the country one evening, right about 11.10 to be exact, I remember it because I had just looked at the clock. We saw this fast, dark animal crossing the road ahead of us. I'll say this confidently. It was far too big to be a deer or a coyote, and yet too small to be a bear. Maybe not too small, but the proportions did not look right. We both felt an immediate sense of fear, though, when looking upon this thing. While I cannot be confirmed that what I saw this night is, in fact, anything other than perhaps a small bear or maybe a really large buck, I can confidently say that we felt an immediate sense of fear and dread. I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, and while I was living in Orem, which is south, my friend and I went out after midnight to help him look for his lost cat. A quick note, my friend, whom we'll call Richard, is very, very attached to this cat. They've grown up together, and him losing this cat was devastating. Being the good person that I am, I couldn't just help but, you know, leave him there. Not without his cat. So, I decided to go and help him. This is where we found ourselves in the Orm City Cemetery. For those that don't know, it's a rather huge graveyard, filled with many trees, monuments, and, well, graves. As we walked around, looking into every dark crevice and space between the street and light, I heard something rustling in one of the bushes just ahead of us. My friend and I were startled when we saw this very large, very dark figure standing on two legs, further, next to a headstone just about 20 feet away. It was hard to make out features because it was so dark, and at first, I assumed it was a homeless man, but that notion was immediately dismissed when we could both see just how big this thing was. We both just stood there, staring at each other for what felt like an eternity. And in fact, I wanted to ask you guys, have you ever seen the movie, The Fog? I can't remember who it's directed by or any of that, but I believe it came out in the 70s or 80s. Anyway, if you've seen it, you'll know what I'm talking about. However, there's a time in that movie where the fog rolls in and these ghastly black figures come out of the fog. They're just these black haunting silhouettes with red shining eyes. That's exactly what this looked like, except the black silhouette wasn't as defined not like where you could tell it was a person, like in the movie, but just this large, hairy thing. But the red eyes were spot on, just like in that movie. It slowly kind of lurched its body and moved over to the left, walking off casually. As terrified as me and my friend were, we bolted out of there, not wasting another second. Now, I've heard stories from around there as well. And in fact... One of my family members just so happens to be friends with somebody that patrols that graveyard at night. Imagine that. And he's told me stories too about seeing strange apparitions and strange dark figures. I don't know if any of these have any connections to what we saw, but I can say that whatever we saw was terrifying. One other thing. I know that Utah State is very enriched in paranormal. In fact, the whole southwestern section of the United States is a lot of lost mining communities. Then you have the whole LDS, and that's a whole other ball game. And don't forget, among the many, bloody battles and wars that happened here between settlers and natives, and all the cults that come out here as well. It's a place with a lot of dark energy surrounding it. I wouldn't be surprised if all the evil spirits feed off all of this dark, bad energy. Oh, and one last thing. My friend eventually found his cat. Yeah, it was actually right around his house, even though his house is right around the cemetery, and that's the last place he saw his cat go, so maybe his cat was lucky and did not end up running into whatever that thing we saw was. Thank goodness. Okay, I've had some pretty strange stuff happen to me. Let me tell you about it. So, first and foremost, I'm from Utah, and one evening, I was driving home from work, and I went around a curve in a very rural road. Now, it should be known that I take this road very often. I try and take it as much as I can to avoid all the midnight traffic. 
The midnight part is a joke, of course. But, I will say, the evening traffic is quite unpleasant, and I try to avoid it as much as I can. I have driven this rural road many times, and have never had an issue, until this one time. So, I came around a very tight curve in the road, and I saw something coming up to the road. As my headlights illuminated more of the area around me, I could see that it was simply a deer. Innocent. Now, as soon as this deer got up to the middle portion of the road, things changed. I slowed down, expecting the deer to fall on bolts in front of my car. But instead, it stops, turns to stare at me, and its eyes were bright red. I remember I said something probably not appropriate. And I swear to you, this deer, I'm assuming that's what it was, made this expression, almost like a scowl. I have never in my life imagined that a deer could make such an expression before, at all. In fact, it was strange and frightening. That's when I slammed my foot on the brakes, unsure of what to expect. And this deer it kind of wiggled its entire body and stood up on two legs before falling back down again on all fours and running off at about 11 o'clock. And I just sat there with my foot firmly pressed on the brake, unsure of how to approach forward. I wasn't exactly sure what just happened or what I'd just seen. In fact, I could not even process what had just occurred. I thought to myself, was I dreaming or having some sort of crazy nightmare? I mean, this sort of thing doesn't just happen casually. This was something out of another world, out of a nightmare. And while I was terrified and very, very much so creeped out, I can't help but feel that there was something dark behind what I saw. That maybe what I saw was not just a deer, but something else. I'm not trying to allude to the thought that monsters exist, but come on, how do you explain this one? I've grown up and heard all sorts of creepy stuff about Utah and all the things that happen around here. So I ask you, what do you think it could be? Was this a supposed skinwalker? Possibly a shapeshifter? Or did I somehow just imagine the whole thing? And perhaps I'm crazy. Perhaps I just imagined it all. But I just don't see that being possible. I'm not one to make up stories and I have nothing to gain from sharing this. In fact, I don't even want my credentials out there. This is really just a memory that I'm hoping I'll forget, but I don't think that I ever will. I was cleaning up the living room and had just finished putting away the last dishes of Thanksgiving dinner when my brother came running in. Hey, you two, we're going to play a game. You can watch if you want. I raised an eyebrow at him and turned and ran back out of the room. My parents were sitting across from each other, reading their own books. He seemed excited about whatever game he was playing with his sister, which probably meant it would be a good one. Giving them a quick glance, I shrugged and followed my brother outside. Dad, I called out as I walked up to him. We're going to go play football. Do you want to come and watch? He looked up from his book and smiled. I would love to. He said as he got up from the chair and began walking towards me. I turned around and walked back inside. I heard him exclaim as we got closer to the door. My excitement faded when I saw my mom look up from her book, giving us a frozen stare. I felt my stomach drop as the words left her mouth. I'm going to go lie down for a few moments, she had said in a shaky voice. She got up from her chair and began walking towards the hall that leads to one of the bedrooms. I couldn't stand there in silence. We walked over to the field behind the house. I was about to ask if she wanted to come watch when I heard a faint noise from inside the house. I glanced at my mother and then back towards the house. But she didn't seem to be reacting to anything. So I looked back at her and asked her what the clear noise was. She said it's nothing and began walking faster. At this point, she was acting very, very strange. I wanted to press her about the noise, but did not want us getting distracted from our walk. So I let it go, and we just continued to enjoy ourselves. As soon as we got back home, we saw my mother sitting in the chair reading her book. She looked up at us with a smile. Football, I replied bluntly, after she had asked us what game we played. 
At this point, she was acting increasingly strange, saying weird things, doing weird things, and just acting out of the ordinary. At one point or another, I could have swore that I saw her eyes roll in the back of her head and come back black, like all black. No iris, nothing. But only for a second before she blinked and looked at me, smiling, and saying, What's wrong, honey? She would also proceed and make strange comments about the house, talk about what's up in the attic, talk about strange noises, just weird stuff. After about a 45-minute game of football, my dad, my brother, and I all decided to come in and lay down on the couch. That turkey and mashed potatoes were now needing to digest properly, and I think we overdid it playing football. My mom would come out and say more weird stuff, even to the point where my dad would ask her, Honey, are you feeling okay? And she would just always respond with a resounding smile, turning and walking almost fidgetly back to the room, like she was a robot, very awkwardly moving. My dad was convinced she had taken some sort of medication or something. That was before she dropped on the floor convulsing, eyes rolling in the back of her head and coming back fully black. And that, in that moment, we knew something was seriously wrong with her. But she wasn't behaving the way a typical person does when they have a stroke or have some sort of seizure. She was smiling, very creepily, and laughing, all in a voice that wasn't her own, while her eyes were stark black, like an eight ball. I felt like we were reliving something from the Evil Dead movies. After a couple moments of this going on, we got her to calm down, and when she would close her eyes, her eyes would go back to normal. That's when we really began hearing banging and loud crashing sounds in the attic. Somebody was up there. My dad demanded that we take care of our mother, put her in the bed, and maybe put her to bed for rest. My father was going to go inspect what was in the attic. He goes over to the hallway, pulls down the string, the ladder comes down. He grabs a large knife, grabs a flashlight, and slowly ascends the ladder. Step by step, he climbs. He gets to the point where now he can now barely poke his head above the attic floor, and he's now scanning the entire surrounding, but he also hears pitter pattering, like something running or moving. After shining the light, he doesn't really see much, but notices that a portion of the attic one of the corners in which he's shining a light in is so black that the light will not pierce through it. Unlike the other portions of the attic, which the light can clearly illuminate, he gets a really, really bad feeling. He immediately turns off the light, drops down the ladder, faster than I've ever seen the man move, and slams the attic shut. He's pale, and he looks right at me and my brother and tells us, we need to call a priest. And I start looking back at my mom and back at him saying, what are you talking about? What's going on? He tells me to shut up, and he does not want any arguments. Not now, not ever. He grabs the phone and begins dialing a number. I don't know who he's talking to or who he's calling, but he kind of steps out of the room. I could hear his conversation, but only ever so faintly. He's trying purposefully to keep his voice down, and he sounds very panicked and nervous in his tone of voice. I tried my best to eavesdrop while my brother, carefully, very carefully, watched over our very sick and possessed mom. My dad walked into the kitchen, while still on the phone, and then sat outside, talking for quite a while with whoever this person was. I heard him hang up, and then, out of nowhere, he pulls out a cigarette and starts smoking. Quick side note here. My dad used to be a huge smoker, for a long time, but gave it up about seven or eight years before this happened. He's only smoked a handful of times since then, and it's only when he's extremely stressed out. So I see him start shaking and lighting up a cigarette. I step out to ask him, Dad, are you okay? Is Mom going to be okay? And he doesn't really say anything. He's just staring off into the night while puffing on the cigarette. And without even making eye contact, just tells me. A priest should be here within the hour. I need you right now to go spend the rest of the time with your mother until he comes. 
I knew not to ask my dad questions, so I closed the door and walked back to where my mother was, spending that time with her. Ultimately, unsure of what was going on, but I knew that was irrelevant in that point in time. I just needed to be with my mom. I think she had been sleeping this whole time, but I'm not sure. Either that or resting. Once the priest had shown up, there were some short pleasantries exchanged and some little bits of conversation that I missed. But once I went to shake his hand, he seemed very monotone. And in fact, there did not seem to be much conversation at all exchanged between my father and him. Almost like they knew what needed to be done. They talked outside for quite a while before he came in and blessed the house. Then, he also went into my mom's room and spoke with her for a long time. The door was shut, and my brother and I were not allowed in. We had to sit back, pacing back and forth, wondering what was going on. At random points throughout the entire 45-plus minutes he was there, with the door closed, we could hear her at various points screaming and saying, No, get out of me. You're not allowed here. And then hearing this maniacal laughter coming from a different voice within her that was not hers. At other random points, too, we would hear banging and crashing up in the attic, as if somebody dropped an entire stack of books over and over. To say my brother and I were petrified would be a massive understatement. But there was nothing we could do. We sat on the couch in the living room, talked about what we thought was going on, and gave much speculation to the whole idea of ghosts and my mom being possessed. Which, by the way, we still believe. Even all these years after. Maybe an hour, maybe a little more, the priest came out with him and my father talking quietly. They said their goodbyes and the priest left. My father looked at me, then my brother, and kind of gave a kindful nod, and then looked down at the floor, before saying, Your mother's very sick. She needs as much rest as she can right now. I don't want you guys bothering her until I say so. Do you understand? We nodded and agreed. He told us it was about time for bed. It was maybe... 8.30 p.m. at this point, so we did our routine, brushed our teeth, got our pajamas on, and went and laid down. But as we're laying there in our bunk beds, we could hear something going on upstairs in the attic. Things were getting more crazy. At this point in the night, my father was already laying down with my mother, and their door was shut. I heard no sounds from my mom, but people were very much so in the attic, or so it sounded. It was creepy. It kept my brother and I up almost all night. We were scared to sleep. We didn't know what was going to go on. At several points, I could have sworn that I heard the attic door come down. But from my point of view where I'm out of my bed, I have full view and nothing ever came down. At least that I'm aware of. That night was easily the most terrifying. There were a couple times that I probably doze off for short intermittent periods of time. And one point in the night, I woke up to my brother saying in his sleep, It's in the house. It's in the house. It's in our room. Which literally sent shivers down my entire body. And I had two comforters on me. As if I already wasn't cold enough. But what was even more strange is my parents' complete denial of any of this ever going on. As days would pass at this point, my father refused to talk about it or acknowledge any of the things that went on that Thanksgiving evening. And my mom just acted like everything was okay. She still said and did things that were out of character, but not to the extent that it was that Thanksgiving evening after dinner. We would also still hear noises in the attic that went on for quite a while. I want to say months if I'm remembering correctly. All the way up into the following summer or fall. Not as crazy as that night, but... It's definitely interesting to think about. Also, I should include that this all happened on Thanksgiving of 1995. Now, my father passed away back in 2017, and shortly before he died, my brother and I finally got him to open up about it. And while he did not say much, he told me that he believes there were two demons in that house. One, which was sighted up in the attic, which is what he saw hence the black shape or shadow that was covering part of the attic wall, and the other took possession of our mother. After a few months, he claims it got bored and left her body, but I don't know if that's how demons work. 
My mother passed away in 2019, only two years after my father. All of these experiences has left me with far more questions than any answers. For this story, we have to go back to the year 2015. We were camping up in Connecticut with my grandparents for a family vacation. We wanted to do something different than the typical camping trip, so we decided to go into some wooded areas. Imagine my surprise when I saw this creature for the first time. Before I get to that, things started off as normal. It was a beautiful day in June, and we were all very excited for a long weekend of camping. We drove up to the campgrounds and set everything up. Everything was going well. We started roasting marshmallows over the fire and laughing. The weather was perfect, and we even got to see a deer eat some food. Right there, in front of us. It was amazing. However, nothing could have prepared myself or my family for what happened that day. After s'mores were over, everyone was pretty tired. My grandfather told me that I should get to bed early because there would be lots more activities the next day. I had no problem agreeing with him, and I quickly changed into my pajamas. I walked back to the tent that me and my mother would share. I was extremely tired, but not too tired to fall asleep. All of the little noises that you'll hear in the woods sometimes didn't faze me. Even though I was new to the sounds, they did not bother me like they should have. I had the comfort of my grandparents nearby, and I felt safe. The night itself was calm. I'll never forget the enjoyment that I found there. I quickly fell asleep. The next day, things were pretty normal, until that afternoon. I got up, and we chugged down hordes of coffee and ate a big breakfast. Eggs, hash browns, sausage, bacon, all wrapped together in a delicious burrito, cooked over the fire. It was exactly as delicious as you can imagine it. The first trail we went on did not show much signs of foot traffic, although I did see a very large spider. It was about the size of my thumb, but it wasn't hairy or brown. It was mostly black and had an orange stripe going down its back. I paused for a second to take a picture with my phone, and I went back to the group. We walked down that trail for about half an hour, and then we decided to head off onto another trail. Just as we were getting ready to walk into the woods, we all noticed a ton of broken branches on the trail. We looked at each other, not knowing what could have caused this breakage. The branches that were all broken from at least six feet up to around ten feet up on the trees. My grandfather started to lead us off the trail into a small opening of trees. As we walked a little ways through, my uncle noticed something lying on the ground next to a tree. He brought it to my grandfather's attention, who then handed me his canteen so I could take a look for myself. What I saw was truly shocking and confusing. It was the head of a deer, or what was left of it. By the looks of it, the deer had been ripped off its body. It was just lying there on the ground. We all stood there in disbelief. I was about to ask my grandfather what he thought or speculated happened when I looked at the bottom of the tree that the head was resting under. The ground had been dug up, and around that area were large claw marks etched into the dirt. They were long scratches, almost like something slid along them with its claws out, leaving deep grooves in the dirt. My grandfather walked right up to the head, placing his hand over it, motioning for everybody to stop talking. He then let out a long whistle that startled me, but I could see why he did it. He was signaling us to be quiet. He had heard something in the quiet of the forest. Everything was still. In that moment, we could hear movement coming in our direction. We all look in unison as we can now faintly make out a large shape, tall, big, coming in our direction. Superstitious about the area already, our group of four took off without taking too much time to take in its appearance. But, as it approached closer, I could see it for what it was. 
It was walking on two thin hind legs, covered in shoulder-length black fur. It had a long snout and an unusually large mouth that seemed to be full of sharp teeth. That's not the only thing I remember about it. Its eyes sparkled like they were made from glass marbles. After taking off into the woods, I turned around one final time to see this creature staring at me. What happens next really scared me. I saw its mouth moving as if it were trying to speak. It made a grunt sound, echoing through the forest, followed by almost a whimper noise. Everything went dark, and when I finally came back to my senses, we were all in the car. My brother was driving us away. He told me he thought I fainted, but something tells me it may have been caused by what I just saw. It felt like I blacked out when I heard that low grunt coming from behind me. And when I came to, we were in the car on our way out. I do remember that we never went back to that location ever again. Weird things have been going on here in Yellowstone. A hiker died here about two months back. We were called out to check out his campsite with the ranger that found him. It was not a bear attack. Nobody has seen anything like it before. It's like he was impaled, actually. And we got to talking to one of the people that had saw him before this happened. Here is their story. I was camping with my friends at Yellowstone National Park when I had heard a loud bang behind me. I turned around and saw nothing, but it sounded like wood striking wood. I continued doing whatever it was that I was doing, probably messing with the campfire, stoking it or putting more wood on. A couple of moments pass, and before I knew what had happened, my chest felt like it was on fire, and I fell unconscious. But when I woke up again, there were two rangers standing over me, asking if I was okay. Apparently, a man close by, the one that I had told them about, had been impaled. I can't remember anything else about that night, except feeling like I too had something stabbed into my chest, although nothing. We didn't see anything unusual, but the neighbors next to me also talked about seeing a strange, dark, shadowy figure standing at the edge of the clearing while we were actually showing up to camp. They didn't say anything because they didn't want to spook us. The ranger said he had not seen anything, but stood by our story because he wasn't working that day, so there was no way he could have known about what had happened. It's a weird place, I'll tell you that much. Well, the very next day, we were going on a hike through one of the trails in Yellowstone, passed by some rangers who wanted to speak to us about the event. They said they needed our help because somebody had died the night before, only miles away from where our campsite was at. This was separate than the man who was impaled, but it sounded like something similar had happened nearby, and these rangers wanted to take us there to see if we had known anything about it. Anyway, that's their story. I'm a ranger, and my partner Sarah and I decided it would be best if we went to investigate ourselves into these things. We also got called out to an area because of a group of separate hikers that said they saw something and we wanted to check it out. The area that we went to was actually pretty close to where the other rangers were at. I think this is what freaked them out about us going there alone. When we got there, we found a different place than we had expected. Somebody must have started a fire, among other things. There was an old fire ring, and a strange pile of rocks stacked in the middle of this clearing. We also began feeling an ominous feeling, but we decided to push in farther. When I was patrolling the outskirts of Yellowstone National Park, something startling and unexplainable happened. My partner Sarah and I were walking through the dense forest when we heard a loud bang behind us. It sounded like a tree falling. We turned to see what was going on and saw nothing. So, as we continued walking, we could tell that something wasn't quite right. We kept getting this little bounce of immense dread, but could not pinpoint what it was we were feeling. Then, all of a sudden, we felt very warm, and the hairs on our necks standing up. Someone or something was watching us, 
We both spun around and this time could clearly identify two glowing red eyes staring at us from behind a bush about 10 feet away. The creature walked out from behind the bush and I was able to see it in its entirety. This being had incredibly thick, dark hair all over its body, except for his face, which appeared human-like, but more Neanderthal. He walked on two legs, just like that of a man, and the most striking feature of this humanoid was its incredible height and size, which easily reached above eight feet. As I've stated, it looked more Neanderthal, with very similar bone structure and prominent brows. Its cheekbones were also very pronounced and its eyes reminded me very much of an owl. It came towards us, and we quickly realized we had to get out of here. We ran back towards our vehicle, while we kept looking over our shoulder every step of the way. As we drove away, we could see the being now standing there at the edge of the clearing, still watching us as we had driven away. We got to the point where we could not see it anymore, but worried it was going to follow us. We were freaked out, and so much so, we kind of lost all sense of direction. We made it out and came back to the ranger station, where we told them our story, asked if anybody else had reported any strange sightings as of late. They said a group of hikers, like what I described to you in the beginning of the story, had seen a tall, dark creature roaming in the woods nearby. But this was about two months ago, and no reports were ever followed up with. They gave us directions back to the main road, where the sightings had apparently happened. Anyway, I'll never forget what happened in Yellowstone. What we saw. What was it? Could it possibly be the elusive Bigfoot? Or was this simply a figment of our imaginations? Are we even credible? I'm going to preface this and say that I'm not quite sure what I saw this day. Typically, I'm not a believer in Bigfoot and things like that, but this day certainly has me wondering. I took a solo camping trip to the northern wilderness area in California. I live about an hour south of Los Angeles and occasionally get places by myself when my time allows for it. The place where I decided to camp was about three hours away from home. I decided to go on a weekend and the weather was mild and overcast, and perfect for camping conditions as far as I'm concerned. The first day of my trip, I set up camp toward the evening time, around 4 or 5. It wasn't until about 9 that night that things really got interesting. My campsite was, of course, in the woods. And there's a ridge that runs north to south behind where I pitched my tent and made camp. It's about 500 feet from this ridge to the spot where my small fire was set up. I had plenty of trees around me to provide cover from anything lurking in the forest beyond. As I lay there, smoking a joint to pass the time until bed, I heard what sounded like footsteps beyond my fire. I looked up, looked around, but did not see anybody or anything remotely suspicious. The sound continued on for about three minutes before finally stopping, so I decided it must have been an animal of some sort. I was just about to lay down and try to sleep when I heard it again, much closer. This time, the step sounded like it was right behind me. I looked over my shoulder and saw a tall figure standing there, silhouetted against my fire. My first instinct was fight or flight, but as I had tried to turn around on my sleeping bag, I found myself paralyzed. I could move my head and nothing else. The figure stood there for a moment before walking over to the fire and kneeling down. The next thing I know, I wake up in a hospital bed with a sheet pulled over me. There was a nurse standing there checking on me. She told me my vitals were good, asked me what happened. I told her the only thing I knew was that I had woken up here, not remembering how I got there or any of the events leading up to it. She sounded concerned at first, but became further interested in things as I explained them. I told her I had been camping and that I did not know what had happened. She left the room, and a man who walked in, who introduced himself as Dr. Keller, had entered the room. 
he pulled a chair over to my bedside. He asked me what I knew. I told him the same thing I just told the nurse. He was not dressed like a traditional doctor, more like somebody you'd see in the government. A suit, tie, glasses, that whole getup. He had asked me if anything unusual happened before this event, or if I was familiar with the area of where it occurred. I mentioned that there was a ridge behind my camp. Mr. Keller's interest grew more focused as he pushed his chair closer to my bedside and leaned in toward me to ask what else I knew about this ridge. He said he had never heard anybody ever going up there and that it was too far out of the way to be worth the hike. I explained that I had been on a hiking trip and had parked my car in a small clearing at the bottom of the hill. There used to be an old mining road there. The more I told him, the more visibly excited he became and began telling me more about the history of this whole area. He started by explaining that this place used to be known as a very thriving mining community, but was shut down due to multiple disappearances and other strange paranormal-like events occurring in the hills close by. Most notably, there were reports of people wandering out of the forests or hills, usually naked and severely injured. Some were pretty far gone, to the point they died several hours after being taken in for care. They had no idea why or what was happening, but there were three things that seemed to be recurring in every single report. On several occasions, people had also been found to have no fingerprints. The second thing was a physical description of tall, hunched figures reported being seen on multiple locations all during these disappearances. The third, well, the speculation was skinwalkers. He went on to explain that the Skinwalker Ranch, located in northern Utah, was not very active like it used to be. This hill, where I had been sleeping that night, however, supposedly contained an underground shrine of a Skinwalker cult. Numerous disappearances and attacks had taken place in the vicinity of the hill, and many believed it to be the grounds for a Skinwalker cult. My jaw hung open as he explained all of this to me. I asked if there were any accounts of anybody escaping one of these creatures, or reports from people who might have encountered their shrine before. That was when he told me about three missing children. He went on to explain that a mother had brought her three small boys hiking in this area. They were all never seen again. This happened back in the early 1980s. Nobody believed she really had lost them. They thought it was simply a mere excuse for them to leave their husband, who was a very abusive, mean, angry man. He told me to think about it, and if I remember anything else, to let him know. I considered the possibility of a skinwalker cult being in the area, but immediately I discounted it as a practical joke, or a sick ploy for attention towards the end of my conversation. This is also when he brought up the fact that there was military and alien technology being worked on underground, right in the same area that I was camping. His claim was that the figure I saw before losing consciousness used a special technology to knock me out. This being then supposedly carried me to the roadside, where somebody called an ambulance after finding me unresponsive. Listen, I get it. I'm still trying to wrap my entire head around the craziness of this whole story. I can't deny what I've experienced. I'm also not trying to profit off of this, and I'd like to keep my anonymity. So here it is. My account is best as I can recall. There was something out there in those hills, and it definitely wasn't human. Whether you believe me or not, please be cautious if you ever find yourself near these hills. I'm not sure if you're a believer in things like skinwalkers, but I'm here to tell you they are real. A few weeks back, I was on patrol with a fellow ranger of mine when we noticed an unusually high level of wildlife activity just going on outside Yellowstone. We approached the area as close as we could without being seen. We were able to take a closer look at what was happening. It looked as if there was some kind of cult happening just yards away from the park's borders. The gathering itself looked to have been small, but it had been going on for hours. As we continue on investigating and observing, 
we noticed blood sacrifices being made to what we assumed was some kind of skinwalker. We don't really know what they're capable of, exactly, but it's clear something is going on near the park, and we believe it has occultic ties. We decided to report this, but our up-aboves seem very uninterested and unimpressed with what we had. It's as if we were expected to see these things happen. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that they've been happening for quite some time now. Nobody apparently wants to do anything about it. We rangers are supposed to be protectors of Yellowstone, and yet it's like we feel so powerless against the threats that are growing, right under our noses. So, here I am. I also know this isn't the first report we've had about this. In fact, back in 2001, a tourist by the name of Mary Gilbert was killed in her tent after she approached a skinwalker disguised as a deer, apparently. I've seen skinwalkers myself, although they can look different from what I assume are Native American descriptions. They have humanoid features, but are closer to being something straight out of your worst nightmares. Don't get me wrong, they could shapeshift, and you'll never know what they really look like. The only way to tell if it's an actual skinwalker is generally their eyes. Their eyes will look far more human than any animal you'll have known. I'm afraid for my life. These are very dangerous entities. They will stop at nothing to accomplish their goals. And they are capable of killing with the relative ease, and also love to kill. I can no longer ignore this issue, so I'm putting the burden on you, the reader. I want you to tell everyone that you know about this problem. Rangers need your help, if we are ever going to get rid of them once and for all. One last thing. If you've never seen of or heard of a skinwalker before, I suggest you read upon them. While they are primarily Navajo entities, their dark magic is known throughout the world. There's no telling what they might do if they come and try to kill you. I'm going to flat out say that I experienced a Wendigo, hands down. I didn't think they existed. But this experience has proven me wrong. I will never go back up to the mountains alone, or ever camp again. I live in Washington State. I have never seen a Wendigo here, however, others have. It's usually up north where you'll see most sightings of them. Me and my buddies went camping on the powwow grounds at the Mystery Ranch location, right up near Mount Baker. We were drinking around the campfire with some friends that came to visit when I decided to go back to our campsite alone. I got about 200 yards away from the fire ring when it happened. I had stepped over a fallen log, deep in the forest where no lights could be seen, just pitch blackness everywhere, except for the faint moonlight, which gave some illumination around us. I looked up and saw this thing. Now, my first instinct was to look away, because of how scary it looked. It had a human torso, was all black, like a shadow, very long arms and legs, but they were all out of proportion. It also had a deer's head, huge antlers that pointed down. It was hunched over, looking at me from above. Its eyes glowed yellow as I stared through the darkness at its face. My eyes aren't that great, so I couldn't make out details except for those horrific antlers and glowing yellow eyes staring straight into my soul if you will. I was scared past belief, but something told me not to run. I felt like fleeing as fast as I could back to the fire, but my body was stuck, as if a strong magnet had pulled me towards this creature. I tried to run. I tried to scream for help. Nothing would work. It looked up at the sky and howled. Then it cocked its head over towards me and did it again. I was paralyzed by fear as I saw that face staring down at me with those glistening yellow eyes. It seemed like forever before it took off running into the night forest, making all sorts of noise. As it went through the trees and brush away from us, my friends must have heard, or something, because now they were coming straight for where I was standing still, frozen in fear and shock about what had just happened. They found me only minutes after it ran off. They thought I was playing a joke, asking why I would be out there. I couldn't respond. They assumed I was trying to prank them, until, 
only moments later, they heard the same howling that had startled me just moments before. They then realized right away that this wasn't some sort of joke or prank. My story doesn't end here. My friends told me to go back to camp because nothing would happen if I stayed with them. They didn't believe any of this happened. They would have to acknowledge this thing's existence then. It probably wasn't even real in their minds. Needless to say, I slept on the other side of our campsite all night long. No problems whatsoever. I ended up speaking to one of the elders who immediately noticed something was different about me. He informed me I needed to be cleansed and that I had been marked by an evil spirit. And that's the sole purpose of what I saw. It wasn't there to cause me harm, so to speak. It was there to leave a mark on me, to invite more evil to come and destroy my life. He told me these beings, that's what they do. He never once referred to this entity as a wendigo. This is just my own speculation. I got blessed by the medicine man the next day, and things seem to be okay for the meantime. I still get haunted with vivid nightmares of these creatures. Very often, actually. The following account was given to Colorado curator T.E. Stein during a phone interview with Bob Jackson in 2003. Recently, Jackson gave permission to submit his account. Jackson, also known as Action Jackson, was a legendary among park supporters, notorious among outfitters and scofflers. His enforcement of the park rules and regulations. He has retired since 2004. Few people have ever known Yellowstone's backcountry and its wildlife like Jackson did. The first time I heard anything was in the mid to late 70s. An outfitter and I were riding up to Fan Creek in the northwestern section of the park, up the drainage and Stellaria Creek. We heard a sound that just kept going and going. It was probably a mile away. It filled the entire valley, kind of like a thousand elk going to their death. I could not believe this thing had that much volume for that long of a period of time. He had never heard anything like it neither. A couple of weeks later, I was coming up from Sportsman Creek, taking a trail which comes out of Fan Creek. I was 11 miles back in, high up in subalpine fir meadow complex. I was on a steep side hill with horses and in woods, but down below, about 40 to 50 yards, there was kind of a fairly flat meadow with dense subalpine thickets. There were these low fir growths that have a centerpiece tree and then everything kind of cone shapes to the ground. They were about 20 yards wide or so. The horses were flaring their noses and snorting, like they do when a grizzly bear is really close. But I could see fairly good all around, and I could not see any signs of a grizzly bear. So, I began looking down below me, and the horses were very agitated. They were wanting to get out. I held them, but only with effort. I looked down to see where Grizz was, and I saw a deer at the edge of the thicket. All at once, it bolted and started jarring ahead, perpendicular to me. Right then, coming out of the other side was this thing that was running on two feet. It was black like a bear, and it had long arms and ran. I think I held it there for thirty seconds, but it got scared and then came out. It ran, but not super fast. It ran to another thicket, and went at an angle, out of the thicket, to another thicket, about 50 yards away. At this point, the creature was 75 yards down slope. It kept hitting these thickets trying to get away from me. I've never seen a bear do that. They'll always take a straight line. The first thing I thought of was bear. But right away, I realized this bear was shaggy, and it was not a bear. It was also intelligent. I have never seen a single animal trying to pick up protection as it fled. I tied that together with the sound on the other side of the drainage. It wasn't that tall. It looked like it was maybe six foot, maybe six five. The side of the face looked like it had a lot of fur. Most of the time, it was angling away. So I only got a good look at the head for probably the first ten steps. The proportions of the torso. It looked more stocky than anything else. I even noticed the arms swung more than a human's would, 
and it did not have elbows cocked. This is no hoax. I've ridden maybe 50,000 to 70,000 miles in the backcountry on horses, and you encounter a lot of bears when you do that. This thing, whatever it was, the horses looked straight down to it. One guy, I met in the northeastern section of the park, he was camped illegally. He said he had heard a noise real close to him. I made him describe it. He said it was probably within 20 yards. One other outfitter heard that sound also. This would have been back in the early 80s for both of those. Another time, a crew examining the blister rust, a disease of white bark pine in the 1970s, came on an elk in the southeastern corner of the park. They came on a deboned elk and saw these real big footprints. They got kind of scared and headed out. On that same trip, they heard really weird noises up near Mountain Creek. One time, I was skiing into Hart Lake on the thoroughfare. We were maybe five, six miles east of the road, and myself and the others. All at once, we saw these footprints going across the trail. There was not any path, and nobody had used to ski that far in back then. These were real, real big footprints stretched out far apart. It was deep snow, but it was a fairly distinct track. That was the first and only track I've seen. In early to mid-80s, in the same drainage as Mountain Creek, we were just coming into Howell Creek Cabin near Eagle Creek Pass at 8,500 feet. We were coming in right before dark, and we heard that noise. I timed it at 26 seconds about 300 to 400 yards beyond the cabin up the drainage. I checked the next day. Could not find any footprints. Whatever that thing is, it doesn't let up to take a breath. It's like mechanical, rhythmical. I can't begin to describe it. It isn't like a mountain lion or a bear. And a bear can make some pretty weird noises. I heard no other reports of Bigfoot until three or four years ago. I was in Mountain Creek and I heard this thing again. A district ranger once took sightings from a backpacker near Bella Lake that would have been in the 70s, west of the south entrance. Apparently, the person watched one on the other side of a small lake for 10 minutes. The ranger felt the witness was very sane. Now, let it be known that Jackson's crusades against the practice of creating salt licks to draw an elk for easy shots just outside the park's southeast boundary earned him lifelong enemies among local outfitters. He also campaigned against their habit of leaving large portions of the carcass behind, meat that habituated grizzly bears learned to come running for the sound of gunshots. The bears that learned to scavenge the carcasses often got into confrontations with hunters and outfitters, leading to their deaths. During his career, Jackson spent a great deal of time in the park's most remote backcountry, including the Thoroughfare, the place in the lower 48 states that lies the furthest from a road. This is believed to be the first time Jackson has ever publicly talked about Sasquatch. If you have an encounter you would like to share with me personally, please send it to the email below at stories at whatlurksbeneath.com. I would love to read it to my fan base. Also, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe for more things paranormal, dark, cryptid, and monsters. This happened a long time ago, but after what I experienced, it will never be forgotten. It was the summer of 2012, and I was going through a paranormal obsession period. Me and my group of friends were doing an EVP session pretty deep into the woods. After a few hours, we began to head back to our cars because the sun was going down. When we got out of our cars, we were talking about how excited we were that we had actually gotten audio recordings of us yelling into the nothing. None of us could have guessed what would happen next. After a minute or two of chatting about how excited we were, something, at least we feel, began following us from behind the trees, as if it were stalking us behind those big oak trees. We all turned around and began walking towards our friend, who was standing right by his car. That's when we all heard a clicking noise. So, my friend asked me what it sounded like. I told him it sounded like something clicking. My other friends immediately got goosebumps, looking horrified. 
my friend, who had been standing there the entire time, walked over to her. She started shaking badly, told us that she felt someone or something grabbed her clothes from behind her, and that she felt a dark energy around us, that she no longer felt safe, and that something bad was going to happen. Later that night, I guess she would go on to have a premonition of her own death, but that's a different story. In this moment, she also mentioned that she heard somebody whispering into her ear, but did not tell us what they whispered to her. She could not repeat it word for word. Then, she rushed into my friend's car who was parked next to hers, which made all of us relieved now that she was safe. We all got in our cars and began to leave. My friend, her mom, and I were the first to leave. We parked right next to each other. As soon as we got about three blocks down, from where everything happened, my friend's mom said she felt this pressure on her chest, like there was something weighing there, like bricks. She couldn't figure out what it was. She was now having problems breathing, and almost collapsed. We then came up with a theory that it could have been an entity, or a forced spirit guardian, wanting us out of those woods as possible. So it was using spiritual forces, or telekinesis, against us. Just seconds after she mentioned this, I felt my phone ring. When I looked down at my phone, it showed these weird symbols above a number saying, Unknown Number. And just for the record, in 2012, there wasn't near the amount of spam and robocalls as nowadays, and hardly if anybody even called me, let alone unknown numbers. The coincidental timing was just too much. I was freaked out, but decided to answer it anyway under pressure and curiosity. I picked up and said hello. All I heard on the other end was some weird noise, between static and a garbled voice. It almost sounded demonic. After about 30 seconds of me asking who was this, I hung up. I remember thinking how crazy this all felt, and nothing like this has ever happened to anybody. My mom was now freaking out. I didn't tell her anything, because she would even get more paranoid than she already is. She still doesn't know to this day that all this stuff happened like this. The next morning after hearing everything that went down, we tried to research if there had been any sightings in the area of spirits and Bigfoot's skinwalkers, but all we could find was that a few years ago, a few children were apparently gone missing, or even some found mauled by something suspiciously close to the time. I still have no idea if this is the work of a spirit, a demon, a dark entity, or possibly a skinwalker. I would love to know if there's anybody out there who thinks this incident is more than just supernatural, that maybe there's a dark force behind it, because honestly, I'm terrified to go back. I'll keep this very to the point. First off, a little bit about me. I have worked in law enforcement for well over 15 years now, so I know what a wild animal acts like when it comes to odd behaviors. I was on a hike about a month ago near the summit of Mount Evans in Clear Creek County, Colorado at approximately 10,400 feet elevation. It started to get dark, and I decided to head back down the trail towards my vehicle. At the very base of the trail, I saw something moving across the path. It was moving quickly, and without fear of humans. I kept staring at it, as it went into some trees on the other side of the trail. It looked like a bipedal canine, very long strides while running. I saw its shoulder blades while it was running. This thing had to be at least seven feet tall. I know the wildlife around here pretty well, and this was definitely not matching with any of them. It had been roughly 40 to 50 years since any Bigfoot sightings have been reported here in Colorado, at least to my knowledge. But after seeing what I saw, I'm going to start keeping my eyes peeled. Now, that was just my story. I have some good friends that have some pretty wild stories of their own, all seeing very similar things. In fact, a very good friend of mine, whom we've been friends for around 12 years now, he's an expert marksman, served in the military for a time, hunts, fishes, the whole gambit. He's his country as it gets. As we're talking about this subject, he told me of a situation that happened to him and his uncle one night, while out fishing. They were close to the river, 
when he turned around just in time to see the strange-looking animal moving quickly across the trail going into the tree line. He said it was tall, moved on two legs, and was not very bulky. It did not have a tail, as far as he could tell. His uncle had seen one too. He's much older now, but he still recalls the incident today, as it happened yesterday. One of my friends from work, she says she saw something a bit more aggressive than what I saw, but it still qualifies as a sighting. She was walking her dog one evening, behind the local school. There's a fairly large open field there, and she could see the school from where she was walking. As they got to the middle of the field, she noticed what appeared to be a large man-like figure standing just outside the school grounds. She said it appeared to have a human body, but it was standing straight up with its arms at its side. As soon as she caught sight of this thing, it took off, sprinting across the field in her direction. It ran on two legs. When she turned around and ran towards home, she could hear what sounded like footsteps following her. She said she could hear the grass and dirt getting pushed around while it ran after her. But at a distance, she's also used to living in town, and this scared the crap out of her. I'm hoping that maybe some of you had seen or experienced something like this yourselves and can possibly offer some insight on this. I'm very interested in the subject and hope to learn more about what it is that has been lurking around my neck of the woods. Thank you for taking the time to read this. Not my story, but a family member of mine who wishes to remain anonymous while sharing his Bigfoot sighting story with me. He still works as a ranger for the National Park of Yellowstone, but here's his story. I was driving home one night. It must have been around 10.30 or 10.45 p.m. I was driving down a long stretch of road, high grass on either side. This area of the park is more remote, but there are some tent sites scattered throughout here and there. My car had a large bump in the road, which made me veer slightly to the left. When I looked straight ahead at that moment, I saw what I thought was a bear sitting up on its hind legs, just staring at me within 20 feet of where my car had drifted towards. So, as any person would do, I tried to speed off out of there, because if you've ever seen what a grizzly bear can do to you, it's bad news. But for some reason, this thing didn't even flinch, and I, like, lost control of my body. I decided to take a second look. My body involuntarily slowed down, and I feel like I rolled down the car window involuntarily as well. The thing never budged an inch, until my car got close enough. It started to rise up off the ground again, but at this point was now about 30 feet away from me. Its head must have been taller than my shoulders. All I could see was this massive, dark brown head staring back at me, with eyes that were completely red and not like a deer or raccoon eyes, but almost human-like reflective red in color. The thing had intelligence in its eyes, and then it roared, which shook me to the bone. So, I drove off as fast as I could. When I got home, my father was asking me what took so long. It's not the first time that something like this has happened. Apparently, about 20 years ago, when he was still a ranger at Yellowstone, him and his partner were out patrolling at night, and they too saw an eight-foot-tall, what they thought was a brown bear, walking on its hind legs. Upon closer inspection, both men agreed it was not a bear. This thing looked just like the encounter I just shared with you. I'll never forget him saying, They know we're always out here at night, and one day, some tourists are going to get eaten up if these things start to become more known. So that's his story. He told me that back then and there was a lot of news about what people were seeing with this creature called Bigfoot. He thought something like that had happened to his own father. He's not sure what they saw, but both men agreed it was not human or any known animal at Yellowstone before tonight. Also, around the same time of his sighting, he told me too there were lots of strange lights in the sky and weird sounds. Other people, like campers and hikers alike, had reported seeing weird beings in the park. There's definitely something going on there. I guess about 10 miles down the road from his initial sighting, there's another ranger station, 
where about 20 years ago, back in the 70s, a ranger saw one of these creatures on the side of the road. His claim was that it was all covered in hair and walked upright, but also on its hind legs. Apparently, it was carrying a dead deer with its neck broken. This man, my family described, had been a ranger for a long time, had never seen anything like it. He described the creature as very similar as the other two. He said it looked very familiar, almost like he had seen it before, except this being looked much more aggressive. People have also reported missing pets or livestock over the years, and not just in the national park, but in the surrounding area, which they also believe to be caused by something either supernatural or possibly by these creatures. I don't know if it's just my family telling stories, but after today, I'm starting to believe something strange is going on. I cannot say 100% conclusively that these things exist, but with so many reports over the years with what my family described, I'd say they're most certainly real. I've worked in Yellowstone for several years now, and it wasn't until more recently we've been having issues with these dogman creatures. Campers have been complaining of the issue, and we're not allowed to say anything to anyone. Our supervisor wants to keep all of it super hush-hush. Well, I'm here to tell you, they are very real, and I believe they have made a den deep within the confines of Yellowstone. This is my story that I'm sharing with you about my experience with these beings. Let me start off and say we've already received several complaints from campers who were in a specific region of the park. Things were escalating more and more, and campers had complained of seeing these canine creatures encroaching on their campsites, terrorizing campers. We were called within a Code 3, and we had to investigate the situation thoroughly. The day it happened, we were sent out to an area just northwest of Yellowstone Lake. It was off of Elephant Back Road, along the banks of the river at the edge of this vast lake. My partner and I went up to investigate and find out what was going on for sure when he got a call from our captain, saying there was apparently no need for us to investigate any further. It turns out some hunters may or may not have been hunting in that area and supposedly scare these creatures off. So basically the first day, we did not end up finding anything which wasn't shocking since I believe we'd have to take our searches even further. Now, the real experience occurred while another ranger and I were driving around in our truck, taking the long way back to the office after a routine patrol. We weren't trying to find anything per se. We just wanted to get back since there was nothing for us to do at that time. We had taken the East Fork Road down along Libby Creek until it intersects with one of the main highways out of there, which is Elephant Back Road. That's when he saw something big run up across the road ahead. We slowed down, drove closer, thinking maybe it was a grizzly bear, because they are known to be found in this area of Yellowstone, very close to people's campsites. We stopped about 30 feet away from where we saw what looked like giant dog prints in the dirt. The ground was still frozen, and we could clearly see three large bipedal canid prints. They were easily as large as a grizzly print. These things had to have been about 13 inches by 8 inches wide. And they had these deep toe impressions on the bottom too. That's what really made me and my partner and I look closer, because we weren't sure what we were seeing right away. They almost looked like bear tracks, if you just glance at them. But you'd notice right away how much whiter than your average bear print they were. Which led to me thinking it could not be a grizzly or a black bear. So we both just sat there for a minute, trying to wrap our minds around what we saw. He asks me to get out of the truck. I did, and he told me to check the other side of the road for any more prints. It wasn't until after I got back into the truck that my partner said, we need to get out of here. I don't know why, but if somebody has been working around Yellowstone Park long enough, you learn to trust them and what they say. So I did what he asked, without questioning. He began driving away, faster than normal, obviously spooked. When we reached this small roadside area where people would stop to see different sights along Elephant Back, that's when it happened. My partner slammed the brakes on our truck and just stared off into the distance. 
I asked him what was up. He tells me it's them. I could hear movement alongside my vehicle as I scanned my surroundings. This is when I saw several large bipedal figures that appeared blatantly canid. There were three of them, and they were moving tactfully. It appeared as if they were getting ready to flank us. They were coming at us from our right side. I reached for my gun, but before I could grab it, there was this giant bang that sounded like a gunshot and made me jump. I looked at my partner, only to see him looking behind us. So, I turned around and saw this huge, the fourth one of the pack, breaking these massive branches as it forced its way out from the brush into the open. We needed to leave now. I knew it wasn't a bear. I knew these were giant canines. And also, this whole situation had changed my life forever. We put the pedal to the metal. I was in shock. My partner never said a word. Once we got back to the station, he went straight to his office, shutting the door. I knew he was never going to speak about this with anybody. We were told very early on to not make reports of this kind of stuff. In fact, things of this nature had their own category, but I'm already saying too much as it is. Now, for the record, this was my partner and I's very first experience with these things during the whole initial shock of all the werewolf talk among crew. Well, we would later learn some of us are very much so cryptozoology enthusiasts, but we would be educated and learn that this is actually a dogman, and werewolves don't technically exist. Fast forward to about six months later. It's now later on in the fall. October, actually. The activity from these creatures had died down, and we decided against looking out for these creatures. People had stopped complaining and reporting the sightings. And like I said, there was really no more signs of them, at least in the adjacent areas. However, I had received word from my supervisor that the sightings were now starting back up, and we were beginning to have more missing hikers than usual. My supervisor believed it to be the work of these creatures, and desperately wanted me to go investigate to see if we could locate their den. I wasn't happy, but we did what we needed to do. We got an early start and making it to the trailhead by noon of the following day. It was our colleague's last day of work, so we had more than a few people with us. The rest were going to meet up with us later on that evening at our campsite, which happened to be on the Elephant Back Mountain where most of these sightings would take place. It was also this very same place that my partner and I had encountered them initially, only on the other side, across from where our campsite would be. We all knew not to get out of our vehicle while we were there. It's what they wanted after all, right? So, we kept alert while we drove around in one of the backcountry sites. We had been tracking the pack's movement for some time, but could not locate their den appropriately. Since they were getting closer to the touristy area of the park, we needed to put an end to this. That night, we made plans for the next day to go around and try to chase them off. We woke up early in the morning, after barely any sleep at all that night, going back into the woods to look for those things. We believed we had located the source of their den after carefully going over some highly researched coordinates on the GPS. It was clear that something had been visiting this site very frequently. We believed it to be these creatures. We decided it would be best to camp around here at night and wait for them to return, so our plan was to ambush them and take them out. We went back to our vehicles and made sure we had enough supplies, plenty of weapons. We all met up on the Elephant Back Mountain and began setting up camp for the night. The sun had now set, and we all sat around the campfire as we talked about life and work stories. Out of nowhere, branches began snapping and breaking right near the vehicle. I ran over there immediately with my rifle drawn only to find one of these things standing there by my vehicle. It looked pissed. Without hesitating, I took a shot, only to have it flinch and run off. I heard a rustling, so I thought it was safe to go check out on the situation. My partner went with me, and we found tracks all around our vehicle after this thing had fled. We decided that the two of us would take a position on the top of the ridge, while one stayed below near our vehicles. 
My assumption was they were trying to lure or possibly surprise us using one of their own as bait. After 20 minutes had passed, my partner still had not come back down yet. So, I climbed down slowly, thinking I had missed something like they had ambushed him. But no, he wasn't there. He must have ran off into the forest after hearing gunfire. I began regretting this entire thing. Maybe this was all a huge mistake to pursue after all. I kept pushing onward, serious about defending our position. I radioed back to camp and told the others what was going on. I heard more rustling in the forest, but could not make out any distinctive sounds. The trees were far too thick for me to see anything from at the top of the ridge, so I took my chances and went down there instead. After about twenty minutes or so, the next thing that happened felt like a blur, just an explosion of pain all over my body, and suddenly I found myself being dragged through the woods again with these tight arms holding me. I was knocked nearly unconscious, and I knew it was these things. They were going to kill me. About another thirty minutes later, I regained consciousness, I believe, by one of my colleagues. I was beaten and scratched up pretty good. She said these things had dragged me through the forest, near where their den site was, and that we had apparently gotten too close. They were now getting aggressive because we figured out where they rested and where they lived. She saw them dragging my body, and after firing several rounds, they dropped me and fled off in the direction where she believes their den is at. We knew we could not risk anything else, so we went back towards the campsite at Elephantback Mountain, radioing for help so these things wouldn't finish us off. It was then that we were greeted with several military personnel pulling alongside a road. About five trucks in all lined up, men in black suits from an unidentified government branch, all jumping out with M4s to greet us. We were told to stay inside one of the vehicles as they all began marching into the forest where we had just come from. This is when I finally saw these creatures for myself. Now, it was much more visible by the headlights of these military vehicles. Even though I only saw a faint glimpse here and there, they looked human, but not quite so. Far more human than what I had seen. Almost like a Neanderthal or a Homo erectus type being, but very canine-like. Shorter, but still bipedal, and resembling somewhat of a human. The last two times I had seen them, it was darker so I could not get every detail. But their intent was very hostile, as they kept basing back and forth and an eruption of fire broke out. After the men stormed through the woods, after this thing, we didn't see anything else afterwards. These men also possessed very strange alien-like weaponry. I don't mean alien in a literal sense, I mean weaponry that's very foreign to what I've seen. Within minutes, we were quickly escorted back to the primary station and told to keep quiet. The military was taking care of the situation. My injuries were not too severe, and they healed in a matter of weeks. I'm still not allowed to go back out there since my superiors think this is all too traumatizing, and they have strict orders not to allow any of us to interfere with their ongoing investigation. I just want answers at this point. What are these things? Where do they come from? And why is the military apparently trying to cover up their existence? I have so many questions that desperately need answering. For now, though, I'll just recount my tales with these humanoid creatures in hopes that somebody has any idea who or what they are can give me something to know. I know I sound crazy writing this, but I feel it's important to get this off my chest. In 2017, I went on a vacation back to my hometown in the Catskills. I decided to hike part of the trail that I used to walk back in high school, back at a time that I was much more fit and in shape. And this trail takes you through some woods, up a very steep hill. I know, in hindsight, it's 2020. So, it was around 6 p.m. when I began the hike. The sun had just set, and I, my phone on me. At around 6.30, I turned on the flashlight app for my phone to see during my hike up the hill. So, my goal was to make it through these woods before it got too dark. It would be safe after that point, 
since there are houses along the trail starting there out. Now, I was about halfway up the hill, and I looked down at my phone. It was also getting dark enough now that I could make it through the woods, with just the light. The sun had now just dipped below the tree line, so there were still patches of light shining through the trees. But, as I looked back up ahead of me, I noticed something that made me stop in my tracks. It was just up ahead, just in the next patch of light. I saw what appeared to be a man's legs, standing motionless in the trail. And when I say motionless, he wasn't moving at all. That alone would have been enough for me to get out of there. But what really made me leave was the fact when I looked closer, it actually appeared to be a large dog, standing up on its back legs. When I looked closer, I noticed that it wasn't a dog at all. It had human hands. Now, I don't think you understand how creepy this was. What did I do? Well, I turned off my flashlight app, trying my best not to get its attention. I began slowly moving back in the direction I came from, praying to God I would not invoke the wrath of whatever this was. In my head at the time, I was convinced this was a flipping werewolf. This thing suddenly looks over in my direction, and I'm even more terrified than I was before. Its eyes were like that of glowing hot fiery coals. I screamed, turned around, and ran up the rest of the hill as fast as I could. Once I got back to my car, I called 911. I told them what had happened, but they thought I was joking with them. What kind of person would call 911, waste your time and their time, like this? They asked me questions that made it obvious they were humoring me and did not believe a word I was saying. The longer this went on, I just got angrier and angrier. How can they not believe me? I realized they were not going to help me in any way. I was petrified this thing was going to follow me home. So, I packed up my car, drove at breakneck speeds back home. When I got back home, I did not even leave the car for about five minutes, just sitting there, a complete nervous wreck, waiting to see if this thing had truly followed me home at all. After that night, I did not feel right for two weeks after, maybe three. Horrible bouts of anxiety at random times, always felt like I was never alone. This angst deep in my body, to say it was traumatic is treading lightly. I'm a man who loves to fish, and whenever I go fishing, I usually go looking for large ponds or lakes to fish in. One day, my friend and I drove out into the woods to go fishing. We found a pond. It was too small for fishing, so we continued on with our search. Eventually, we found a nice lake where we could fish. It was good-sized and lots and lots of vegetation around it. Not so many houses in the area either. It was much more secluded, probably at least two miles into the woods. As we're walking around the shoreline of the lake, trying to find the best spot to fish, one of us feels something moving around. We both look at each other, assuming one of us had stepped on something, because the ground underneath us began to rumble. We looked in the water but didn't see anything, so we continued on our search for a good fishing spot, talking about how weird it was, and maybe we experienced a minor earthquake. As we're walking ahead, we continued on our search. I saw something moving just by the base of a tree nearby. It moved very quickly, but what I could tell it was definitely not a human. It went up the side of the tree and almost hung on one of its branches by its arms. After seeing this, my friend and I were back to the car without looking back once to get out of there as fast as possible. And since then, I've tried to do as much research and gather as much knowledge as I can. And what I believe, or at least speculate, is that my friend and I saw a juvenile Sasquatch watching us that day, perhaps out of curiosity. We never got the feeling it was malevolent or aggressive in any way, but more curious, like I said and I think we spooked it. However, I cannot even begin to speculate about the weird vibrating or earthquake-like feeling in the earth underneath our feet. It makes me think of UFOs, which I have a lot of interest in alien stuff, and I've been seeing them all throughout my life. In fact, my earliest memory is very vivid and takes place when I was only four years old. 
living in the middle of nowhere from a very fairly wealthy family. This was also in British Columbia. I had wandered away from the house to play with another kid who lived about 150 feet up a hill next door. The other kid ended up going home for lunch or something, so it was just me alone outside and playing on a small grassy cliff above our driveway, which overlooked some forested valleys below. While I'm standing there, watching some ants, I noticed a buzzing sound in the woods, directly below me, behind my house. After looking around and trying to figure out where it was coming from, I figured possibly it was some sort of bee's nest or something living out there. I decided at four years old, it would be fun to go check it out. So, I'm running back towards my house, jumping over a ditch that separated our property line with the forested valley. As soon as I clear the ditch, I stopped dead in my tracks and just stared at whatever it was, because you couldn't miss the thing. It was huge, almost gold and bronze colored, if I remember. About human height, maybe taller if not much actually taller than a single person. Anyway, within seconds of it seeing me, I hear my mom calling out from inside the house for me to come in, so I could eat. I start yelling back at her, saying I'm coming right away and looking down the path towards our driveway, waiting for her to appear. After a few seconds of not seeing anything, and still staring directly into where this thing was, or is, I hear a distant rumble behind me, that just seemed like maybe there was some sort of truck barreling down the road next to us, even though we lived way off any main roads, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, after looking back down the road for a few seconds, I hear my mom again calling out to me, at this point, I'm still just frozen there, watching and listening to what's going on in front of me, not sure what to do. Then, after another couple of seconds, everything suddenly vanishes. The buzzing becomes almost deafening, and a second later, a gigantic golden or bronze rod-shaped entity appeared from behind the tree line where this thing was standing, shoots straight up into the air at incredible speeds before disappearing. After regaining my senses from all this, I run as fast as I can towards the house, expecting my mom to be somewhere near. But instead, I find her inside, having never called me in the first place. I wasn't really sure what to do at this point, so I just stood there and waited for her to speak. After a few seconds, she asks what's wrong with me, because she can see that I'm visibly shaken. I tell her everything that has happened, and even though it's coming from a four-year-old, she seemed to somewhat believe me, although I did not go into the buzzing part yet, because it's not that relevant. She does look confused and, and walks down to where the sound was, maybe about 30 seconds later returning, saying, Oh, you are probably seeing people pull down the road. This makes no sense at all. We lived way too far off any main road for anybody to see anything. The sound that I heard could have been the equivalent of a smaller helicopter. After all of this stopped happening, I thought it may have just been some hallucination, but the older I get, and the more I read and study, I realize it was all too real, although I still don't know what happened, or how to explain it. I was getting ready to go out on a date, when my friend called and told me he saw something strange in the woods. This is in Louisiana so werewolves and the Rougarou have been talked about here for a while. But it's not often that you actually run into somebody who claims to have seen one. So, of course I wanted to see it for myself. We took our bikes and headed out into the woods. That's near where we lived. It was foggy, and I did not feel right about it. But we kept going. The light from our bike lamps suddenly got blocked by something tall. My friend got freaked out and turned back. But he would tell me later that whatever it was had glowing red eyes. I kept going, not knowing what to do or where to go. It stood on two legs and was covered in dark brown fur, like the kind you would imagine a creature to have. Although I could not see its face, it did not move at all when I turned my bike light toward it. The worst thing about this creature was that it had paws similar to that of a dog, but much larger. In fact, they were more like hands, similar to that of a raccoon. They were also covered in hair and ending in long three to four inch claws. 
the arms were just as big. In fact, about as thick as the thickest part of my own thigh. When I turned back toward where I had come from, the light on my bike suddenly went dead. It was like the moment I turned away, my light would go dim and would flicker as if there was some electronical interference on my LED light. I panicked, turned around to head back, and that's when this thing began coming towards me from the swamps behind me. All that came into view were these two red eyes and a very dark space between two trees. That's when I saw a huge hand going back in the darkness, holding onto a tree. I pedaled as fast as I could, back to where I came from. I called my friend when I got back. He never made it home from the other side, but would later tell me he saw the same thing I did, and he refused to go near it. Now, it's been almost 20 years since this happened, and I still wonder what was following me that night. This was also during Black Friday, right after Thanksgiving, and me and my friends got together on Thanksgiving, since I don't see them often, which, again, is why we went exploring here in the swamps. Every Thanksgiving, it was kind of our ritual to get together, since they lived up north. Once they would come down, every Thanksgiving, while food was being prepped, we would spend it playing in the swamps. And then Black Friday, as our parents were out shopping and spending unnecessary godly amounts of money, this is when we would also spend our time in the swamps. And this is when this happened. Now, after this experience, the Thanksgivings after this weren't as enjoyable. We stayed out of the swamps and spent our time bored inside. It's a nightmare that I still have to think about. To keep this as short as I can, I was deer hunting in the New River Gorge in Fayetteville, West Virginia. This was 2007, the week of Thanksgiving. It was in the evening time, with about two hours of daylight left. I noticed movement about 60 yards towards the gorge from my position. I raised my gun to view the movement through the scope. After holding it in position for 10 seconds or so, I see a very large hand appear from the side of the large poplar tree. It was palm against the tree, and I saw fingers mostly. Then, to my surprise, I see a head peek from around a tree, and two large eyes affixed on a head of a creature I've never ever seen before. I'm a hunter. Have been, since I was eight. I'm now 38 years old. This Bigfoot, or whatever it was, blinked twice while looking at me, then stepped back behind the tree. I viewed it for about 20 seconds while it was looking at me. My mind just could not figure out what it was that I was looking at. I knew what it wasn't. I had no desire to shoot it, and very well could have, but my mind and body almost seemed to be in a state of shock while viewing it through my scope. I had to cross near the location and trail, if out in the woods. I was terrified with my loaded deer rifle. My hair stood on end when I realized I would have gone towards the woods of the location to get out. I called my uncle as soon as I got to my jeep, told him. He believed me. I'm a very honest man and would never lie about this. The thing is, though, I never heard it run away or move through the trees. You could hear movement from 200 plus yards off in these woods. It's like it just disappeared. I came home very shaken from this experience. It changed my life forever, now that I know it's out there. It was very cool looking, about seven feet tall. It had very dark, large pupils, and around the pupils, its eyes were very much like an owl. From the experience, its fur was also brownish-blonde, and it had a very visible face. It almost reminded me a face like a troll face that you used to put on the pencils as a kid, but it was very clean-looking and not what you would expect. Its fingers were long and thick, with no fur. It had dark fingernails. I had my scope on nine power and it was the equivalent to being about 30 feet from me visually. It was real. I would take a polygraph and right now and swear on my life. Last year on Thanksgiving, my family was sitting around the dinner table. It was a great dinner, and I think everybody was feeling pretty good. 
my niece brought up the subject of past lives, which sparked some of us to start talking about it. My cousins said they've experienced past life memories while meditating, but nothing too deep or anything that was scary. Then, my dad also said he's explored the idea for a while. Nothing specific, though. My mom then mentioned that she had seen a ghost in her house when she moved in 25 years ago. Her new neighbors were over for dinner, and they had seen the same thing. This led to my mother telling us this story about moving into an empty house with her three daughters and one weird neighbor telling him that the house was haunted. They had led to strange things happening that they could not figure out. The closet door would unlock and open itself. The things would go missing. Strange noises were heard in the middle of the night. After a few weeks, my mother decided to ask their neighbors who lived next door if they ever experienced anything strange because she began to believe it was haunted. The neighbors had said they believed the ghost of his ex-girlfriend, since he used to live in the house with his girlfriend, came back, but she did not want anybody else living there. They thought that she had died in the house, but nobody could find her body. Her family even came to her house looking for her. The day my mom asked about the neighbor about his ex, she came up missing after all these strange things happening in the house. They never found any clues as to where she went, and they actually left the neighborhood because of it. Needless to say, my family is definitely not ghost hunting anytime soon, especially after the neighbors went disappearing. This happened back in 2003. It still deeply disturbs me. So, my mom, dad and brother and I are having Thanksgiving at my grandparents' house. My grandmother lives about an hour away from us, so we're driving out there for dinner. It's later in the evening, but still light outside when we get there. My grandmother has this big old country-style table that we all sit at. Even though most of us are adults now, parents included. But anyway... Some people arrived ahead of us, so their plates are already on the table, filled with turkey, mashed potatoes, all sorts of delicious food. For some reason, I don't remember why. I'm not sure if my brother was sick or something, but my brother sits at a little table and chair, instead of one of the adult chairs. Anyway, my dad sits down, and he realizes that something is off. My grandmother had just stepped outside to smoke a cigarette, yet... We just saw her in the kitchen. We all began looking around at each other, thinking we're crazy. And then we see her again, coming down the hallway. All three times, she was wearing different colored shirts and pants, with the same kitchen apron on. After she came out of the kitchen again, she was dressed in a different shirt. We had all looked at each other, asking her if she felt okay. Now, to preface this, I want to say it is impossible for her to move around the house this quickly without any of us ever seeing it. There is no way that my 65-year-old grandmother can move all the way back to her back bedroom, change pants and shirt that quickly, without us ever seeing it. It didn't make sense. Either this is a glitch in the Matrix, or she is a doppelganger, or it was the most convincing prank she has ever pulled. I live in Indiana, and I've seen a humanoid form late at night in the woods near my house. It was an entire humanoid figure standing on two legs. It looked like it had long hair and was very tall when I saw it from afar. So my family and I saw it from afar as well. It was standing near the tree line, looking at us, but no discernible features like eyes or mouth. Just a dark human-shaped form. We thought it might be fake or possibly somebody pranking us. We did not want to investigate further than that, even though deep down, we all believed it was something dark. So, we were now in our backyard, with a bunch of other people. We were all sitting down, looking at the stars, and we spotted it again, standing in the trees with the help of my telescope, which means that this thing was tall enough to stand out against the tree line, or at least stood out enough. This is not something you can get confused with, an ape or anything else. It looked very human-like. After that, I kind of forgot about it until many years later, when I began reading about other sightings and how people see similar things like Bigfoot, Dogman, 
or other creatures. I also saw something like this when I was in high school. It wasn't near my home, but more when I lived up north in Michigan. It happened when we were driving back from Ohio one night. We saw what looked like two very tall figures jumping near the back of a truck. They had these massive gaping mouths that were full of teeth, and they stood roughly four to five feet tall. I remember it was also right around midnight, too, when we saw them, and they had just ran out of a large field. I did not see their faces clearly enough, but they had long shaggy hair, and the mouths were the thing that stuck out to me the most. One was standing on each side of the open bed of the truck, and they were also kind of hunched over. They seemed to be watching the cars pass by. I couldn't tell you if they were canine or like, but they were furry humanoid looking creatures. Terrifying. In 2007, I was traveling to the family home in the mountains to spend Thanksgiving with my family. My mom and I were driving, and she was swerving down the mountain like she always does. She's a very dangerous driver, let me tell you. We hit this patch of black ice in the area where there had been no weather reports indicating any possibility of it forming. We spun out of control on this road that is mostly straight, but has a couple of curves along the way. As we're spinning, things start flying past our windows so quickly, but at the same time so slow. I couldn't make heads or tails of what was happening until everything stopped moving and I realized all three of our tires on our car had blown out. There was smoke everywhere, from each tire deflating and burning rubber permeated the air. My mom and I had 40 minutes to get our butts out of Dodge before we had completely slid down an embankment with no way to get back up. It's a two-lane country road. We were very fortunate that we even got cell service. As we sat there, waiting, waiting for the tow truck to come and take us to my uncle's house, which is where we were heading initially. We felt like we were being watched by something. I know, that sounds pretty far-fetched, but it's just a feeling that I felt off in the woods, and I'm not sure what it was, or what could have made it, but something was there. We could feel a disturbance. We felt incredibly uneasy the entire time we're waiting for this tow truck. Finally, when it shows up, even the tow truck driver kind of noticed it, he didn't say anything, but he was looking around and acting very strange, like he just wanted to get out of there and get the job done. He was working faster than usual. While we were in the truck with him, he mentioned if we saw what he did, and he went to tell us that he saw a large figure staring at us through the trees, but he assumed it was a large man trying to mug us. There really wasn't much said about it other than that. I can't help but wonder if our experience was actually something else, that it was not a man, but something supernatural. This time of year, things can be rough for a lot of people. I'm usually a hermit kind of person, and I choose to spend my time alone. I've been that way for as long as I can remember. This particular year was no different for me. I live by myself. On Thanksgiving, I drove back to my house. It was foggy, so when I got to the driveway, I saw what appeared to be like two sets of eyes running from the woodline right near my house. I stepped out of my car, walking down the driveway to see if it was somebody there. I had a Bowie knife strapped to my thigh, and I carry a 9mm with me too. I was packing and was not afraid to use lethal force if I needed it. There were some trees by a small hill next to my house. These eyes were almost resting there on top of it. And suddenly, I see this figure come from behind one of the trees and is kind of moving around, like it was not wanting to be seen. That's when I realized it was much larger than a person. It was huge. Everything around it began shaking as this being or person or thing began moving quickly, almost hitting the trees. After seeing this, I went inside quickly, called my uncle, and described what happened to him. He's a very experienced hunter, far more than I am. He said that it was probably what they call a dogman. I never heard of that before. I actually had to get online and research what it could have been. 
This is the most significant and lasting effect this sighting has had in my life. It's the realization that there are things in this world we cannot explain. The idea of a dogman may seem absurd to some, but after my experience, I'm not so sure anymore. The events of that Thanksgiving day have given me a new perspective on the paranormal, and it's opened up a whole new adventure of exploration for me. Cryptozoology was always interesting, but just pseudoscience. But now, I believe it's more real than ever, and there could possibly be other creatures out there that are werewolf-like.